Hello everyone and welcome to the advanced ethical hacking course video by Simply Learn. Ethical hacking is the practice of using hacking techniques to test the security of a computer system, network or application with the goal of identifying vulnerabilities and improving the overall security of the system. In this video, we'll explore all the important advanced level concepts of cyber security and ethical hacking but before that, let us understand what ethical hacking involves and why it's a profitable career option. Let's jump right in. Ethical hacking is the practice of using hacking techniques to test the security of a computer system, network or application with the goal of identifying vulnerabilities and improving the overall security of the system. Ethical hackers use the same techniques as malicious hackers but they do so with the consent of the owner of the system. Ethical hackers work to help organizations identify and fix potential security vulnerabilities before a malicious hacker can exploit them. With the increasing reliance on digital systems in various industries, there has been a growing demand for skilled ethical hackers. Ethical hacking offers a lucrative career option with a high salary and the potential to work as a freelancer or part of a team. According to statistics, the average salary of an ethical hacker is approximately $100,000 per year which is significantly higher than many other jobs. Additionally, ethical hacking jobs are in high demand across various industries including finance, healthcare and government making it a versatile skill to have. With that being said, it is sufficiently evident that cyber security and ethical hacking are amazing career options for every individual out there. And before we begin with the course, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cyber security by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch careers with cyber security by learning from the experts, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cyber security with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. And the course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Now let's take a minute to hear from our learners who have experienced massive success in their careers. You're never too old to learn anything new, whether it's an art, a new language, a new sport, or learning new skills to advance your career. Hi, I'm Philip. I'm 61 years old and last year I upskilled with Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity after working 30 years in the IT sector in various different profiles. I'm happy to tell you that I was able to clear and pass my CISSP and CCSP certification exams on the first attempt after taking the course. Huh, funny story I want to share with you. I started off aspiring to be a DJ where I became interested in electronic stereo systems and how they connected and how they operate and what made them function. And four years ago, I began a journey to understand and learn more about the cloud. On the way, I developed a natural understanding for the security needs and began to focus my studies to understand more about the cybersecurity aspect of the cloud landscape. I worked with many companies before as a security analyst and architect on a contract basis, but I needed some stability, which I got with the job I just started with Infosys as a cybersecurity consultant. Happened after I took the course. I've been an adjunct faculty member at Prince George's Community College and been in many different learning and training experiences, but the experience as a student at Simply Learn is something I will always cherish. The course, I must say, was packed with practical examples and was led by highly skilled certified instructors that I believe in living a fulfilling life at 61, I am still training students in martial arts. I've been practicing martial arts for the past 40 years, and my efforts were acknowledged by the Eastern United States International Martial Arts Association, where I was inducted into the Hall of Fame for a lifetime achievement of dedication and service to the martial arts. I've been many things in my life, but first and foremost, I've been a learner. Be a learner first. And now we'll see the agenda for this advanced ethical hacking full course. We will cover a wide range of topics. Firstly, we'll delve into understanding who an ethical hacker is and the need for the expertise in today's digital landscape. Next, we'll explore the essential skills required to become an ethical hacker. We'll also focus on various ethical hacking tools and their functionalities. The course will include practical sessions starting with installing Kali Linux and demonstrating basic commands. We'll then move on to important hacking techniques like phishing, SQL injection and VPN usage. Additionally, we'll examine the significance of firewalls in protecting systems and networks. The agenda will also cover different areas of ethical hacking, giving participants a comprehensive understanding of the field. We'll explore the Metasploitlib framework and its application in conducting advanced attacks. Furthermore, we'll discuss the role of a certified ethical hacker, CEH, and the benefits of obtaining CEH certification. The course will conclude by highlighting various ethical hacking certification available and the career prospects in the field. 
By the end of the course, participants will have gained practical knowledge and skills to pursue a successful career in ethical hacking. So without any further ado, let's jump on to our topic right away. And if these are the types of videos you would like to watch, then hit the subscribe button, like and press the bell icon to never miss on any further content. Are individuals who illegally hack into a system for a monetary gain. On the contrary, we have white hat hackers who exploit the vulnerabilities in a system by hacking into it with permission in order to defend the organization. This form of hacking is absolutely legal and ethical. Hence, they are also often referred to as ethical hackers. In addition to these hackers, we also have the gray hat hackers. As the name suggests, the color gray is a blend of both white and black. These hackers discover vulnerabilities in a system and report it to the system's owner, which is a good act. But they do this without seeking the owner's approval. Sometimes, gray hat hackers also ask for money in return for the spotted vulnerabilities. Now that you have seen the different types of hackers, let's understand more about the hacking that is legal and valid, ethical hacking, through an interesting story. Dan runs a trading company. He does online training with the money his customers invest. Everything was going well, and Dan's business was booming until a hacker decided to hack the company's servers. The hacker stole the credentials of various trading accounts. He asked for a lump sum ransom in exchange for the stolen credentials. Dan took the hacker's words lightly and didn't pay the hacker. As a result, the hacker withdrew money from various customers' accounts, and Dan was liable to pay back the customers. Dan lost a lot of money and also the trust of his customers. After this incident, Dan gave a lot of thought as to what could have gone wrong with the security infrastructure in his company. He wished there was someone from his company who could have run a test attack to see how vulnerable his systems were before the hacker penetrated into the network. This was when he realized he needed an employee who thinks like a hacker and identifies the vulnerabilities in his network before an outsider does. To do this job, he hired an ethical hacker, John. John was a skilled professional who worked precisely like a hacker. In no time, he spotted several vulnerabilities in Dan's organization and closed all the loopholes. Hiring an ethical hacker helped Dan protect his customers from further attacks in the future. This, in turn, increased the company's productivity and guarded the company's reputation. So, now you know hacking is not always bad. John, in this scenario, exposed the vulnerabilities in the existing network, and such hacking is known as ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is distributed into six different phases. Let us look at these phases step by step with respect to how John, our ethical hacker, will act. Before launching an attack, the first step John takes is to gather all the necessary information about the organization's system that he intends to attack. This step is called reconnaissance. He uses tools like Nmap and HPing for this purpose. John then tries to spot the vulnerabilities, if any, in the target system using tools like Nmap and Nexpose. This is the scanning phase. Now that he has located the vulnerabilities, he then tries to exploit them. This step is known as gaining access. After John makes his way through the organization's networks, he tries to maintain his access for future attacks by installing backdoors in the target system. The Metasploit tool helps him with this. This phase is called maintaining access. John is a brilliant hacker. Hence, he tries his best not to leave any evidence of his attack. This is the fifth phase, clearing tracks. We now have the last phase that is reporting. In this phase, John documents a summary of his entire attack the vulnerabilities he spotted, the tools he used, and the success rate of the attack. Looking into the report, Dan is now able to take a call and see how to protect his organization from any external cyber attacks. Don't you all think John is an asset to any organization? If you want to become an ethical hacker like John, then there are a few skills that you need to acquire. First and foremost, you need to have a good knowledge of operating environments such as Windows, Linux, Unix, and Macintosh. You must have reasonably good knowledge of programming languages such as HTML, PHP, Python, SQL, and JavaScript. Networking is the base of ethical hacking, hence you should be good at it. Ethical hackers should be well aware of security laws so that they don't misuse their skills. 
Finally, you must have a global certification on ethical hacking to successfully bag a position of an ethical hacker like John. Few examples of ethical hacking certification are Certified Ethical Hacker Certification CEH, CompTIA Pen Test Plus, and Licensed Penetration Tester Certification, to name a few. Simply Learn provides a Cybersecurity Expert Master's program that will equip you with all the skills required by a cybersecurity expert. You could have a look at it by clicking the link in the description. So, here's a question for you. In which phase of ethical hacking will you install backdoors in the target system? A. Scanning B. Maintaining access C. Clearing tracks D. Reconnaissance Give it a thought and leave your answers in the comments section below. Three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. The endless growth of technologies in this area is directly proportional to the number of cybercrimes. Cybercrimes are estimated to cost $6 trillion in 2021. Hence, to tackle these cybercrimes, organizations are continuously on the lookout for cybersecurity professionals. The average annual salary of a certified ethical hacker is $91,000 in the US and approximately rupees 7 lakhs in India. So, what are you waiting for? Get certified and become an ethical hacker like John and put an end to the cyber attacks in the world. So let's uh, talk about a few of the tools that an ethical hacker would utilize uh, in their testing scenarios. To be honest, there are hundreds of tools out there. Uh, what you see on the screen are just a few examples of them. Uh, Nessus is a vulnerability scanner. What is a vulnerability scanner? It is an automated tool that is designed to identify vulnerabilities within hosts, within uh, operating systems, within networks. So they come with their ready-made databases of all the vulnerabilities that have already been identified and they scan the network against that database to find out any possible flaws or any possible vulnerabilities that currently exist on the host or the operating system or on the network. Similarly, there would be application scanners like uh, Acunetics or Arachne that would help you scan applications and identify flaws within those applications as well. Now, all of these are automated tools. The essence of ethical hacker is when these tools churn out the reports, the ethical ha hacker can understand these reports, analyze them, identify the flaws and then craft their own exploits or use existing exploits in a particular manner so that they can get access or they can bypass the access uh, security controls mechanisms that are already in place. How can they do that? With the tool called Metasploit. You see that big M there on the right hand side? That M logo is for a tool called Metasploit, which is a penetration testing tool. What is a penetration testing tool? It is that tool that will allow a ethical hacker to craft their exploits or choose their exploits for the vulnerabilities that have been identified by Nessus. Since we are interacting with computers, we will always be interacting using tools, right? So the first tool, Nessus, identifies the flaws and the possible list of vulnerabilities. We do a penetration test using Metasploit to validate those flaws and to verify that those flaws actually exist and try to figure out the complexity of those flaws. And that's where Metasploit helps us do that. Wireshark would be used in the background while we are doing both the activities using Nessus or Metasploit to keep a track of what packets are being sent and by received on the network, which will help us analyze those packets. So whenever I run a Nessus scanner, I would run a Wireshark in the background. It will capture the data packets and I can go through those data packets and analyze that data packets to identify what Nessus is actually trying to do. Similarly, when I try to attack a machine using uh, exploit on Metasploit, uh, I will keep on Wireshark running in the background to capture the data packets that have been sent and the responses that I've received from the victim so that I can also go through those packets and analyze the responses and analyze the attack, whether it was successful, to what extent was it successful, and uh, basically will also give me a validation, a proof of the activity that has happened. Nmap is another automated tool that allows me to scan for open ports and protocols. So why would I use Nmap? because pro ports and protocols become an entry point for a hacker to gain access to devices. For example, when we connect to a web server, we connect through a web browser, but we automatically connect to port 80 using HTTP and port 443 is using HTTPS. So if I'm connecting to a web server using HTTPS, it is safe to assume that port 443 on the web server is open to accept those connections. Similarly, there would be other services that may be left open on the web server 
because nobody thought about configuring it or they misconfigured the web server and they left unwanted services running. So Nmap will allow me to scan those ports and services and allow me to understand what services are being offered on that server so then I can start analyzing that server, identify those flaws within those services and then try to attack them. If the application that I'm analyzing is connected to a database and I want to do a SQL injection attack or I, if I, if Nessus tells me that there is a SQL injection attack that may be possible on that particular application, I can use an automated tool called SQL map or SQL map that would allow me to automatically craft all the queries that are required for a SQL injection attack and help me do that attack at the same time. So here I do not have to manually create my own queries. Uh, the SQL map tool would automatically create them for me. What I would do is I would use Nessus to identify that particular flaw. If Nessus reports that flaw, I would then go use the tool SQL map, configure it to attack that particular web server. And when I fire off the tool, it will then automatically start directing queries SQL injection queries to the database to see if those uh, databases are vulnerable and if yes, what data can be retrieved from those databases. So all of these tools in a nutshell would help me hack networks, applications, operating systems and host devices. And this is what an ethical hacker does. They use these kind of tool sets, they identify what attacks they need to do, they identify the right tool for that particular attack and they write their exploits, they create those attacks and then they start attacking, analyze the response and then give a report to the management uh, providing them feedback about how the attack was created or crafted, what was the response to that attack and whether the attack was successful or not. If successful, they would also give recommendations of what to do to prevent these attacks from happening in the future. So we are going to talk about the concepts about what constitutes an ethical hack and what is a penetration test. We are going to talk about the different types of penetration tests and how they can be done. We are going to talk about an operating system called Kali Linux and we are going to talk about its usage and its importance in cybersecurity. We will also be discussing the different phases of penetration test and how people or hackers would utilize these phases uh, to gain their objectives. We will also be discussing in what areas can we do a penetration test, how to do those penetration tests. We will be discussing a, quite a few bit of penetration testing tools that are available in the Kali Linux space and then we'll be looking at a couple of demos at the end of the session to understand how these tools in the operating system can be utilized for various hacks. So let's start it with what is ethical hacking. Now plainly defined ethical hacking is locating weaknesses or vulnerabilities of computers and information systems using the intent and actions of a malicious hacker. The major difference is here that we are hired to discover those weaknesses in a legal and ethical manner. That means first and foremost, our intent should not be malicious. We do not wish any harm to the organization and whatever we discover is reported back and not misused. Once we report back, we would also be trying to help them out to mitigate or remove those weaknesses or vulnerabilities to enhance the com uh, company's security posture. So essentially we would have the same training or the same knowledge as that of a malicious hacker, except that the intent is going to be different. The intent is going to help the organization achieve security to protect themselves against malicious hackers. And the second most important thing about ethical hacking is that we are authorized to do that activity. I cannot in good faith hack somebody and then tell them, you know what, I just, I just wanted to help you out and uh, here are your vulnerabilities and uh, this is the way you can prevent them. I first need the authorization from the other party and only then can I perform an ethical hack. So in this example, hacker attacks an individual with malicious intent and makes misuse of whatever information they have gotten. They steal the data, they maybe fry the operating system, hardware, destroy it and thus uh, they leave the victim without uh, a device. With authorization, an ethical hacker can also attack the same individual minus the destruction of course and the intent is good so they are willingly finding out the vulnerabilities and helping the victim plug them out so that they wouldn't be a victim of a malicious attack. Now here the first thing is authorization from the victim and the second thing is the good intent where we do not misuse those vulnerabilities and we report them back to the victim or to the client and help them uh, patch those vulnerabilities. That's the main difference between a white hat and a black hat. So security experts are normally termed as white hat hackers, malicious hackers are termed as black hats. Now the responsibilities of an ethical hacker are multifold. First and foremost, you have to create scripts, test for vulnerabilities. First, you have to identify those in the first place. So there's a vulnerability assessment, 
identifying those vulnerabilities and then you're going to test them to see the validity and the complexity of those vulnerabilities. So your one of your responsibilities would be to develop tools to increase security as well or to configure security in such a way that it would be difficult to breach. Performing risk assessment. Now what is a risk? Risk is a threat that is posed to an organization by a possibility of getting hacked. So let's say I as an ethical hacker run a vulnerability scanner on a particular client. I identify 10 different vulnerabilities. Within those 10 vulnerabilities, I do a risk assessment to identify which vulnerability is critical, would have the most impact on the client, and what would be the repercussions if those vulnerabilities actually get exploited. So I'm trying to find out in risk assessment that if the client gets hacked with the vulnerabilities identified, what is the loss they would be facing? once they get hacked and the loss could not only be loss of data it could be financial losses it could be loss of reputation penalties they have to pay to the client for breaches or penalties that they may have to pay for pay the governments in case of breaches that happened that uh, couldn't be controlled another responsibility of the ethical hacker is to set up policies in such a way that it becomes difficult for hackers to get access to devices or to protected data and finally train the staff for network security so uh, we've got a lot of employees in an organization we need to train the staff of what is allowed and what is not allowed how to keep themselves secure so that they don't get compromised thus becoming a vulnerability themselves to the organization the policies that we have talked about are administrative policies to govern the employees of the organization for example password policies most of the organizations will have a tough password policy where they say you have to create a password that meets a certain level of complexity before that can be accepted and till you create that password you are not allowed to log in or you're not allowed to register so let's move on to understand what is penetration testing now for penetration testing there is a phase called vulnerability assessment that happens before this vulnerability assessment is nothing but running a scanning tool to identify a list of potential flaws or vulnerabilities within the organization once you have identified the list of those vulnerabilities you would then move on to penetration test this is the part of ethical hacking where it specifically focuses on penetration only uh, of the information systems so you have identified that flaw maybe it could be a database with a sql injection or it could be uh, a buffer overrun, uh, overrun flaw or it could be a simple password cracking attempt your idea is to create those tools create those attacks and try to penetrate into those areas where security is weak uh, the essence of penetration testing is to penetrate information systems using various attacks the attacks could be anything like a phishing attack a password cracking attack a denial of service attack or any other vulnerabilities that you have identified uh, during the vulnerability scan so what is kali linux and why is it used kali linux is an operating system often used by hackers and ethical hackers both because of the tool sets that the operating system contains it is an operating system created by professionals with a lot of embedded tools it is a debian based operating system with advanced penetration testing and security auditing features there are more than 600 plus odd tools on that operating system that can help you leverage any of the attacks man in the middle attacks sniffing password cracking uh, any of these attacks would be possible with all the tools available you just need to know how to utilize the operating system and its tools it contains like i said a hundred of hundreds of tools uh, that are used for various information security tasks like uh, computer forensics reverse, reverse engineering information finding even uh, getting access to different machines and then uh, creating viruses worms trojans anything that you will 600 plus tools in the Kali Linux operating system. There are periodic updates that are given out to the operating system as well. It is open source. That means it is free to utilize. You can even have the source code. You can modify it if you want to. There's customizations available for all the tools. You can download third party tools and install them if you want. There's a wide support for wireless uh, network cards. Multiple languages are being supported at the, th at the same time as well. And you can create a lot of attacking. Uh, scripts you can create attacking tools and you can write your own exploits as well on kali linux so this all uh, all in all helps you create a very robust system where you can create your own attacks and then launch them against unsuspecting victims now that is illegal so as far ethical hacking is concerned once you have authorization you're going to identify which tools to be utilized you're going to get the appropriate permissions and only then are you going to attempt those attacks Let's talk about the phases of penetration testing. Now, there are five different
different phases. The first one is the reconnaissance phase, also known as the information gathering phase. This is the most important phase for any hacker. This is where the hacker or the ethical hacker, if you will, will gather as much information about the target's victim or vice versa, the, vic the victim, right? So once you have that information, you would then be able to identify what tool sets to include and how to attack the victim. For example, you want to find out the IP addresses, the domains, subdomains, the network architecture that is being utilized. You want to identify operating systems that are being utilized, the network IP ranges that are being utilized, and so on and so forth. You might want to identify employees within an organization for social engineering attacks in the future, email addresses, telephone numbers, anything and everything that will help you validate and give you information about the target is something that you want to do in the reconnaissance phase. At this point in time, we are not going to question whether whatever information we are getting is useful or not. Only time will tell depending on the various attacks that we will be building up later on. This becomes your baseline. This becomes your database with all the information about the victim so that you can come back from later stages back to the reconnaissance phase to look at the information that you've gathered and then you can fine tune your attacks. Once you have done that, you're going to uh, then start the scanning phase. Based on the information that you have gathered, you're going to identify live machines within the network. Once you've identified the live machines, you'll scan them for open ports, protocols and procedures, any processes that are running. And then we were going to identify vulnerabilities within these processes and within these open ports. So in the scanning phase, uh, why do we need to find live machines? Because we want to find out the machines that have booted up, have an operating system and are running on the network. If an op machine is not available on the network, or is in a shutdown mode, that machine cannot be hacked through a technical attack. Then it will be a physical attack where you physically go to the machine and then do whatever you want to do with it. For a technical attack, you will have to identify the machines that have booted up. Then you're going to scan the open ports because that's going to be our entry point. And on the port would be a service that is running. So you scan the service as well, identify the version of the service and then do a vulnerability scan to identify if there are any vulnerabilities on those services that are running. And then based on all of this information, we are going to develop our attacks as we go on. So once we have this, we go on to the gaining access phase where we are going to attack and try to get access to our victims machines. Could be a social engineering attack based on the information gathering we have done. In the technical assessment and scanning phase, if we have identified a vulnerability, we are going to identify a relevant exploit and then use that exploit to try to gain access. Or we might just craft a Trojan and try to uh, execute that Trojan on the victims machine to uh, check if we can get access through that particular manner. Once we have the access, could be even a, a simple password cracking attack, which we have been able to accomplish and we have cracked the password of the person and now we have gained access to that person's computer, right? But these attacks would be temporary. For example, we have cracked a password. Somebody changes the password every 30 days. After that period, our attack would be useless. If a Trojan is executed, we get a connection to that machine for once. But then how do we get, uh, get a repeated connection over and over again if we want to reconnect to that machine. So that's where we come into the maintaining access phase where we install uh, rootkits, keyloggers, sniffers and things like that where we could get a backdoor entry to the victim's machine. If we have already been successfully installed a Trojan, we would want to add the Trojan to the startup menu so that every time the operating system starts, the Trojan gets automatically executed and thus we maintain the backdoor entry to that victim's machine. Once we have done all of this, all these activities are going to leave a trace in the victim's machine. So if you install a Trojan, a Trojan being an application would create directories and files. A virus would be destructive in nature. If you're executing a script, it will leave some logs behind. If we even log in through the cracked password that we have, it will create a login entry at, for that particular timestamp along with the IP address that we utilize. In the covering tracks, we are essentially trying to avoid detection by deleting traces of our activity. That means that we need to identify where logs have been stored. We need to address those logs and we need to delete them or modify them in such a way that our activity is not traceable. So these are the five main phases of a penetration test. Gather as much information as you can. Scan for machines, ports, protocols and services running on the victim's device. Try to gain access by password cracking, trojans, exploits for the vulnerabilities if any. Maintain that access by installing further software, which will allow you to get backdoor access to that particular system. And then try to cover your tracks by deleting all traces of your activity. Once successful, 
the victim will have no idea and you have a backdoor entry and you can monitor the victim to the extent that you want. Now, in an ethical hacker's perspective, this penetration test can be done in multiple aspects. So, uh, again, understand the fact that we are doing an authorized activity. We have identified the tools that we have to use, identified the attacks. We've got the appropriate authorization. And based on that authorization, we are conducting a penetration test. The penetration test may be asked to be done in one of these manners. First is the black box test. The black box test is where no information is given to the ethical hacker about the IT infrastructure. So they have no idea what it is. They start right from the first phase of the information gathering, gather as much information as they can. And based on the gathered information, they try to create and launch attacks to see if they are going to be successful. Now, not only does it test the knowledge of the penetration tester, it would also test the security implementations that the organization has done to see whether they can identify the attack and prevent it in the first place. So this is the simulation of a malicious hacker scenario where a malicious hacker having no idea about the organization first tries to gather information and then tries to attack that organization. So no source code knowledge, no technological knowledge, nothing. They're just going to try to gather information scan those devices and then try to gain access. The second test is a gray box test where some information is given or some knowledge of the IT infrastructure is given. Think of it from a employee's perspective, a regular employee in an organization who doesn't have extra privileges uh, like an administrator, but is just a, a regular employee does that means that they got limited access within the organization based on which they get some knowledge of the IT infrastructure. So this is an attempt of an insider uh, simulation attack where a regular user may want to try to misuse the access that they've been given and then try to gather information or try to gain access to other devices which they are not authorized to. The third test is white box where there's full knowledge of the IT infrastructure that has been given. So this is again a simulation of an insider attack, a malicious insider if you will. But at this point in time, the person has complete knowledge of the in infrastructure, could be in an administrative position, and then they are trying to leverage their access to see if they can get information or they can compromise any stuff, any of the data. So the three attacks would be the first one, black box, where we are simulating uh, external threat, a hacker sitting outside the organization trying to gain access. The gray box is an insider threat where there is a regular employee who is trying to get access to infrastructure that they are not authorized for. And then the third audit is a white box audit where there's an administrator who has all the leverage, all the access and the visibility within the uh, in infrastructure. And then they are trying to misuse their access to see what else they can get from whatever access has been authorized to them. Now let's look at the areas of penetration testing. Where all could we do a penetration test, thus compromising the security of the application or of the server or of the user? So first and foremost, network services. It finds vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the security of the network infrastructure. So for example, we have switches, routers, firewalls in a network. All of these are devices that need a configuration. If they have been not correctly configured or if they have not been correctly secured, they would leave some vulnerabilities behind. If we as ethical hackers are able to identify these flaws, these misconfigurations, these vulnerabilities, we could then try to exploit them and try to gain access to the network and devices within that network by uh, getting access to the network in the first place. Then we have the web applications. Web applications are nothing but softwares that are developed over or deployed over a web server and are made available over the intranet or the internet. For example, uh, websites that we visit or uh, web applications like uh, Facebook, if you will, right? So if these applications have vulnerabilities within them, we then try to attack the web-based applications and thus try to bypass authentication or get access to database or try to leak information through those applications. If not, then we try to attack the client side. Now, web application is at the server level and is hosted by the deployer. So that's at the server side. The client side is where we as users are using a computer with a browser and trying to interact with the web application. Now, the browser and the operating system that we are utilizing would have its own vulnerabilities. Thus, identifying a client side vulnerability and then exploiting it to either, either hack the client or then piggyback on the client's connection and try to get access to the server. So either you could attack the network, the web application, or the client side itself, or you could attack wireless networks. This test would examine all the wireless devices which are used in a corporation. 
most of the wireless would have laptops, smartphones, tablets, phablets, all of those connected to them. If you are able to access any of these devices through the wireless, it would help you gain access to other devices on the wireless as well. And then social engineering. So this is where you're trying to attack humans. You're tracking an employee of a corporation to reveal some confidential information knowingly or unknowingly by tricking them with uh, fake mails or fake websites or ma malicious emails that you have sent to them, uh, which they have failed to recognize as malicious and they click on it, thus getting victimized. Social engineering attacks are always uh, successful because of the gullibility of humans. Empathy, sympathy, humans basically have emotions. Emotions can be toyed with and then taken advantage of if the person is not careful enough. For example, the most common social engineering attack that we see is the Nigerian fraud where we receive an email that someone somewhere has died and has left a huge estate behind a few hundred million dollars and we have been identified as the person through whom they want to transfer the money to a foreign land to save on taxes. What are the chances of that happening on a daily basis, right? How many princes are there? So that's something that we do not verify. It's just the, I guess, the greed, if you will, of striking it rich quickly that makes us believe these kind of emails. Uh, we have also received emails of lottery tickets that we have won over a period of time without even having bought a lottery ticket. So if you haven't bought one, what did you win? But we don't ask these questions. We just get excited about the amount of money that we have won and then we try to bet on our luck and try to see if that uh, email is going to fructify or is it just another scam. So social engineering attacks are dime a dozen these days and we need to be very careful on what we trust on the internet. Let's look at the penetration testing tools. There are hundreds and thousands of tools out there. Most of these have been concised and collected together and hosted on a operating system known as Kali Linux that we have talked about earlier. Now the predecessor to Kali Linux was Backtrack. Backtrack is no longer continued. It has been discontinued and Kali Linux has taken uh, the place of Backtrack within which are all the tools that you see on your screen. Metasploit is one of the most favorite penetration testing tools of hackers and ethical hackers. Uh, there are a lot of uh, inbuilt exploits over there and we'll be doing a demo at the end of the session on this. Nmap is the information gathering tool which will scan for live devices, scan for open ports, protocols and services. Beef would be an application testing tool that would help us uh, find exploits within applications. Nessus vulnerability scanner is a network and a host based scanner that would help you identify vulnerabilities within such hosts. Wireshark is a network sniffer which allows you to capture network packets and, and analyze them to see if there, are any, there is any information worth capturing within those packets. SQL map is a automated tool used for SQL injection attacks. So you don't even have to craft your queries for SQL injection. It will be done by the SQL map tool. You just need to identify whatever is possible through the queries that the SQL is going to create and then based on the activity that you've identified, you just need to redefine your search parameters to get access to the database. We will be doing a demo on SQL map or SQL map as well. And then there is John the Ripper. John the Ripper is a tool that is used for password cracking. So dictionary attacks, brute force attacks are done using John the Ripper. What is a dictionary attack? A dictionary attack is an attack where we create list of all probable passwords, store them in a TXT file and run that list against the password tool to see if any of those passwords are going to match. A brute force attack is trying the same attack but with every permutation and combination of the alphabet that we have and we are going to try to figure out uh, if we are able to crack the password at all. So these are just some of the tools. For every tool there are another supporting 100 tools or more than that. Uh, like for Nessus vulnerability scanner you'll have Collis vulnerability scanner. You have uh, GFI Landguard and there are other uh, lots of other softwares out there. But these are some of the most commonly utilized tools. Let's look at the Metasploit attack. Metasploit is a framework of uh, penetration testing that uh, makes hacking very simple. You just need to know how to utilize the tool. You need to identify the vulnerability associated with a particular exploit and then run the exploit on Metasploit. Uh, we'll be demoing this during the practical. So there are active exploits and passive exploits. In active exploits, it exploits a specific computer, runs until execution and then exits, uses brute force and exits when an error occurs. In a passive exploit, these exploits wait for incoming requests and exploit them as soon as they connect. They can also be used in conjunction with emails and web browsers. So in passive exploits, we create a payload, we uh, like a reverse connection payload, we send it to the victim. Once the victim installs that software, the machine will then initiate a connection to us. Our machine will be in a listen mode and then we will 
once the software is executed at the end, we would then try to connect and exploit that particular vulnerability. This is the uh, practical that we'll be doing on Metasploit. So let's move on with the demos and then we'll see uh, what we can discuss amongst them. All right, let's have a look at some of the demos that we had uh, talked about in the ethical hacking and penetration testing module. We are going to look at three different demos. The first one is going to be a SQL injection attack that we are going to perform on this tool that we have. The second one is a password cracking attack on Windows 7. And a third one is a meetup reader based or a Metasploit based shell shock attack on a Linux based web server. So let's get cracking. I've powered on this virtual machine, uh, which is the OVASP broken web application. It is a tool that is provided for uh, people who want to enhance their skills and they can practice uh, how to do these attacks in a legal manner. So we are going to go to this site. I'm just going to open up my browser. The IP address is 71.132 and that's the uh, OVASP broken web application that we want to utilize. We're going to head off to Mutili Day 2 and we are going to look at a SQL injection attack where we want to bypass authentication. Now this takes us to the login screen. So we can just try our luck here and see that the authentication mechanism works. The account does not exist. So the username and password that we have supplied is not the correct one. So we want to ensure that there's a SQL database and uh, we can uh, try to attack it and see uh, if we can bypass the authentication. Now, uh, what we want to do is we want to create a SQL based malformed query that can give us a different output. So I'm just going to type in a single quote over here and type login. And you can see that this is now suddenly recognized as a operator and there's an error that is given out compared to the login that we tried uh, earlier. When we used a proper text based login mechanism, it gave us the account does not exist. But here the single quote gave us an error and it shows us how SQL works. This is the query that we had created. Now, in the trainings that you have for ethical hacking, there would be explanations of what these queries are all about, how the syntax works. Here, we're just going to see if we can create a malformed query to log in as a user in this case. So what I'm going to do is uh, create the query over here and we're going to give it a comparison. So we're going to give it a R one equals one space hyphen hyphen space. And if you now click login, you should be able to bypass authentication and you can see user has been authenticated and we now have admin access to this application. Now here, the SQL queries need to be crafted in such a perspective that they're going to work. So there would be a lot of exercise in identifying what the database is. There's a Microsoft database and Oracle database and so on and so forth. And then you have to choose those proper commands. But identifying that would come in the training. Right now, we're just looking at, at a demo. This is how a SQL injection attack works. Now let me log out here. Similarly, now we are in a login page, the same query worked wonders where it allowed us to bypass authentication. So it also depends on what kind of a page I am and what query would be accepted at this point in time. So here application understanding would also come into the picture where uh, which function we are calling upon when we are connected to a particular page. Now this is a user lookup function, right? So again, here we try the same method test test. That's not going to work authentication error, bad user or password. And if you type in the same query over here, single quote or and give it a condition, single quote or one equals one hy space hyphen hyphen space. Now here it is not going to log us in because this is not a login page. This is a user lookup form. So here it would instead give us a dump of all the databases that it has. So you can see all the usernames and passwords coming in that are stored in the user lookup field. So this is where the uh, understanding comes in of which query to create at what page we are depending upon the function that has been called, right? So that's the SQL uh, injection attack that we wanted to look at. Let's move on to password cracking. Now this is a Windows 7 machine that we have. I'm just going to do a very basic password cracking example. We're just going to log in. Now here the assumption is that we are able to log in. We have access to a computer and we want to check out other users who are using this computer and see if we can find out their passwords so that uh, we can log in as a different user, steal data if required, and we wouldn't be to blame if there are any logs that are created. So here we've got a tool called Kane Enable that is installed right here. Now I'm already an administrator on this machine. I'm checking out other administrators who share the same privileges or any other user who may be on this system whose password I can crack and thus I would be able to get access through their account and then do any malicious activity, right? So this allows me to go into a cracker tool and it allows me to enumerate this machine and identify all the users and passwords that are there in this particular machine. 
right? So I'm just going to click on the plus sign and I'm going to import uh, hashes from a local system. So where are these files stored? Where does Windows store its passwords? In what format are they stored? And what this tool does to retrieve those? That's something that we all need to know as an ethical hacker, right? So import the hashes from the local system. Click on next. It's going to enumerate that file and it is going to give you a list of all the users that, that are there. So you can see the users are hacker admin test, the one that we are logged in as, and then there's a user called virus as well. And you can see that this is the hash value of the password that is being utilized. Now, there's a particular format uh, for a hash value for Windows and how it stores. But once we have these hash values, let's say if I want to crack this password, there are various attacks that we can do. For example, a dictionary based attack or a brute force attack. Let's try a brute force attack, right? NTLM is the hashing mechanism that is used by Windows. So we're going to try to create an NTLM hash attack. And here we are going to use a predetermined rule set. For example, we are not sure what characters are being utilized over here. So we just create an attack like this using all characters and uh, lowercase a through z uppercase a through z numeric 0 through 9 and all the special characters let's say the ca password is between 7 and 16 characters and this is the character set that we want to try the brute force attack on what is a brute force attack it is an attack where the computer is going to try each and every permutation and combination out of this character set and try to figure out if the password is going to be correct so if we click start it's going to start with a particular characters and then it is going to identify if that NTLM hash is going to work against this character and you can see the time is going to be phenomenal over here so it's not necessary that this attack would be viable it will be 100% successful given the time frame however the time frame is huge enough for this attack to become a little bit redundant there are other attacks that we can do which can easily identify this data for us as well but that is something that we will look on in future videos so that's how we can get access to users and passwords. Uh, there are different mechanisms where let's say we don't have login access, then what are we going to do? How we can create a fake user login or how we can remotely access a machine and then try to get the same access. And that is what we are going to try to do in the next demo on a Linux machine. So what we are doing in a Linux machine could also be doable on the Windows machine with a different exploit. So what I'm going to do is, this is the Linux web server that I have that I'm going to power on. I'm going to use a Kali Linux machine to hack that device. And I'm going to just power off my Windows 7 machine. Give it a minute till it boots up. Now this is also a demo machine that we have which has its own uh, pre-configured vulnerabilities. So here we've got something from the pen testers lab uh, and has a shell shock vulnerability impl implemented inside. Shell shock vulnerability uh, affects Linux, Mac and Unix based operating systems for a particular version of the bash shell. Bash is the bone again shell which is the command line interface in these operating systems. So what we are trying to do here is we are going to use the Kali Linux machine, try to find out the vulnerability over here and if it exists we are going to use Metasploit to attack this machine. Now the first and foremost thing is we want to identify the IP address. We have no idea what the IP address is. We are in the same subnet so we are assuming that we are able to connect to this machine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a tool called Zenmap. I'm going to open up a command line interface find out what my IP address is and my IP address is this with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. So I want to see if there are any other machines that are live in the same subnet and we are doing a ping sweep over here to identify which machines are live. In a minute we'll get all the IP addresses. 71.1, 2, 133, 254 and 128. We know that we are 128 at this point in time. Uh, 254 is the DHCP server. So we are assuming that 133 is the machine that we want to look at and let's then try to see if we can scan that machine 133 and we're going to do an intent scan to find out which ports are open what services are running over there and if it is whether the pen test machine that we were looking for you can see of the start port 22 and port 80 and somewhere here it's going to give us the ports that are open and the details about those ports and somewhere here it will tell us that this is the pen tester lab machine that we wanted which is correct so now we want to do a vulnerability analysis on this what we are going to do is i'm going to use another gui based tool called sparta which i can just find out from here sparta uses two tools in the background uh, nmap tool and a 
tool called Nikto. So we're just going to start scanning 192, 168, 71.133 was the IP address. Add to scope and over a period of time you can see all of these will start populating with information. There we are. That's the Nikto tool coming in, scanning on port 80, which is uh, which means that it's a web server using HTTP. It uh, tells us it's an Apache HTTP 2.2.21, and uh, gives us the 22 port number as well. If we head over to the tab of Nikto, or let's look at the screenshot first. This is what the website would be looking like, and Nikto gives us the options over here. It tells us that there is a vulnerability over here for shell shock and this is the path where the vulnerability is going to exist so what we are going to do we go back to the command line sorry we open up a new one minimize all these other windows and we are going to open up metasploit metasploit is a penetration testing tool that is used by most hackers and ethical hackers to test applications and test uh, existing exploits and vulnerabilities so just give it a minute till it starts you can see there are already around 1700 exploits right here uh, we are going to see all those exploits with these commands there we are, sorry for the typo. And it will just give us a list of all the exploits that are stored in Metasploit in this version. So all of these are Windows based. If we scroll up, we will be looking at other vulnerabilities as well or exploits, the Unix based exploits, Linux, OS X, multi exploits. And we are looking for a exploit for um, multi based Apache or HTTP. Let's go up. Uh, let's look at. So this is the one that we are looking for Apache mod cgi bash environmental executable so what we're going to do is we're just going to copy it go back to the bottom say use exploit and paste the one that we wanted press enter say show options so it'll ask us to configure this i'm just going to configure it based on the knowledge that we have set our host which is the remote host the victims machine so we put in the ip address it asks us for the target uri so that's the path that we saw set target URI to CGI hyphen bin slash status enter now with the exploit we need to find a payload that is going to give us the output that we want so we say show payloads and it will give us a list of all the compatible payloads with this exploit and we want to create a reverse TCP connection which is this so we know it's a Linux operating system we want this uh, payload to be set so set payload Press enter that's the payload coming in show options now that we have set the payload this is the options for the exploit and now we want to set our options for the payloads as well so we are creating a reverse tcp connection which means we are remotely executing code at the victim side and we are making the victim connect back to our machine which means we need to set up a listener so i need to put my ip address over here set localhost or lhost 192.168.71.128, which was our IP address. Show options again, just to ensure everything is fine, which looks like it is. And we then type in the word exploit so that it will start this attack. I can see that it has created a metapreter session at the victim side and it has opened up a session so if i do a pwd now pwd is a linux command for present working directory and it will show us that we'll connect it to var dub 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 cgi hyphen bin do an ls it will list all the files that's the status file over there do a cd backslash it will take us to the root of this machine now remember we saw the uh, passwords on a windows machine similarly we can head over to the cd etc folder ls and you can see these files psswd and shadow now pssWD is the file where Linux stores its usernames and shadow is the file where passwords are shown so do a cat command pssWD and you can see these users coming up so you can see the last user pen test lab and you can see there are no passwords so let's do a cat shadow and that's your hash value for the password that we have for the user pen test lab so these are the different attacks that we need to understand uh, and we need to create based on the vulnerabilities that exist on different machines. So if you just look at Windows and Linux and how we can exploit them depending on existing vulnerabilities. As an ethical hacker, this is uh, what we need to learn in our trainings and then we need to clear our exams based on this knowledge of how these things work so that uh, we get certified and then we can 
position ourselves for the uh, penetration testing jobs. And before we begin with the course, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity by graduating from the best universities, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. And the course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Attacks. Uh, when we want to launch these attacks, what is the process that we would follow? So there are six steps that we would do as an ethical hacker. If you are just a hacker, you probably wouldn't do the sixth step, which is a reporting step. So the first step that would be done is the reconnaissance phase, which is the information gathering phase, which is very important from an ethical hacker's perspective or a hacker's perspective. Because if I want to attack someone or something as a digital device, I need to know what I'm attacking. I need to know the IP address of the device, the MAC address of those devices. I need to know the operating system, the build or the version of that operating systems, applications on top, the versions of those applications. So I know what I'm attacking. For example, if I, if I want to attack a server, I assume it's a Windows based server and I use a particular tool to attack it, but it actually turns out to be a Linux based server. My attacks are going to be unsuccessful. So I need to focus my attack based on what is there at the other end. So in my information gathering phase, I want to identify all of that information. Once I have that information done, I'm going to scan those servers using tools like Nmap that we just talked about. And we're going to try to see the open ports, open services and protocols that are running on that server that can give me possible entry points within the network or within the device or within the operating system. At the same time, along with the scanning with Nmap, I would run a vulnerability scanner, the Nessus vulnerability scanner we talked about or Acunetics for applications. And then I would try to identify vulnerabilities in those applications, operating systems or networks. Once I have identified those vulnerabilities in the scanning phase, I would then move on to the gaining phase where I would then craft my exploits or choose existing exploits and start attacking the attacking the victim. At this point in time, if my attack is successful, I will probably have gained access uh, by either cracking passwords or escalating privileges or exploiting a vulnerability that I may have found during the scanning phase. Once I have gained my access, I want to maintain my access. Why? Because the vulnerability may not be there for long. Maybe somebody updated the operating system and hence the flaw was no longer exist uh, existing or somebody changed the password that may I may have cracked, thus I no longer have access. So what do I do to maintain my access? I install Trojans or backdoor entries to those systems using which I can secretly in a covert manner get access to those devices at my own will at my own time as long as those devices are available over the network. So that's where I maintain my access. I have hacked them. Now I want to maintain my access. So I install a software which would give me a backdoor entry to that device no matter what. Once I have done this, I want to clear my track. So whatever activity that I've been doing, for example, installing a Trojan, a Trojan is also a software that would create directory directories and files once installed on the victim's machine. So I want to hide that. If I have access data stores, if I have modified data, I want to hide that activity because if the victim comes to know that something has happened, they would start they would start increasing their security parameters they might start scanning their devices they may take them offline thus my hack would no longer be efficient the reason i'm clearing my tracks is that the victim doesn't find out that they have been hacked or they have been compromised or even if they do find out that they've been compromised they cannot trace the compromise back to me so i would be deleting references of any of the ip addresses or mac addresses that i may have used to attack that particular device. And this is where I will be able to identify where those logs were created, where those traces are. Once I take off those traces, the victim would not be any wiser of whether they have been compromised or who compromised their system. And if I am successful at all of these stages or what to whatever extent the success that I've achieved in any of these stages, I would then create a report based on that. And I would report to the management about the activities that we have been able to do and whatever we have been able to achieve out of those activities. For example, we identified 10 different flaws. There were 20 different attacks that we wanted to do. What attack did we do? What was the outcome of that attack? What was the intended ex or, or the expected output of that attack? I'll create a report which would give a detailed analysis of all the steps that were taken along with screenshots and evidences of what activity was conducted, what was the output, what was the expected output, and I would submit that report to the management, giving them an idea of what vulnerabilities and flaws exist in their environment or their devices that need to be mitigated 
so that the security can be enhanced. So these are the six steps that the ethical hacking process would take. Uh, just going through this, the rec uh, reconnaissance is where you're going to use hacking tools like Nmap, HPing to obtain information about targets. There are hundreds of tools out there depending on what information you want. Then in scanning, again, Nmap, Nexpose, these kind of tools to be utilized to identify open ports, protocols, and services. In gaining access, you're going to exploit the vulnerability by using the Metasploit tool that we talked about in the previous slides. In the maintaining access, you're going to install backdoors. You can use Metasploit at the same time. Uh, you can craft your own scripts to create a Trojan and install it on the victim's machine. Once you have achieved that, clearing tracks is where you're going to clear all evidences of your activity so that you do not get caught or the victim doesn't even realize that they have been hacked. And once you're done all of this, we are going to create reports that are going to be submitted to the management to help them understand the current security evaluation of their organization. So now let's see how we can hack using social engineering. Now, what is social engineering? Social engineering is the art of manipulating humans into revealing confidential information which they otherwise would not have revealed. So this is where your social skill and your people skills come into the picture. If you are able to communicate effectively to another person, they would probably give up more information that they intended to give out. Let's look at, look at examples, right? If you see on the screen, phishing activity. What is phishing? We receive a lot of fake mails on a regular basis. We have always received those emails where we have won a lottery of a few million dollars, but we have never realized that we didn't purchase a lottery to win a lottery in the first place. We have always had those Nigerian frauds where a prince died in some South African country and you out of 7 billion people on the planet have been identified where they want to transfer a few hundred million dollars through your account and they want to give you 50% of that money in return as thank you. So some very basic attacks where you go on to websites and there's a banner flashing at you saying congratulations you're the one millionth visitor to this website click here to claim your prize. All of these are social engineering attacks, phishing attacks, fake websites, fake communications being sent out to users to prey on their gullibility. Most of humans always have that dream of striking it rich, winning a huge lottery once and for all and living their life lavishly ever after. But sadly in the real world that's not that doesn't happen that often and if you're receiving those mails it is very important that you first research the validity of those, those communications before you even want to act upon them. So why are humans susceptible to social engineering? Because humans have emotion, machines do not. Try pleading with a machine to give you access to a account that you have forgotten a password to. The machine wouldn't even know what you're doing. Try pleading with a human, sympathy or empathy, where you could uh, try to create a social engineering attack where you can uh, plead with them saying, if I do not get access to this account immediately, I might lose my job and then that would put my family into problems. Somebody would feel empathy or sympathy towards you and help you reset that password and give you access to that account. It's how good the attack is and how convincing you are for the success of this attack to happen. So what is a familiarity exploit? Attackers interact with victims to gain information which will benefit the attackers to crack credentials. As passwords, if we want to reset our passwords, what do we have as a mechanism to resetting passwords? We have some security questions that we set up. Those questions are nothing but personal information that we would know but through a social engineering attack we, it would be easily be able to uh, uh, gather the information that you have set for your security questions the security questions can be as simple as the first school that you attended you probably have that listed on your LinkedIn profile where a, a person can just go in there and see your academic qualifications and identify the school that you were in right similarly uh, it might also be a question what was your mother's maiden name that's a very good attack and that's, uh, I mean, if a person can interact with you, let's say they are trying to take a survey and they approach you for a feedback on a particular product that you have been utilizing and they ask you these questions, you wouldn't think twice before giving those answers. As long as the request sounds legitimate to us, we are able to justify that request, we do answer those queries. So it's upon us to verify the authenticity of the request coming in before we answer it. Phishing, as discussed, would be fraudulent emails, which appear to be coming from a trusted source. So email spoofing uh, comes into mind, uh, fake websites, and so on and so forth. Exploiting human curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat, right? So there was uh, there's so many physical attacks where hackers just keep 
pen drives lying around in a parking lot. Now this is an open a generic attack. Whoever falls victim will fall victim. So if I just throw around a few USBs in the parking lot, obviously with Trojans implemented on them, some people who are curious or who are looking for a couple of freebies might take up those pen drives, plug them in their computers to see what data is on the pen drives. At the same time, once they plug in their, those pen drives on their computers, the virus or the Trojan would get infected and cause harm to their machine. Then exploiting human greed, uh, we just talked about the uh, Nigerian frauds and the lotteries, those kind of attacks, the fake money making gimmicks. Now basically this is where you prey upon the person's uh, greed kicking in and they are uh, clicking on those links in order to uh, get that money that has been promised to them in that email. So one of the safest mechanism to keep data private and to keep yourself secure is using encryption. Now encryption can happen through cryptography. What is cryptography? Cryptography is the art of scrambling data using a particular algorithm so that the data becomes unreadable to the normal user. The only person with the key to unscramble that data would be able to unscramble it and make sense out of that data. So we're just making it unreadable or non-readable by using a particular key or a particular algorithm and then we're going to send the key to the end user. The end user using the uh, same key would then decrypt that data. If anybody compromises that data while it is being sent over the network, since it is encrypted, they would not be able to read it. So the encryption algorithm would be something like this. Now, if you see uh, the computer word once made into unreadable format would uh, look like EQORXVGT. For an end user, it wouldn't make any sense, but the person who has a key to unscramble that would be able to convert it back to computer and then understand the meaning of that word. So this is just a substitution cipher that is being shown on the screen. So what is the alphabet? The key is alphabet plus three. So C plus three alphabets that becomes E. O becomes Q, M becomes O. So the key that is utilized to scramble the data is the character that you are at, the third character from there would be the corresponding key. So the encrypted message is also known as a cipher. The decryption is just the other way around where you know the key now and you can now figure out what that E corresponded to by going back three characters in the alphabet. Most of the times a certified ethical hacker must decrypt a message without knowing the secret key. So let's say a ransomware has affected your organization or has affected a device and you want to figure out uh, or you want to decrypt that data. Now, as an ethical hacker, you wouldn't be for paying a ransom uh, to the hacker, would you? So it is now your prerogative of how you're going to work around and how you're going to try to crack the encryption mechanism, how to crack the cipher to decrypt that message and see what's within it, right? Decryption without the use of a secret key that is known as a cryptanalysis. Cryptanalysis is the reversing of an algorithm to figure out uh, what the decryption was uh, without using a key. So cryptanalysis can be done using uh, various formats. The first one is a brute force attack. Second is a dictionary attack. The third one is a rainbow table attack. A brute force attack is trying every combination, permutation and combination of the key to figure out what the key was. It is 100% successful but may take a lot of time. A dictionary attack is where you have created a list of possible encryption mechanisms, a list of possible cracks, and then you try to figure out whether those cracks work or not. Rainbow tables are where you have an encrypted text in hand, and you're trying to figure out uh, the similarities between, between the text that you have and the encrypted data that you wanted to decrypt in the first place. So in the brute force attack, you're trying every possible combination, permutation of what the key would be. In dictionary attack, you have a word list that would tantamount to the key. And if you're, you're trying to match all the words listed in the text file or the word list to see if any of those words are going to work to decrypt that data. Here in the rainbow table, the ciphertext is compared with another ciphertext. You find out similarities and then you try to work or reverse engineer your way accordingly. So let's have a quick demo on cryptography before we end this session. So to begin with the demo of cryptography, we are on a website called spammimic.com, which will help us scramble the message that we created into a completely uh, a format which would be unrelated to the topic at hand. So if I say I want to encode a message, a turn a short message into spam. So what this does is you want to send across a secret message. You type in the secret message, a short one, and it will convert that into a spam mail. You send it across. So whoever is reading that spam mail would never get an idea of the embedded message within it. So if I want to type in a message here, hi, this is a secret message. The password is 
asd at the rate one two three four and i want to send this out to people or to one of my colleagues but i want to send it out in a secret manner so that others are not aware of this so when i press on encode what the algorithm would do is it will convert this message into a spam mail so my message hi this is a secret message the password is at the rate one two three four or asd at the rate one two three four gets converted into this now if you read it dear e-commerce professional this letter was specially selected to be sent to you this doesn't make sense there is nowhere or no reference to the actual message that i've already said so if i copy this entire message and i send it let's say via email to the recipient now the thing is that the recipient needs to know that i've encoded it using spam mimic the algorithm remain needs to remain the same so once they know that it is spam mimic what they can do is now in this instance what i'm going to do is i'm going to open up a new browser and i'm going to go to the same website and at this point in time i'm going to click on decode when i click on decode i'm going to paste the message that i've just copied there we are and this message is now being copied into a different browser and if i decode this you will see that it will convert it back to the original message that there was so the key is there at spam mimic and uh, it is embedded within the message so whenever we, we paste the message in the decode factor it knows what the key was and it can decrypt that message and give me the actual message that was embedded within it there we are the entire message this is what we created in the google chrome browser and in the firefox browser we decoded similarly if i want to protect these kind of messages there is an aspenencrypt.com website where let's say we use text encryption and i want to encrypt the same message this is a secret message the password is asd at the rate one two three four and then i give it a password to protect this message let's say the word password and i use the cipher to scramble this by using let's say aes which is the strongest cipher right now and i say encrypt so this is what the encryption would look like and basically uh, if i don't have the password over here if i decrypt it you would see that the error has occurred now, if i type in the password over here and then decrypt it it will be able to convert that back into the unscrambled text and it will give me what the original message was this is a secret message the password is asd at the rate one two three four so if i want to keep my data secure from hackers i want to scramble it in such a way that they would not be able to crack it or it would be very difficult for, for them to crack it and this is one of the first mechanisms that would be recommended by any ethical hacker to keep the data secure <laughs>
in which we will see both the teams how they work for an organization. Now we will see the introduction that is when it comes to protecting sensitive data and defending against cyber threats. Organizations employ two teams that is the red team and the blue team. But what do these teams do and how do they work together? Let's find out. So we will start with the red team. The red team also known as the offensive team. It consists of seasoned security professionals who specialize in mimicking real world attack strategies. Their mission is to identify and exploit vulnerabilities in an organization's cyber defenses. And now we will see the advantages of the red team. The red team approach offers several advantages. First, it boosts network safety, it helps find flaws in the system, encourages competition and cooperation and amplifies knowledge on detecting and stopping cyber assaults. They play a crucial role in ensuring an organization's readiness for prevention, detection and remediation. Red team activities involve thinking like a hacker to break into a company's security system with permission of course. They perform various tasks such as penetration testing, social engineering, card cloning and intercepting communications. By constantly challenging the blue team's defenses, the red team helps improve overall security. Now we'll see the skill set of red team members. So to be an effective red team member, one needs skills in software expertise, penetration testing and social engineering. Understanding the risk and creatively strategizing attacks are essential to overcome the blue team's defenses. Now we'll see the certifications that could be the add-ons for a red team member. Aspiring red team professionals can enhance their credentials through certifications such as Certified Ethical Hacker CEH, GIAC Penetration Tester, Licensed Penetration Tester, Offensive Security Certified Professional and Certified Red Team Operations Professional. These certifications demonstrate expertise in offensive security and penetration testing. Now we'll see what is a blue team. Now we'll shift our focus to the blue team that is also known as the defensive team. Their primary role is to maintain an organization's internal network defenses against cyber attacks. They work tirelessly to protect valuable assets, detect threats and respond swiftly to any security breaches. Now let's see their activities. So what do they do? So the blue team is responsible for analyzing digital traces, auditing the domain name system, constructing firewalls, monitoring network traffic and employing access controls. Their aim is to establish a strong security posture and prevent unauthorized access. Now we will see the skill set of blue team member. So to be an effective member of the blue team, one must possess skills in risk assessment, threat intelligence and hardening techniques. They work with intrusion prevention systems, intrusion detection system and other security software to defend against cyber attacks. Now we will see the certifications that will be the add-on for blue team members. So certifications like CompTIA Security Plus, GIAC Certified Incident Handler, Certified Information Systems Auditor, GIAC Security Essential Certification, System Security Certified Practitioner, CompTIA Advanced Security Practitioner and Certified Information Systems Security Professional. These can help blue team professionals enhance their defensive security expertise. And the red team and the blue team must collaborate effectively to ensure optimal security. They exchange information about emerging dangers and hacker tactics, enabling both teams to stay one step ahead. However, in some cases, the blue team may not be informed. So the red team and the blue team must collaborate effectively to ensure optimal security. Now, we will see the cybersecurity showdown in which we will see how they operate. Now, we will dive into the intense showdown between the red team and the blue team. Now, picture this. The red team launches a sophisticated attack on the organization's network, attempting to breach its defenses and gain unauthorized access to sensitive data. Now the red team utilizes their advanced skills that is penetration testing, social engineering and exploiting vulnerabilities to carry out their attack. Their goal is to infiltrate the network and extract valuable information without getting caught. On the other side, the blue team is constantly vigilant, monitoring network traffic, analyzing security logs and employing advanced defensive measures. Their objective is to detect and prevent any unauthorized access and swiftly respond to any security breaches. As the red team progresses through the network, they encounter various obstacles put in place by the blue team. 
firewalls, intrusion detection systems, and other security measures challenges their every move. But the red team is persistent, utilizing their expertise to find loopholes and exploit weaknesses. Meanwhile, the blue team closely monitors the red team's attack patterns, analyzing their techniques and reinforcing their defenses in real time. They actively collaborate, sharing information and strategizing to mitigate the ongoing threat. The main objective as the red team is to help organizations identify vulnerabilities in their systems. By simulating real-world attacks, they provide valuable insights that enable the blue team to enhance their defensive capabilities. And the red team plays a crucial role in cybersecurity strategy. Their simulated attacks push blue team to the limits and reveal weaknesses. The red team plays a crucial role in our cybersecurity strategy. Their simulated attacks push us to the limits that is push blue team to the limits and reveal weaknesses that they might otherwise overlook. It's a constant battle but it helps them stay prepared and strengthen their defenses. Ultimately, the red team and the blue team rely on collaboration and mutual respect to succeed. While the red team exposes vulnerabilities, the blue team's role is to learn from their experiences, adapt their defenses and continuously improve the organization's overall security posture. And before we begin with the course, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity by graduating from the best universities, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. And the course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Discuss the common types of attacks. The first and foremost and the most common attack in today's world is a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack. This attack is launched by an attacker not to not for personal gain but to harm the other organization by crashing those services or making the services unavailable for legitimate users thus causing monetary harm and reputational harm to the organization. They actually try to restrict the access to these resources for legitimate users by consuming all the bandwidth or the resources made available. Then there are password attacks. These attacks are essentially where you're trying to crack the password of a user so that you can get access to their account and through their access you can then uh, leverage those access and capture data that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten access to. Then man in the middle attack is where you are trying to capture data packets over the network uh, that are flying between the victim and the target server. So you're essentially placing yourself between the communication channel that has been opened between the victim and the targeted server and you're trying to capture the data packets. You're trying to analyze those data packets and capture any secret information like usernames, passwords, any other transactions that the user might be doing. Then you have email attacks. The attacker sends bait often in the form of an email. So these would be a phishing attacks that would come under the gambit of social engineering. Phishing attacks are nothing but fake mails that look very genuine to the end user and thus persuade them to click on links that lead to malicious servers, thus compromising the device of the victim. SQL injection attacks are normally targeted to websites or web applications that have a, that have a database connected to them. The database and the application interact e with each other using SQL language or structured query language. If not configured properly and uh, if there are no firewalls watching, a user can cra craft malicious SQL queries which can then dump data or uh, give out unwanted information to the hacker that should have been protected in the first place. And then if we have the eavesdropping attack where the attacker observes the traffic on the system and works and the work you are doing on your computer. Eavesdropping could be where you're, tra uh, you're tracking VoIP calls or you have installed a Trojan on somebody's mobile phones and you're trying looking at all that information. Let's look at the certifications that are available in this field. The foundational knowledge that you would require is a graduate in computer science or any IT security related field. Most of the univers universities nowadays provide this kind of certifications. You should have solid grounds in IT fundamentals. That means you should be technically very adept. You should understand how protocols work, how networking works. You should be uh, somewhat conversant with some scripting languages and should be able to understand programming. Knowing networking and mastering networking is a very fundamental requirement. Even if you later on decide to go into application security and you're looking at programming languages, applications still work over the network and you need to know how these networks are going to be configured and how data is going to be transmitted over this network. Coding skills. Like I said, programming, not from a developer perspective but at least good enough to understand how the program functions what the flaws may be in the programming code that has been given 
and how you can break that particular code. That is what is required. A few scripting languages like PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, uh, they would be a lot helpful at this point in time. Maybe bash scripting or PowerShell scripting as well. And then our understanding of the architecture of an operating system. We just don't want to know how the operating system works and how it functions. We should be able to troubleshoot the operating system to recover from errors, flaws, and we should know how the operating system works, stores data, and interacts with the hardware in, at the first place. With everything, there is now cloud, and cloud is gaining traction a lot. We got public clouds like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. We got private clouds like VMware, uh, My Microsoft again, Citrix, and so on and so forth. Most of the organizations in today's world have a hybrid environment where they've got a part physical IT infra and part cloud infrastructure. So learning what cloud is, the nuances of cloud, the services that a cloud can provide, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and platform as a service, understanding them, and then knowing how you can secure these or what the vulnerabilities are in the first place, and then trying to secure them is of very much a sense in today's world. Over a period of time, you will have to learn cloud security to be relevant in today's world, especially with IoT, artificial intelligence, and machine learning uh, picking up pace and then malware analysis and reverse engineering. So let's say there's a new virus that has been released and there's an antivirus company who's working to figure out how the virus works, what are the signatures that are created by the virus, and this is where those malware analysis skills come into the picture. Even in real terms or in normal terms, if you're working in an organization and if a machine has been infected or is suspected of an infect infection, you need to investigate the machine to identify whether it was a worm, virus, or a trojan, and need to take effective action to prevent further compromise from happening. And that is why uh, mal malware analysis is of importance as well. The certifications that you have, Certified Ethical Hacker, it will train you in reverse engineering. So this is where you basically look at offensive security. This is where you're looking at hacking and you're looking at how uh, the methodologies, the five steps that we have talked about. And this course deals with each and every one of those five steps and helps you analyze and understand the tool sets and the skills that are required for each of that particular step. Salaries may range between 71,000 US dollars and above in the US market and around, around 5 lakh rupees and more in the Indian market. After CEH, we have got the ECSA slash LPT course. ECSA is the EC Council Certified Security Analyst course. Once you get certified on that, you can then apply for the LPT, which is the License Penetration Tester. So it's for CEH, then ECSA, EC Council Certified Security Analyst, and then LPT, License Penetration Tester. This gives certified penetration testers the opportunity to practice their skills and gives you a license where you have uh, and a certificate that proves that you have understood the methodology and are very adept at the skills of hacking. When we hear the term hacker, we may picture a dangerous cyber criminal. However, not all hackers are inherently bad. They are powerful individuals who use their technical skills to break into computer networks and bypass security measures. Hacking is not always bad and it is to be noted that the world of computers is actually safer to an extent because of a particular type of hacker. A hacker is deemed to be good or bad depending on their motive and whether or not they are breaking the law. In this video, we will acquaint you with the differences between a white hat hacker, black hat hacker and a grey hat hacker through a short story. Hackers are basically categorized by the type of metaphorical hat they don't white hat, grey hat and black hat. Hackers can either be a black hat or a white hat or a grey hat. Hackers can be good or bad depending on which colour hat they decide to wear and by this we mean their hacking motives and obviously not in the sense of creating a fashion statement here. Let's have a look at our story. Our story here revolves around Dan who is the owner of a company that provides a platform for video conferencing. His platform enables online communication for video meetings, audio meetings, and webinars. Just like other video conferencing platforms, his platform too has built-in features like chat, recording, screen sharing, and so on. Everything went well and his business increased tremendously with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 accelerated the rise of the worldwide digital economy and it made people rapidly adopt video conferencing tools and apps. In a contactless world, starting from employee interactions to family get-togethers to virtual workout classes, everything happened virtually. 
Dance video conferencing platform enabled long distance communication and enhanced collaboration. So now you might be wondering what could have gone wrong. Well, there are many risks involved when it comes to the safety of these online platforms. Online meeting rooms are susceptible to a number of digital threats. Dan received complaints from his customers that his platform was insecure and safe anymore. Little did Dan know that the popularity of his video conferencing platform made hackers eager to disrupt the virtual meetings and hijack the conferences. His platform witnessed complaints like the addition of an unknown participant in every meeting room, someone covering up information that is being presented, and also unknown screen recording of a meeting to name a few. These intruders were sneaky hackers who tried to gain access to sensitive information and who tried to disrupt meetings. And how did these hackers manage to do all this? Well, this was done by exploiting weaknesses in Dan's computer network in order to obtain unauthorized access to crucial data and sensitive information. This is known as hacking and the individuals who carry this out are known as hackers. In this form of hacking that Dan witnessed, hackers exploited Dan's company's security posture by identifying weaknesses in it in order to intrude into the meetings and gain access to business data or personal data. And this form of hacking is definitely bad and unethical. The hackers who carried this against Dan's company are known as black hat hackers. These hackers are cyber criminals who carry out cyber attacks with a negative intention. These attacks can be in the form of Trojan virus, malware attacks, phishing attacks, DDoS attacks, man in the middle attacks, SQL injection attacks, and so on. So who exactly is a black hat hacker? Like in the case of Dan's organization's cyber attack, black hat hackers are highly skilled cyber criminals who break into computer systems and networks with malicious intent. They illegally hack into a system and this is obviously without the system owner's approval. Such hackers do not abide by the laws, they violate laws and disrupt networks. The motive behind these attacks vary from monetary gains to personal profit. Usually they are for monetary gains. Black hat hackers may violate the confidentiality, integrity or availability of a company's systems and data. They may also use malware to destroy files or steal passwords, credit card numbers and other confidential information. Black hat hackers are also sometimes called crackers. So this is who a black hat hacker is. Moving back to Dan's story. Black hat hackers disrupted his business and he lost his customers as nobody wished to communicate on an unsecure platform. It is but true, right? Would you be okay to use a platform that is unsafe? None of us want to have unknown people in our meetings, right? This is how Dan's customers felt too and this news spread and his company's reputation took a bad hit. That is when Ted approached Dan. So who is Ted? Let's have a look at that now. Ted, who was unknown to Dan, explained to him that he found Dan's network to be weak. Ted told Dan that he has identified vulnerabilities in Dan's systems and networks and he will fix them provided Dan pays him well. Dan had nothing to lose and without any further delay, he paid Ted a good amount of money to fix the vulnerabilities in Dan's networks. On receiving the money, Ted began his work and he fixed all the issues and vulnerabilities in Dan's network. He made sure that nobody can exploit Dan's network vulnerabilities again and this way he safeguarded Dan's network for the time being. So who is Ted? Well, he's called a grey hat hacker. As they say, not all things are black and white. So is the concept of grey hat hackers. As fascinating as the name sounds, let us dive deep into understanding the role of a grey hat hacker. A grey hat is a security expert who may at times violate the laws or the ethical standards. However, they do not carry a malicious intent unlike a black hat hacker. Hence, they are known to work both defensively and offensively. They land between the good and the bad. Grey hat hackers look for vulnerabilities in a system without permission, but with good intentions. Just like how Ted informed Dan about how he could exploit Dan's system vulnerabilities, grey hat hackers inform an organization the same and in return ask for a fee to fix it. In some cases when the organization doesn't comply, grey hat hackers may become black hat hackers. Although a grey hat hacker's intention might not be bad, what they do is still illegal since they do not have permission to break into another system. Back to our story. 
Although Dan's issue was sorted by Ted for the time being, he had a few concerns. His first concern was history repeating itself. Yes, he was worried about what if black hat hackers hack into his systems again. Although his system vulnerabilities are fixed at the moment, it was a matter of time before they could be exploited again with new hacking techniques. His next thought was to have a professional who could constantly keep a tab on his networks and protect it from hackers. Don't you think his concerns were justified? Yes, it was, as this was the only way he could provide a safe and secure video conferencing platform in the long run. That is when Dan's friend came to his rescue and introduced Anne, the ethical hacker, to him. Anne, being an ethical hacker, assured Dan that she would scan and identify his network for system vulnerabilities before an outsider exploits it, and she would fix those vulnerabilities on a regular basis. Such ethical hackers like Anne are called white hat hackers. Now that we saw who black hat hackers and grey hat hackers were, it is time we learn about our third type of hacker who is a white hat hacker. A white hat hacker gains access to networks with an intention to fix the identified weaknesses. They also perform penetration testing and vulnerability assessments and break into systems with permission. They search for loopholes or vulnerabilities in any given piece of technology just like how a black hat hacker would do. However, white hat hackers harden their organization system before the bad guy can get in. Their goal is to spot system and network vulnerabilities in order to improve system security. White hat hackers are also known as ethical hackers since they obey the law of the land and follow a code of ethics. Many companies and government organizations employ white hat hackers to help them secure their systems. These hackers are typically hired by organizations to look for vulnerabilities in a system like other hackers. The only difference being they are given permission to break in. Once Dan spots the vulnerabilities, she documents her findings and gives Dan advice on how to fix them or she'll even take it up to fix them so that an outsider cannot spot it in the future. Anne does this on a regular basis as system updates happen regularly and it is imperative to be on track with it and fix new vulnerabilities. This made sure Dan's network is now safe and secure. Gradually, he regained his customers' trust and his platform got back to being one of the best and safest platforms for video conferencing. This resulted in a huge business growth and Dan was very happy. Just like how Anne put an end to Dan's business problems, there are many white hat hackers out there who are in great demand by organizations to safeguard their networks from cyber attacks. And if you are interested in a career in ethical hacking, then Simply Learn can help you fulfill your dreams. Simply Learn CH version 11 certification provides you the hands on training required to master the techniques hackers use to penetrate network systems and fortify your system against it. This ethical hacking course is aligned with the latest CH version 11 by EC Council and will adequately prepare you to increase your Blue Team skills. So what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and become a certified ethical hacker and put an end to the cyber crimes in the world. Remember, the more active white hat hackers are, the fewer opportunities black hat hackers have for system exploitation. Cybersecurity has become a struggle for organizations in 2021. Recent trends the side effects of a global pandemic and cybersecurity statistics reveal a huge increase in hacked and breached data for increasingly common sources in the workplace like mobiles and IoT devices. On top of this, the COVID-19 has ramped up remote workforces, making inroads for cyber attacks. This kind of growth would not have been possible if not for several reliable tools and services. From scripts that find intricate details of companies to software that can brute force servers with a single command. Today's lesson is all about such tools that make an ethical hacker effective. Let's learn about what is ethical hacking. Ethical hacking involves an authorized attempt to gain unauthorized access to a computer system, application or data. Carrying out an ethical hack involves duplicating strategies and actions of malicious attackers. Often carried out in the form of security audits, ethical hacking is extremely beneficial to organizations who are looking to secure the data from falling in the wrong hands. There are three variants of hackers. While a black hat hacker is notorious for criminal activities, a white hat is an ethical hacker or a computer security expert who specializes in penetration testing and other testing methodologies that ensure the security of an organization's system. 
There are a few that fall under the grey hat hacker umbrella, where the hacker occasionally have not authenticated themselves before attempting to hack an organization, while sometimes requiring a small fee to report the vulnerability to the developers directly. The purpose of ethical hacking is to improve the security of the network or the systems by fixing the vulnerabilities found during testing. Ethical hackers may use the same methods and tools used by the malicious hackers, but with the permission of the authorized person for the purpose of improving the security and defending the systems from attacks. Ethical hackers are expected to report all the vulnerabilities and weaknesses found during the process to the management directly. Ethical hacking has proven itself to be quite a productive career option for many ambitious individuals. The demand for its courses today is at an all-time high and rightfully so. It provides you with an engaging job that never gets tedious. Some certifications like the CompTIA+, CEH and Cisco CCNA are highly acclaimed and will teach a learner all there is to know before dipping their toes in the industry. When it comes to web app hacking, it generally refers to the exploitation of applications via HTTP which can be done by manipulating the applications via its graphical user interface. This is done by tampering with the uniform resource identifier also known as a URI or tampering with the HTTP elements directly which are not a part of the URI. The hacker can send a link via an email or a chat and may trick the users of a web application into executing actions. In case the attack is on an administrator account, the entire web application can be compromised. Anyone who uses a computer connected to the internet is susceptible to the threats that computer hackers and online predators pose. These online villains typically use phishing scams, spam email or instant messages and bogus websites to deliver dangerous malware to your computer and compromise your computer security. Computer hackers can also try to access your computer and private information directly if you are not protected by a firewall. They can monitor your conversations or peruse the back end of your personal website. Usually disguised with a bogus identity, predators can lure you into revealing sensitive personal and financial information. A web server, which can be referred to as the hardware, the computer or the software which helps to deliver content that can be accessed through the internet. The primary function of a web server is to deliver these web pages on the request to clients using the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP. So hackers attack the web server to steal credential information, passwords and business information by using different types of attacks like DDoS attacks, SYN flooding, ping flood, port scan and social engineering attacks. In the area of web security, despite strong encryption on the browser server channel, web users still have no assurance about what happens at the other end. Although wireless networks offer great flexibility, they have their own security problems. A hacker can sniff the network packets without having to be in the same building where the network is located. As wireless networks communicate through radio waves, a hacker can easily sniff the network from a nearby location. Most attackers use network sniffing to find the SSID and hack a wireless network. An attacker can attack a network from a distance and therefore it is sometimes difficult to collect evidence against the main hacker. Social engineering is the art of manipulating users of a computing system into revealing confidential information which can be later used to gain unauthorized access to a computer system. The term can also include activities such as exploiting human kindness, greed and curiosity to gain access to restricted access buildings or getting the users to installing backdoor software. Knowing the tricks used by hackers to trick users into releasing vital login information is fundamental in protecting computer systems. Coming to our main focus for today, let us have a look at the top 5 most essential ethical hacking tools to be used in 2021. At the top of the chain lies Nmap. Nmap, which stands for Network Mapper, is a free and open source utility for network discovery and security auditing. Many systems and network administrators also find it useful for tasks such as network inventory, managing service upgrade schedules and monitoring host or service uptime. It is most beneficial in the early stages of ethical hacking where a hacker must figure the possible entry point to a system before running the necessary exploits, thus allowing the hackers to leverage any insecure openings and thus breach the device. 
Nmap uses raw IP packets in novel ways to determine what hosts are available on the network, what service they are running, what operating systems are installed, what type of packet filters and firewalls are in use, and dozens other characteristics. It was designed to rapidly scan large networks, but works fine against single hosts as well. Since every application that connects to a network needs to do so via a port, the wrong port or a server configuration can open a can of worms which lead to a thorough breach of the system and ultimately a fully hacked device. Next on our list we have Metasploit. The Metasploit framework is a very powerful tool that can be used by cyber criminals as well as ethical hackers to probe systematic vulnerabilities on both networks and servers. Because it's an open source framework, it can be easily customized and used with most operating systems. With Metasploit, the ethical hacking team can use ready-made or custom code and introduce it into a network to probe for weak spots. As another flavor of threat hunting, once the flaws are identified and documented, the information can be used to address systemic weaknesses and prioritize solutions. Once a particular vulnerability is identified and the necessary exploit is fed into the system, there are a host of options for the hacker. Depending on the vulnerability, hackers can even run root commands from the terminal, allowing complete control over the activities of the compromised system as well as all the personal data stored on the device. A big advantage of Metasploit is the ability to run full-fledged scans on the target system, which gives a detailed picture of the security index of the system along with the necessary exploits that can be used to bypass the antivirus software. Having a single solution to gather almost all the necessary points of attack is very useful for ethical hackers and penetration testers as denoted by its high rank in the list. Moving on, we have the Acunetics framework. Acunetics is an end-to-end -end web security scanner which offers a 360 degree view of an organization's security. It is an application security testing tool that helps the company address vulnerability across all their critical web assets. The need to be able to test application in depth and further than traditional vulnerability management tools has created a market with several players in the application security space. Acunetics can detect over 7000 vulnerabilities including SQL injections, cross-site scripting, misconfigurations, weak passwords, exposed database and other out-of-band vulnerabilities. It can scan all pages, web apps and complex web applications running HTML5 and JavaScript as well. It also lets you scan complex multi-level forms and even password protected areas of the site. Acunetics is a dynamic application security testing package which has definite perks over status application security testing frameworks which are also known as SAST scanners. SAST tools only work during development and only for specific languages and have a history of reporting a lot of false positives whereas dynamic testing tools also known as DAST have the ability to streamline testing from development to deployment with minimal issues. Next on our list we have Ergaden. This is a multi-use bash script used for Linux systems to hack and audit wireless networks like our everyday Wi-Fi router and its counterparts. Along with being able to launch denial of service attacks on compromised networks, this multi-purpose Wi-Fi hacking tool has very rich features which support multiple methods for Wi-Fi hacking including WPS hacking modes, WP attacks, handshake captures, evil twin and so much more. It usually needs an external network adapter that supports monitor mode which is necessary to be able to capture wireless traffic that traverses the air channels. Thanks to its open source nature, Airgarden can be used with multiple community plugins and add-ons, thereby increasing its effectiveness against a wide variety of routers, both in the 2.4 GHz and the 5 GHz band. Finally at number 5, we have John the Ripper. John the Ripper is an open source password security auditing and the password recovery tool which is available for many operating systems. John the Ripper Jumbo supports hundreds of hash and cipher types including for user passwords of operating systems, web apps, database servers, encrypted keys and document files. Some of the key features of the tool include offering multiple modes to speed up the password cracking, 
automatically deselecting the hashing algorithm used by the passwords and the ease of running and configuring the tool to make it password cracking easier. It can use dictionary attacks along with regular brute forcing to speed up the process of cracking the correct password without wasting additional resources. The word list being used in these dictionary attacks can be used by the user's end, allowing for a completely customizable process. We also have a few honorary mentions in our list that just missed the cut. NetSparker, for instance, is an automated yet fully configurable web application security scanner that enables you to scan websites, web applications, and web services. The scanning technology is designed to help you secure web applications easily without any fuss, so you can focus on fixing the reported vulnerabilities. The Burp Suit Professional is one of the most popular penetration testing and vulnerability finder tools and is used for checking web application security. The term Burp, as it is commonly known, is a proxy-based tool which is used to evaluate the security of web-based application and to do hands-on testing. Moving away from websites and applications, Wireshark is a free and open source packet analyzer which was launched in 2006. It is used for network troubleshooting, analysis, software and communications protocol development and education. It captures network traffic on the local network and stores data for offline analysis. Wireshark captures network traffic from Ethernet, Bluetooth, wireless networks and frame relay connections. Now that we learn about the different types of tools that can be used when conducting an ethical hacking audit, let's learn about some potential benefits of such campaigns and why organizations prefer to pay for such audits. Being able to identify defects from an attacker's perspective is game-changing since it displays all the potential avenues of a possible hack. One can only prepare for the known vulnerabilities as a defensive specialist, but proactively trying to breach a network or device can make hackers think of techniques that no defense contractors can account for. This kind of unpredictability goes a long way in securing a network against malicious actors. Another advantage of hiring ethical hackers is the ability to preemptively fix possible weak points in a company's network infrastructure. As seen on many occasions, a real breach will cause loss of data and irreparable damage to the foundation of an organization. Being able to gauge such shortcomings before they become public and can be used exploited is a benefit most organizations make use of. This is not to imply that such security audits are only beneficial to the organization paying for it. When coming across companies that provide certain services, a reliable third-party security audit goes a long way in instilling trust and confidence over their craft. If the ethical hackers cannot find any major vulnerabilities that can be leveraged by hackers, it just accentuates the technical brilliance of the organization and its engineers, thereby increasing the clientele by a substantial amount. With the rise in censorship and general fear over privacy loss, consumer security is at an all-time high risk. Technology has made our life so much easier while putting up a decent target on our personal information. It is necessary to understand how to simultaneously safeguard our data and be up to date with the latest technological developments. Maintaining this balance has become easier with cryptography taking its place in today's digital world. So here's a story to help you understand cryptography. Meet Anne. Anne wanted to look for a decent discount on the latest iPhone. She started searching on the internet and found a rather shady website that offered a 50% discount on the first purchase. Once Anne submitted her payment details, a huge chunk of money was withdrawn from a bank account just moments after. Devastated, Anne quickly realized she had failed to notice that the website was a HTTP web page instead of an HTTPS one. The payment information submitted was not encrypted and it was visible to anyone keeping an eye, including the website owner and hackers. Had she used a reputed website which has encrypted transactions and employs cryptography, our iPhone enthusiast could have avoided this particular incident. This is why it's never recommended to visit unknown websites or share any personal information on them. Now that we understand why cryptography is so important, let's take a look at the topics to be covered today. We take a look into what cryptography is and how it works. We learn where cryptography is being used in our daily lives and how we are benefiting from it. Then we will understand the different types of cryptography and their respective uses. 
Moving on, we will look at the usage of cryptography in ancient history and a live demonstration of cryptography and encryption in action. Let's now understand what cryptography is. Cryptography is the science of encrypting or decrypting information to prevent unauthorized access. We transform our data and personal information so that only the correct recipient can understand the message. As an essential aspect of modern data security, using cryptography allows the secure storage and transmission of data between willing parties. Encryption is the primary route for employing cryptography by adding certain algorithms to jumble up the data. Decryption is the process of reversing the work done by encrypting information so that the data becomes readable again. Both of these methods form the basis of cryptography. For example, when simply learn is jumbled up or changed in any format, not many people can guess the original word by looking at the encrypted text. The only ones who can are the people who know how to decrypt the coded word, thereby reversing the process of encryption. Any data pre-encryption is called plain text or clear text. To encrypt the message, we use certain algorithms that serve a single purpose of scrambling the data to make them unreadable without the necessary tools. These algorithms are called ciphers. They are a set of detailed steps to be carried out one after the other to make sure the data becomes as unreadable as possible until it reaches the receiver. We take the plain text, pass it to the cipher algorithm and get the encrypted data. This encrypted text is called the cipher text and this is the message that is transferred between the two parties. The key that is being used to scramble the data is known as the encryption key. These steps that is the cipher and the encryption key are made known to the receiver who can then reverse the encryption on receiving the message. Unless any third party manages to find out both the algorithm and the secret key that is being used, they cannot decrypt the messages since both of them are necessary to unlock the hidden content. Wonder what else we would lose if not for cryptography? Any website where you have an account can read your passwords. Important emails can be intercepted and their contents can be read without encryption during the transit. More than 65 billion messages are sent on WhatsApp every day, all of which are secured thanks to end-to-end -end encryption. There is a huge market opening up for cryptocurrency, which is possible due to blockchain technology that uses encryption algorithms and hashing functions to ensure that the data is secure. If this is of particular interest to you, you can watch our video on blockchain, the link of which will be in the description. Of course, there is no single solution to a problem as diverse as explained. There are three variants of how cryptography works and is in practice. They are symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption and hashing. Let's find out how much we have understood until now. Do you remember the difference between a cipher and ciphertext? Leave your answers in the comments and before we proceed, if you find this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up before moving ahead. Let's look at symmetric encryption first. Symmetric encryption uses a single key for both the encryption and decryption of data. It is comparatively less secure than asymmetric encryption but much faster. It is a compromise that has to be embraced in order to deliver data as fast as possible without leaving information completely vulnerable. This type of encryption is used when data rests on servers and identifies personnel for payment applications and services. The potential drawback with symmetric encryption is that both the sender and receiver need to have the same secret key and it should be kept hidden at all times. Caesar cipher, Enigma machine are both symmetric encryption examples that we will look into further. For example, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she can apply a substitution cipher or a shift cipher to encrypt the message. But Bob must be aware of the same key itself so he can decrypt it when he finds it necessary to read the entire message. Symmetric encryption uses one of the two types of ciphers, stream ciphers and block ciphers. Block ciphers break the plain text into blocks of fixed size and use the key to convert it into ciphertext. Stream ciphers convert the plain text into ciphertext one bit at a time instead of resorting to breaking them up into bigger chunks. In today's world, 
the most widely used symmetric encryption algorithm is AES-256 that stands for Advanced Encryption Standard which has a key size of 256-bit with 128-bit and 196-bit key sizes also being available. Other primitive algorithms like the Data Encryption Standard that is the DES, the Triple Data Encryption Standard 3DES and Blowfish have all fallen out of favor due to the rise of AES. AES chops up the data into blocks and performs 10 plus rounds of obscuring and substituting the message to make it unreadable. Asymmetric encryption on the other hand has a double whammy at its disposal. There are two different keys at play here, a public key and a private key. The public key is used to encrypt information pre-transit and a private key is used to decrypt the information post-transit. If Alice wants to communicate with Bob using asymmetric encryption, she encrypts the message using Bob's public key. After receiving the message, Bob uses his own private key to decrypt the data. This way, nobody can intercept the message in between transmissions and there is no need for any secure key exchange for this to work since the encryption is done with a public key and the decryption is done with a private key that no one except Bob has access to. Both the keys are necessary to read the full message. There is also a reverse scenario where we can use the private key for encryption and the public key for decryption. A server can sign non-confidential information using its private key and anyone who has its public key can decrypt the message. This mechanism also proves that the sender is authenticated and there is no problem with the origin of the information. RSA encryption is the most widely used asymmetric encryption standard. It is named after its founders Rivest, Shamir and Edelman and it uses block ciphers that separate the data into blocks and obscure the information. Widely considered the most secure form of encryption, albeit relatively slower than AES, it is widely used in web browsing, secure identification, VPNs, emails and chat applications. With so much hanging on the key's secrecy, there must be a way to transmit the keys without others reading our private data. Many systems use a combination of symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption to bolster security and match speed at the same time. Since asymmetric encryption takes longer to decrypt large amounts of data, the full information is encrypted using a single key, that is, symmetric encryption. That single key is then transmitted to the receiver using asymmetric encryption, so you don't have to compromise either way. Another route is using the Diffie-Hellman key exchange which relies on a one-way function and is much tougher to break into. The third variant of cryptography is termed as hashing. Hashing is the process of scrambling a piece of data beyond recognition. It gives an output of fixed size which is known as the hash value of the original data or just hash in general. The calculations that do the job of messing up the data collection form the hash function. They are generally not reversible without resilient brute force mechanisms and are very helpful when storing data on website servers that need not be stored in plain text. For example, many websites store your account passwords in a hashed format so that not even the administrator can read your credentials. When a user tries to log in, they can compare the entered password's hash value with the hash value that is already stored on the servers for authentication since the function will always return the same value for the same input. Cryptography has been in practice for centuries. Julius Caesar used a substitution shift to move alphabets a certain number of spaces beyond their place in the alphabet table. A spy can't decipher the original message at first glance. For example, if he wanted to pass confidential information to his armies and decides to use the substitution shift of plus 2, A becomes C, B becomes D and so on. The word attack when passed through a substitution shift of plus 3 becomes D W W D E F N. This cipher has been appropriately named the Caesar cipher which is one of the most widely used algorithms. The Enigma is probably the most famous cryptographic cipher device used in ancient history. It was used by the Nazi German armies in the World Wars. They were used to protect confidential political, military and administrative information and it consisted of three or more rotors that scrambled the original message depending on the machine state at that time. 
The decryption is similar, but it needs both machines to stay in the same state before passing the ciphertext so that we receive the same plain text message. Let's take a look at how our data is protected while we browse the internet thanks to cryptography. Here we have a web-based tool that will help us understand the process of RSA encryption. We see the entire workflow from selecting the key size to be used until the decryption of the ciphertext in order to get the plain text back. As we already know, RSA encryption algorithm falls under the umbrella of asymmetric key cryptography. That basically implies that we have two keys at play here, a public key and a private key. Typically, the public key is used by the sender to encrypt the message and the private key is used by the receiver to decrypt the message. There are some occasions when this allocation is reversed and we will have a look at them as well. In RSA, we have the choice of key size. We can select any key from a 512-bit to 1024-bit all the way up to a 4096-bit key. The longer the key length, the more complex the encryption process becomes and thereby strengthening the ciphertext. Although with added security, more complex functions take longer to perform the same operations on similar size of data. We have to keep a balance between both speed and strength because the strongest encryption algorithms are of no use if they cannot be practically deployed in systems around the world. Let's take a 1024-bit key over here. Now we need to generate the keys. This generation is done by functions that operate on pass phrases. The tool we are using right now generates these pseudo-random keys to be used in this explanation. Once we generate the keys, you can see the public key is rather smaller than the private key, which is almost always the case. These two keys are mathematically linked with each other. They cannot be substituted with any other key. And in order to encrypt the original message or decrypt the ciphertext, this pair must be kept together. The public key is then sent to the sender and the receiver keeps the private key with himself. In this scenario, let's try and encrypt a word, simply learn. We have to select if the key being used for encryption is either private or public, since that affects the process of scrambling the information. Since we are using the public key over here, let's select the same and copy it and paste over here. The cipher we are using right now is plain RSA. There are some modified ciphers with their own pros and cons that can also be used provided we use it on a regular basis and depending on the use case as well. Once we click on encrypt, we can see the ciphertext being generated over here. The pseudorandom generating functions are created in such a way that a single character change in the plain text will trigger a completely different ciphertext. This is a security feature to strengthen the process from brute force methods. Now that we are done with the encryption process, let's take a look at the decryption part. The receiver gets this ciphertext from the sender with no other key or supplement. He or she must already possess the private key generated from the same pair. No other private key can be used to decrypt the message since they are mathematically linked. We paste the private key here and select the same. The cipher must always so be the same used during the encryption process. Once we click decrypt, you can see the original plain text we had decided to encrypt. This sums up the entire process of RSA encryption and decryption. Now some people use it the other way around. We also have the option of using the private key to encrypt information and the public key to decrypt it. This is done mostly to validate the origin of the message. Since the keys only work in pairs, if a different private key is used to encrypt the message, the public key cannot decrypt it. Conversely, if the public key is able to decrypt the message, it must have been encrypted with the right private key and hence the rightful owner. Here we just have to take the private key and use that to encrypt the plain text and select the same in this checkbox as well. You can see we have generated a completely new ciphertext. This ciphertext will be sent to the receiver and this time we will use the public key for decryption. Let's select the correct checkbox and decrypt and we still get the same output. Now let's take a look at practical example of encryption in the real world. We all use the internet on a daily basis and many are aware of the implications of using unsafe websites. Let's take a look at Wikipedia here. Pretty standard HTTPS website where the H stands for secured. 
Let's take a look at how it secures the data. Wireshark is the world's foremost and most widely used network protocol analyzer. It lets you see what's happening on your network at a microscopic level. And we are going to use this software to see the traffic that is leaving our machine and to understand how vulnerable it is. Since there are many applications running in this machine, let's apply a filter that will only show us the results related to Wikipedia. Let's search for something that we can navigate the website with. Okay, once we get into it a little, you can see some of the requests being populated over here. Let's take a look at the specific request. These are the data packets that basically transport the data from our machine to the internet and vice versa. As you can see, there's a bunch of gibberish data here that doesn't really reveal anything that we searched or watched. Similarly, other secured websites function the same way and it is very difficult, if at all possible, to snoop on user data this way. To put this in perspective, let's take a look at another website, which is a HTTP web page. This has no encryption enabled from the server end, which makes it vulnerable to attacks. There is a login form here, which needs legitimate user credentials in order to grant access. Let's enter a random pair of credentials. These obviously won't work, but we can see the manner of data transfer. Unsurprisingly, we weren't able to get into the platform. Instead, we can see the data packets. Let's apply a similar filter that will help us understand what request this website is sending. These are the requests being sent by the HTTP login form to the internet. If we check here, see, whatever username and password that we are entering, we can easily see it with the Wireshark. Now, we used a dummy pair of credentials. If we select the right data packet, we can find our correct credentials. If any website had asked for our payment information or our legitimate credentials, it would have been really easy to get a hold of these. To reiterate what we have already learned, we must always avoid HTTP websites and just unknown or not trustworthy websites in general because the problem we saw here is just the tip of the iceberg. Even though cryptography has managed to lessen the risk of cyber attacks, it is still prevalent and we should always be alert to keep ourselves safe online. Due to the increase in the network transactions in the modern era, there are often cases when we face some problems regarding network issues. But are they exactly network issues or is somebody spying on us? Well, such cases are regarded as network sniffing cases. But how exactly a hacker hack into a network system? Well, for today's topic, we'll understand the same. Let's take a look at network sniffing. To access the network related information between devices to gain profit or use the hacked data for illegal purpose is known as network sniffing. This is a process where a hacker or a malicious programmer spy into the network devices of our system. They can access different websites that we visit often or see our network habits. Let's take a look at different tools that are suitable for sniffing purpose. Network sniffing tools are softwares that are available on the internet that can be used to sniff into the network. Let's take a look at some of the famous network tools. First one is AWIC. This is a networking sniffing tool which has a specialization in intelligent analysis for network packets. Next is Wireshark. This software tool is best to look into protocol related data packets that are often transmitted over the network. And lastly, we have SolarWind Network Packet Sniffer where the performance of this sniffing tool is best where the performance management is to be looked into. Let's take a look at the Wireshark sniffing tool. 
This is an open source network sniffing software which is specifically designed to attack data packets during the transmission over the network. This type of software uses different color combinations to represent different packets and protocols. Let's take a look at some of the uses for the sniffing software. The first use is it is used to analyze network packets, whereas it can also be used to troubleshoot different network issues which are often used by different engineers to test whether the software or a network device is susceptible to an attack. And lastly, it is also used to check malicious and hacking possibilities on the network. Now that we are completed with the briefing for the software that is known as Wireshark, let's take a look at the actual demo how exactly network sniffing is done. You can directly access the Wireshark software website where you can find the download option and download the most suitable version for your laptop or computer device. After downloading the software, when you install it, you will get something like this. As we can see, these connections are the connections that are connected to my laptop right now. And the difference in the graph that we can see over here represent the traffic on the network that is present. To much better understand what exactly is going on the network, we can access one of them. Let's access the Wi-Fi network on my laptop. After accessing the network, we can see some packet settings like this. These represents the packet transaction that has been made on my network through the internet. And this is how a hacker or a cyber criminal knows how exactly we use a network services. This part of the Wireshark represents different detailed information about the transaction that has been made. And the last section represents some raw data or garbage data. How exactly a hacker use all this jumbled data and hack into a system? Well, to clarify this, there is an option that can be used that is known as display filter on the Wireshark software. If you want to search for a specific protocol, for example TCP, we can write TCP in the search filter and search. And now as we can see, we only get the protocols that are related to TCP. This is how we can differentiate different protocols and access some of them to gain knowledge about what exactly is going on in the network. Let's try accessing some other protocol now. For example, DNS. And as we can see, only the protocol and the data packet that is related to DNS protocol is visible to us. To further enhance the display filter, let's try accessing a different page on the web browser for example simplylearn.com when we access the simply learn website we can see the professional courses that are available but let's take a look at the changes that has been made on the wireshark to know this let's write tcp and a keyword included contains and one more thing to include over here is during the display filter, if you write something that is related to the software, it will represent in a green color like this. But if you write some error related keywords like this, it will represent in the red. Let's continue with the search setting. Including the contains keyword and writing, simply learn and entering. Now, as we can see, these two related data packets represent the Simply Learn website that we accessed just now, where the source destination IP address represents my system address, whereas the destination that is 13.224.21.74 represent the Simply Learn's IP address. Let's take a look. And in the garbage area or the raw data, we can take a look Simply Learn website. 
to see some more details regarding the same, you can access the transport layer security and the transmission control protocol where we can see the source port, the destination port which is always 443 as well as the flag and the timestamp for the same. This is how hackers get the data about the network settings. But if we want to search for more data related to Simply Learn website that we visited just now, there's an another filter that we can use. For example, using ip.addr space equal equal and writing the IP address for the website Simply Learn. That is 13.224.21. And when we press enter, we get all the related data for the Simply Learn website. And this is how we can see the related data. To much further enhance our display settings, let's try in another example. Access your internet browser and access some other website. For example, dot for example, the State University and access the Allahabad State University and some other part in it, for example, the University State PDF. Let's see the changes in our Wireshark settings and try using HTTP. When we write this, we get the data that is related to the HTTP. But what is the use for the same? When you access this, and right click on the same and choose the option follow and http stream and over here we can take a look at the host that is the website that we just visited now imagine if we were a hacker and we knew all this we can access any website that our user visited and we can hack into his system through the website guys but the point that has to be noted over here is if we use the network sniffing tool wireshark or some other tool that is available on the internet for research purpose or experimental use that's fine but we shouldn't use all these softwares for any malicious activity because that is illegal now some of the options that we can see are the red box. This action is used if we want to stop the traffic connection. That means if we press this option and clear this and press enter, this shows that the network settings has stopped receiving any traffic that is available on the network. But if we want to access them again, we can choose this blue fin option continue without saving and the software against start recording the websites or the data packets that are available on the network. Now let's take a look at an example. As we all know, we often visit different websites and there are some cases we often see when the Chrome represent a non-secure option. That represents that the website is Unprotected against network attack. For example, we can access an experimental website. This is a website that allows us to access the non secure part of a website. If we write for username as admin1213 and for password as simply learn. and login. As this is an experimental website, it says it's sorry and the login has failed. Let's see the changes in a Wireshark software. Now, as we already did earlier, if we want to access a specific website, we should write TCP contains and the keyword of the website that was admin. Through this, we can see this was the website that we visited just now. 
But if we want to access the actual important data, that was the password that we typed, we can use this option. And over here, we can see the Simply Learn, which was encrypted earlier in the website. This is how a hacker or a cyber criminal use different sniffing softwares and gain data about different users. In this video, we bring you the best programming languages for hacking. Here, we will give you the top 5 programming languages that will help you enhance your hacking skills. First, let's understand the importance of knowing programming for hacking. You might wonder if programming is a necessity to become a hacker. As you might be aware, hacking involves breaking the protocols and exploiting a network. Thus, being a hacker requires you to understand the languages of the software that you are focusing on. Hence, it is required that a hacker knows coding. Having zero coding knowledge will definitely limit your opportunities in the future. Knowing different programming languages is undoubtedly an asset for hackers. Everyone wants to become a hacker today. However, it is not as easy as it is shown in numerous movies. It takes plenty of practice and programming knowledge to become an ethical hacking expert. If you want to become a hacker, it is imperative that you have a knack for programming languages. It is a known fact that some of the world's best hackers started off as programmers. If you know how to program, you will be able to dissect a code and analyze it. You can write your scripts or malware that can be used on the victim. Yes, there are several ready-made scripts available today. However, you might need to apply your skills in case the available scripts don't work well for you. Sometimes when script modification is required, you should be in a position to do that. In such a scenario, zero knowledge of the respective programming language will definitely be a hindrance. Programs can also help you automate multiple tasks which would normally take a lot of time. Codes allow you to penetrate different fields you want to hack. It will help you identify the plan behind an attack and defend against deadly hacking techniques and make your cybersecurity career worthwhile. It will help you understand the working of the target system or application before carrying out an exploit. Now that we have an idea as to why programming is important for hackers, let us understand which programming languages should a hacker learn. There are several programming languages for hacking and it might be overwhelming to choose from the endless list. Here we are to help you with that. Do keep in mind that your choice of programming language will also depend on the type of system you are targeting and your strategy. Let us now move on to the list of the top programming languages that are extensively used by hackers around the world. As you see on your screens, here we have the top 5 programming languages for hackers. Let us go through them one by one. Number 1 on our list is one of the most popular programming languages today, that is Python. Python is a general purpose programming language and in the field of hacking, it is mainly used for exploit writing. It is referred to as the de facto hacking programming language. It plays a crucial role in writing hacking scripts, exploits and malicious programs. One great feature that makes hacking easy with Python is the availability of ready-made modules. For example, OS modules are available if the target is a native operating system. For networking, there is a socket module and a lot more. Python socket programming can be used for discovering vulnerabilities in a system since Python code helps in checking the security integrity of systems and it can also be used to exploit them. Python has a massive community that helps with third-party plugins every day. It is also an easy-to-read language with a simple syntax. This will be helpful for beginners. You can easily write automation scripts using Python and it also makes prototyping much faster. Moving on to our second programming language, we have JavaScript. Currently, JavaScript is one of the best programming languages for hacking web applications. A good understanding of JavaScript allows a hacker to discover vulnerabilities and carry web exploitation since most of the web apps use JavaScript or one of its libraries. Knowing JavaScript will help you discover flaws in web applications. JavaScript can be used to read saved cookies and security experts also use JavaScript to develop cross-site scripting programs for hacking. JavaScript is known for carrying out attacks like cross-site scripting. JavaScript can also be used to spread and reproduce malware and viruses easily. Initially, JavaScript was a client-side scripting language. However, with the release of Node.js, it now supports backend development. This implies a larger field for exploitation. A hacker can now use JavaScript to snoop the typed words, inject malicious code, and track browsing history to name a few. 
Number 3 on our list is PHP. Hypertext Preprocessor or PHP is a dynamic server-side programming language that is used to build websites. Hackers should understand PHP as it will help them understand web hacking techniques better. Especially if you are into web hacking, then getting your hands on PHP would be an asset. PHP is used in server-side scripting. Using PHP, you could write a custom application that modifies settings on a web server and makes the target server susceptible to attacks. With the help of PHP, you can also eliminate any vulnerabilities in your code. PHP is one of the most powerful server-side languages used in most of the web domains. This shows how learning PHP can help you with web hacking and also help you fight against malicious attackers. Popular content management systems run on a foundation of PHP. Hence, having a strong knowledge of PHP can help you protect or compromise such websites. Next on a list of the best programming languages for hackers is SQL. SQL is the acronym for Structured Query Language. Although SQL is not a traditional programming language, it is a language used for only communicating with databases. Several systems like MySQL, PostgreSQL store their data in databases. SQL is used to interact with such databases in order to organize, add, retrieve, delete, or edit data from a database. Having an in-depth knowledge of SQL lets you comprehend the structure of a database, thereby helping you decide which scripts or tools to deploy. SQL is used for the purpose of web hacking. SQL is undoubtedly the best programming language when it comes to hacking into large databases. It will be impossible to counteract database attacks without a good understanding of SQL. Using SQL, hackers can perform an attack known as SQL injection attack. Such an attack enables hackers to access confidential information from databases. SQL is used by hackers to develop various hacking programs based on SQL injection. SQL injection is used to bypass web application login algorithms that are weak. Such an attack can also help a hacker view and modify confidential information from databases. Finally, at number 5, we have the C programming language. It is no surprise that we have C, the mother of all programming languages, on our list. It is used massively in the security field. It helps with exploit writing and development. The low-level nature of C provides an edge over other programming languages used for hacking. A hacker can use the C programming language to his or her advantage when it comes to accessing low-level hardware components such as the RAM. Security professionals mostly use C when they are required to manipulate system resources and hardware. C also helps penetration testers write programming scripts. Most operating systems and computer programs are coded in C language. Hence, learning C, you will help hackers get an overview of the structure of operating systems. C is also used to create shell codes, rootkits, exploits, build undetectable malware, keyloggers, and much more. Sometimes it is also advisable to learn both C and C++ as they both come in handy for hackers. So those were our top 5 programming languages for hackers. Do keep in mind that the most important step of becoming a hacker is to learn various programming languages. It will be great if you can master a variety of programming languages as your target will not be the same always. On that note, in addition to previously mentioned programming languages, we have an additional list of languages that are also well recognized for hacking. Let's have a look at our honorary mention. First, we have Ruby. The Ruby programming language has been used for exploitation for quite some time now. There can be a close comparison drawn between Ruby and Python based on its syntax. However, Ruby is more web-focused. Ruby can be used to write either small or large scripts and can be used interchangeably with bash scripting. It offers good flexibility while writing exploits. Ruby has been used by several hackers to exploit corporate systems. It is not that easy to master Ruby and that is one reason why MNCs look for professionals who know Ruby. Second, we have Perl. Although Perl has lost its old fame, it still holds value in the hacker community for exploit writing. There are systems that still run on Perl as it was the go-to solution once. It is a great language that can help you manipulate Linux text files and help you create tools and exploits. Perl code bases still do occupy a considerable portion of corporate tools. Third on our list is HTML. Many of you might have wondered why we didn't mention HTML yet. Yes, no programming list is complete without mentioning HTML. 
The Hypertext Markup Language, HTML, is a standard markup language used for creating web pages. It glues the whole internet together and it is the language of the web. This shows the importance HTML has. An understanding of HTML is vital to play with web applications. HTML also finds its use in developing hybrid mobile and desktop apps. HTML is a must if you want to master this field. Having said that, HTML is not that tough a language to learn. Hence, it is advised to master HTML if you want to compromise web applications. And finally, at 4 we have assembly level language. It is undoubtedly one of the most powerful yet hardest programming languages to learn. It is a complicated low-level programming language. For hacking primitive systems, assembly is one of the best programming languages. The best part of assembly is that you can instruct machine hardware or software using it. Assembly language helps a hacker manipulate systems straight up at the architecture level. It is also the most suited coding language to build malware like viruses and trojans. It is considered to be the best language for jobs that are time critical. Reverse engineers use assembly language. For example, if you're interested in software cracking and if you want to reverse engineer a piece of software that has already been compiled, assembly is the go-to choice. As complicated as a language sounds, the results it produces are highly fruitful. So those were the additional programming languages that can help you become a skilled and successful hacker. We should keep in mind that a strong understanding of programming languages help cybersecurity professionals stay on top of cyber criminals. Kali Linux is an operating system that has become a well-known weapon in this fight against hackers. A Linux distribution that is made specifically for penetration testers. Let's start by learning about Kali Linux in general. Kali Linux, which is formerly known as Backtrack Linux, is an open source Linux distribution aimed at advanced penetration testing and security auditing. It contains several hundred tools that are targeted towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics, and reverse engineering. Kali Linux is a multiple platform solution accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. Among all the Linux distributions, Kali Linux takes its roots from the Debian operating system. Debian has been a highly dependable and stable distribution for many years, providing a similarly strong foundation to the Kali desktop. While the operating system is capable of practically modifying every single part of our installation, the networking components of Kali become disabled by default. This is done to prevent any external factors from affecting the installation procedure which may pose a risk in critical environments. Apart from boosting security, it allows a deeper element of control to the most enthusiastic of users. We did not get Kali Linux since the first day. How did it come into existence? Let's take a look at some of its history. Kali Linux is based on years of knowledge and experience in building penetration testing and operating systems. During all these project lifelines, there have been only a few different developers as the team has always been small. The first project was called WAPEX, which stands for White Hat NOPEX. As can be inferred from the name, it was based on the NOPEX operating system as its underlying OS. WAPEX had releases ranging from version 2.0 to 2.7. This made way for the next project, which was known as WAX, or the long hand being White Hat Slacks. The name change was because the base OS was changed from NOPEX to Slacks. WAX started at version 3 as a nod, it carrying on from WAPEX. There was a similar OS being produced at the same time, Auditor Security Collection, often being shorted to just Auditor, which was once again using Nopix. Its efforts were combined with WAX to produce Backtrack. Backtrack was based on Slackware from version 1 to version 3, but switched to Ubuntu later on with version 4 to version 5. Using the experience gained from all of this, Kali Linux came after Backtrack in 2013. Kali started off using Debian Stable as the engine under the hood before moving to Debian testing when Kali Linux became a rolling operating system. Now that we understand the history and the purpose of Kali Linux, let us learn a little more about its distinct features. The latest version of Kali comes with more than 600 penetration tools pre-installed. After reviewing every tool that was included in Backtrack, 
developers have eliminated a great number of tools that either simply did not work or which duplicated other tools that provided the same or similar functionality. The Kali Linux team is made up of a small group of individuals who are the only ones trusted to commit packages and interact with the repositories, all of which is done using multiple secure protocols. Restricting access of critical code bases to external assets greatly reduces the risk of source contamination, which can cause Kali Linux users worldwide a great deal of damage as a direct victim of cybercrime. Although penetration tools tend to be written in English, the developers have ensured that Kali includes true multilingual support, allowing more users to operate in the native language and locate the tools they need for the job. The more comfortable a user feels with the intricacies of the operating system, the easier it is to maintain a stronghold over the configuration and the device in general. Since ARM-based single board systems like the Raspberry Pi are becoming more and more prevalent and inexpensive, the development team knew that Kali's ARM support would need to be as robust as they could manage with fully working installations. Kali Linux is available on a wide range of ARM devices and has ARM repositories integrated with the mainline distributions, so the tools for ARM are updated in conjunction with the rest of the distribution. All this information is necessary for users to determine if Kali Linux is the correct choice for them. If it is, what are the ways that they can go forward with this installation and start their penetration testing journey? The first way to use Kali Linux is by launching the distribution in the live USB mode. This can be achieved by downloading the installer image file or the ISO file from the Kali Linux website and flashing it to a USB drive with a capacity of at least 8 GB. Some people don't need to save their data permanently and a live USB is the perfect solution for such cases. After the ISO image is flashed, the thumb drive can be used to boot a fully working installation of the operating system with the caveat that any changes made to the OS in this mode are not written permanently. Some cases allow persistent usage in live USBs, but those require further configuration than normal situations. But what if the user wants to store data permanently in the installed OS? The best and the most reliable way to ensure this is the full-fledged hard disk installation. This will ensure the complete usage of the system's hardware capabilities and will take into account the updates and the configurations being made to the OS. This method is supposed to override any pre-existing operating system installed on the computer, be it Windows or any other variant of Linux. The next alternative route for installing Kali Linux would be to use virtualization software such as VMware or VirtualBox. The software will be installed as a separate application on an already existing OS and Kali Linux can be run as an operating system in the same computer as a window. The hardware requirements will be completely customizable, starting with the allotted RAM to the virtual hard disk capacity. The usage of both a host and guest operating system like Kali Linux allows users a safe environment to learn while not putting their systems at risk. If you want to learn more about how one can go forward with this method, we have a dedicated video where Kali Linux is being installed on VMware while running on a Windows 10 operating system. You can find the link in the description box to get started with your very own virtual machine. The final way to install Kali Linux is by using a dual boot system. To put it in simple words, the Kali Linux OS will not be overwriting any pre-installed operating system on a machine but will be installed alongside it. When a computer boots up, the user will get a choice to boot into either of these operating systems. Many people prefer to keep both the Windows and Kali Linux installed, so the distribution of work and recreational activities is also allotted effectively. It gives users a safety valve should their custom Linux installation run into any bugs that cannot be fixed from within the operating system. There are multiple ways to install Kali Linux. We can either install it on a normal hard drive, in a virtual machine software such as VMware or VirtualBox, or we can do that in hard bare metal machines. Now for the convenience of explanation, we're going to install Kali Linux today on a virtual machine software known as VMware. VMware is able to run multiple operating systems on a single host machine, which in our case is a Windows 10 system. To get started with Kali Linux installation, we have to go to the website to download an image file. We go to Get Kali. And as you can see, there are multiple platforms on which this operating system can be inverted. 
As per our requirement, we are going to go with the virtual machine section as you can see it is already recommended by the developers. This is the download button which will download a 64-bit ISO file. We can download 32-bit but that is more necessary for hard metal machines or if you are going to use it for older devices which do not support 64-bit operating systems yet. After clicking on the download button, we can see we have a window archive which will have the ISO files. For now, we have downloaded the ISO file and it is already present with me. So we can start working on the VMware side of things. Once the ISO file is downloaded, we open up VMware Workstation. Go to File and we create a new virtual machine. In these two options, it is highly recommended to go with the typical setup rather than the custom one. The custom is much more advanced and requires much more information from the user, which is beneficial for developers and people who are well versed with virtualization software. But for 90% of the cases, typical setup will be enough. Here we can select the third option, which will be I will install the operating system later. In some operating systems, we can use the ISO file here directly and VMware will install it for us. But for right now, in the case of Kali Linux, the third option is always the safest. Kali Linux is a Linux distribution. So we can select Linux over here and the version, as you can see here, it have multiple versions such as the multiple kernels. Every distribution has a, a parent distribution. For example, Kali Linux has Debian and there are other distributions which are based or forked from some parent distribution. Kali Linux is based of Debian so we can go with the highest version of Debian, which is the Debian 10.x 64-bit. Go on next. We can write any such name. We can write Kali Linux so that it will be easier to recognize the virtual machine among this list of virtual machine instances. The location can be any location you decide to put. By default, it should be the documents folder, but anywhere you put, it will hold up all the information of the operating system. All the files you download, all the configurations you store, everything will be stored in this particular location that you provide. When we go next, we are asked about the disk capacity. This disk capacity will be all the storage that will be provided to your virtual machine of Kali Linux. Think of your Windows device. If you have a one terabyte of hard drive, you have the entirety of the hard disk to store data on. How much data you give here? you can only store up to that amount of data. Not to mention some amount of capacity will be taken up by the operating system itself to store its programs and applications. For now, we can give around, let's say 15 GB of information. Or if it recommended size for Debian is 20, we can just go ahead at 20. It depends all on the user case. If you are going to use it extensively, you can even go as high as 50 or 60 GB if you have plans to download many more applications and perform multiple different tests. Another option we get over here is storing virtual disks as a single file or storing them into multiple files. As we already know, this virtual machine runs entirely on VMware. Sometimes when transferring these virtual machine instances, let's say from a personal computer to a work computer, we're going to need to copy up the entire folder that we had mentioned before over here. Instead, all virtual machines have a portability feature. Now this portability feature is possible for all scenarios, except it is much easier if the split the virtual disk into multiple files. Now, even if this makes porting virtual machines easier from either system to system or software to software, let's say if you want to switch from VMware to VirtualBox or vice versa, the performance takes a small hit. It's not huge, but it's recommended to go with storing the virtual disk as a single file if you have no purposes of ever moving the virtual machine. Even if you do, it's not a complete stop that it cannot be ported. It's just easier when using multiple files. But in order to get the best performance out of the virtual machine, we can store it as a single file over here. This is a summary of all the changes that we made and all the configurations that have been settled until now. Now at this point of time, we have not provided the .iso file yet, which is the installation file for the Kali Linux that we downloaded from this website. As of right now, we have only configured the settings of the virtual machine. So we can press on finish. 
and we have Kali Linux in the list. Now, to make the changes further, we press on Edit Virtual Machine Settings. The memory is supposed to give the RAM of the virtual machine. So devices with RAM of 8 GB or below that, giving high amount of RAM will cause performance issues and the host system. If the memory has some amount of free storage left, let's say on idle storage, my Windows machine takes about 2 GB. So I have 6 GB of memory to provide. Although if you provide all of the 6 GB, it will be much more difficult for the host system to run everything properly. So for this instance, we can keep it as 2 GB of memory for the virtual machine instance. Similarly, we can use the number of processors and we can customize it according to our liking. Let's say if we want to use one processor, but we want to use two different cores, we can select them as well. Hard disk is pre-set up as the SCSI hard disk and it does not need to be changed for the installation of this operating system at all. CDID DVD. This is where the installation file comes. You can think of the ISO file that we downloaded as a pen drive or a USB thumb drive which is necessary to install an operating system. To provide this, we're going to select use ISO image file. We're going to click on browse. Go and go to downloads and select the ISO file over here. Select open. And you can see it is already loaded up. Next, in the network adapter, it is recommended to use NAT. This helps the virtual machine to draw the internet from the host machine settings. If your host machine is connected to the internet, then the virtual machine is connected as well. There are some other options such as host only or custom segments or LAN segments, but those are not necessary for installation. Rest of them are pretty standard which do not need any extra configuration and can be left as it is. Press OK. And now we can power on this virtual machine. In this screen, we can choose how we want to proceed with the installation. We have a start installer option over here. So we're going to press enter on that. We're going to wait for the things to load from the ISO file. Um, the first step in the installation is choosing the language of the operating system. For this, we can go with English as standard. This is a location. This will be used for setting up the time and some of the internal settings which depend entirely on the location of the user. So for this, we're going to go with India. Configuring the keyboard, it's always recommended to go with the American English first. Many people make a mistake of going with the Indian keyboard if it is possible and it provides a lot of issues later on. So it's always preferred to go with the American English and if later we see some necessity of another keyboard dialect that is required, we can install it later. But for now, we should always stick with American English as a basic. At this point, it's going to load the installation components from the .iso file. It is a big file of 3.6 GB, so it has a lot of components that need to be put into the virtual machine, which can also be used to detect hardware. Once the hardware and the network configuration is done by the ISO file, we want to write a host name for the system. This host name can be anything which is used to recognize this device on a local network or a LAN cable. Let's say if we use the name Kali. Domain name, we can skip it for now. It's not necessary as such for the installation. This is the full name for the user. Let's say we can provide the name as simply learn as a full name. Next, we're going to set up a username. This username is going to be necessary to identify the user from its root accounts and the subsequent below accounts. For now, we can give it as something as simply123. Now we have to choose a password for the user. Now remember, since this is the first user that is being added onto this newly installed operating system, it needs to be a password for the administrator. We can use whichever password we like over here. 
and use the same password below and press on continue. At this point, it's going to detect on the components on which the operating system can be installed. Like here, there are multiple options like the use entire disk, use entire disk and set up LVM, use entire disk and set up encrypted LVM. For newcomers, it is recommended to just use the first one since LVM encryption is something that you can learn afterwards when you're much more hands-on with the Linux operating system. For now, we're going to use the use entire disk guided installation and press on continue. When we set up the virtual machine on VMware, we had set up a disk capacity. There we gave a purpose 20 GB. That is the hard disk which is being discovered here. Even though it is a virtual disk, on VMware it acts as a normal hard disk on which an operating system can be installed. So we select this one and press on continue. Here there is a multiple partition system. All the operating systems that are installed have different components. One is used for the keeping of the applications, one for the files, other for the RAM management and other things. For newcomers, it is always recommended to keep it in one partition. And we're going to select that and press on continue. This is just an overview of the partition it's going to make. As you can see, it has a primary partition of 20.4 GB and a logical partition of 1 GB used for swap memory. Now these kind of naming can be confusing for people who are not well versed with Linux operating systems or in general virtualization. But for now you can go ahead and press on continue as this will be fine. We can press on finish partitioning and write changes to disk and continue. It's just a confirmation page. As you can see it's so that SCSI3 is our virtual hard disk of 20 GB disk capacity. We write the changes to the disk. We press yes and click on continue. At this point the installation has started. Now this installation will take a while depending on the num amount of RAM provided, the processors provided and how quickly the performance of the system is being hampered by the host machine. On quicker systems this will be rather quick while on the smaller ones this will take a while. Since this is going to take some time to install as it is being run on a virtual machine with only 2 GB of RAM. We're going to speed up this part of the video so we don't have to waste any more time just watching the progress bar. Now that our core installation is completed, it's asking us to configure a package manager. The work of a package manager on Linux operating system is similar to the Google Play Store on Android mobile devices and on the App Store for the Apple devices. It's an interface to install external applications which are not installed by default. Let's say for Google Chrome or any other browser which can be used to browse the internet. At this point of time, it's asked us to select a network mirror. We're going to select as yes and move forward with this. Next, it's going to ask us for an HTTP proxy, which we can leave it as blank and press it as continue forward. At this point of time, it's looking for updates to the Kali Linux installation. This will fetch the new builds from the Kali server, so the installation is always updated to the latest version. Now that the package manager is configured, we have the grub bootloader. The grub is used for selecting the operating system while booting up. Its core functionality is to allow the operating system to be loaded correctly without any faults. So at this point of time, if it asks install the grub bootloader to your primary dive, we can select it as yes and press continue. Remember the installation was conducted on dev SDA. So we're going to select installation of the grub loader on the same hard disk that we have configured. We press this one and press continue. So now the grub bootloader is being installed. The grub is highly essential because it, is, it shows the motherboard where to start the operating system from. Even if the operating system is installed correctly and all the files are in correct order, the absence of a bootloader will not be able to launch the OS properly. As you can see, the installation is finally complete. So now we can press on continue 
and it's going to finalize the changes. Now you can see Kali Linux being booted up straight away. It doesn't check for the ISO file anymore since the operating system is now installed onto the virtual hard disk storage that we had configured before. Here we're going to enter our username and password that we had set up before. And we have the Kali Linux system booted up. And this is your home page. We can see the installed applications over here which are being used for penetration testing by multiple security analysts worldwide. All of these come pre-installed with Kali Linux and others can be installed using the APT package manager that we had configured. We can see a full name over here. And with this, our installation of the Kali Linux is complete. In today's world, an organization's most valuable asset is its information or data. This is true for all kinds of businesses, be it public or private. On a daily basis, they all deal with enormous amounts of sensitive information. As a consequence, terrorist groups, hacking teams and cyber thieves often attack them. To ensure their safety and protection, businesses use a variety of security measures and regularly update their index. Organizations must be proactive in this age of digitalization by regularly assessing and updating their security. Every day, hackers discover new methods to breach firewalls. Ethical hackers or white hat hackers provide a fresh perspective on security. They conduct penetration tests to validate security measures. Generally, they will penetrate your networks and give you relevant information about your security posture. Once an organization has this knowledge, it may upgrade its security procedures accordingly. The latest version of Kali Linux comes with more than 600 penetration tools pre-installed. After reviewing every tool that was included in Backtrack, developers have eliminated a great number of tools that either simply did not work or which duplicated other tools that provided the same or similar functionality. Occasionally, when conducting penetration testing or hacking, we must automate our activities since there may be hundreds of conditions and payloads to test and manually examining everything is time consuming. To improve our productivity, we utilize tools that come pre-packaged with Kali Linux. These tools not only save us time, but also accurately capture and process the data. The Kali Linux team is made up of a small group of individuals who are the only ones trusted to commit packages and interact with the repositories, all of which is done using multiple secure protocols. Restricting access of critical code bases to external assets greatly reduces the risk of source contamination. Although penetration tools tend to be written in English, the developers have ensured that Kali includes true multilingual support allowing more users to operate in the native language and locate the tools they need to do for the job. Since ARM-based single board systems like the Raspberry Pi are becoming more and more prevalent and inexpensive, the development team knew that Kali's ARM support would need to be as robust as they could manage with fully working installations. Kali Linux is available on a wide range of ARM devices and has ARM repositories integrated with the mainline distribution so tools for ARM are updated in conjunction with the rest of the distribution tools. Let's begin with some terminal basics on Kali Linux. When most people hear the term Linux, they envision a complex operating system used only by programmers. However, the experience is not as frightening as it appears. Linux is an umbrella term for a collection of free and open source Unix operating systems. There are many variants like Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian. These are distributions which is, will be a more precise term. When using a Linux operating system, you will most likely utilize a shell, which is a command line interface that provides access to the operating system services. The majority of Linux distributions ship with a graphical user interface, also known as GUI, as their primary shell. This is done to facilitate user interaction in the first place. Having said that, a command line interface is suggested 
due to its increased power and effectiveness. By entering the commands into the CLI, tasks that require a multi-step GUI procedure may be completed in a matter of seconds. You can start the terminal by clicking on the prompt icon here on top. Once the terminal is open, we can put up a command. Use another command known as mkdir, which is supposed to stand for make directory and I write nf2, shortage for new folder 2. If I open up the nf, you can see the new folder is created. This is how the pwd command works. Another important command to change directories. It's called the cd command. Let's say right now if I am in nf, I want to create a new file in nf2 folder or something else in the nf2 folder. I have to shift to cd nf2. Now if I write pwd, it will show the present working directory of home simply learn desktop nf and inside that I am in nf2 right now. It is done to navigate through the Linux files and disk directories. It requires either the full path or just the name of the directory. If we have to move a completely different folder on a completely different file, then we can use the entire path like this. For now, cd works. Another few commands is we can write cd dot dot and it will come back one folder. Now the pwd will be just nf and not nf2. Let's say we are in this folder and we want to go a different file. Let's say if we just go for cd home. Simpler. That's it. Right now, these are the folders in our current present working directory. We have the desktop, the documents, downloads, etc. From here, we can again go to the desktop using the same cd command. Cross check the changing of directories and check the files again. And yes, there we go, nf. How do we know this? What are the commands that are used to show the files and folders? That folder is known as the ls command. ls can be used to view the contents of a directory. By default, this command will display the contents of your current working directory. If we add some other parameters, we can find the contents of other directories as well. There are some hidden files as well in Linux which cannot be showed just with ls. For example, if we just go to cd etc which is a configuration folder for Linux. If we write ls now, these are the files that can be seen. If we want to see the hidden files, we'll have to add one more parameter here like ls minus a and as you can see the number of files have increased this time around. There are other things as well that we can see with Linux. ls minus al will show the hidden files along with some of the parameters and some of the permissions that has been provided for each file. As you can see, many of these files have root access. Some of them can write, some of them can read. It differs file to file and the ls-al command is used to check each of these files permission and change them accordingly if needed. The next command that we can look for is the cat command or concatenate. It is one of the most frequently used commands and it is used to list the contents of a file on the output. For example, let's say if I have a file at the desktop. In this nf2 folder, I will create a document, create an empty file, e file. I'll open up the document and I'll write it as hello Kali. I will save this up. Now, to change the directories from etc to nf2, we have already discussed how to use the cd command using just the folder name. Now, if we want to go to the entire directory, we can write cd home. As you can see, it is already prompting us to complete the name of the directory. At this point, we just have to press tab and it completes it for us. Sir. Next, we already know we have to enter the desktop, nf and nf2. And this brings us to the current working directory. Here, if we press ls, we can find a file over here. Now, as discussed for the concatenate, it is used to show the contents of a file. So right now, if we press cat, which stands for concatenate, e file. 
as you can see we have written hello Kali in the text file and we can see the output right now. We can also use it to create new files. For example, if we write cat any file name such as efile2. Here we can write anything hello Kali again. Once we press Ctrl C here, we can check e file 2 and we have hello Kali again printed over here. We can see the same using the concatenate command as well. If I press ls, you can see we have two files here and I can go with cat e file 2 and I have hello Kali again. This is how the concatenate command works. Apart from this, it can be used to copy. There is a different command like called cp which is used to copy the files from one place to another. Mind you this is not moving, this is only going to copy the command. For example, currently our pwd which is the present fucking directory is in the nf2 folder as you can see over here. Let's copy the e file 2 to the nf folder. We can write cp e file 2 and give the path of the nf folder which will be home simply learn text talk and nf now if i press ls i'll find both the files in nf2 since i copied to go back to the nf folder again we can again use the same command of no no uh, we can again use the home simply learn text talk and just nf no nf2 this time just nf as you can see, this will change back our present working directory. Now, when we press ls, we will find the e file to file and the nf2 folder. And we can confirm this using the GUI as well. This is the nf folder, and you can see the nf2 folder and the e file to document. If I write cat e file to cat e file to, we can see the contents of the file. Now, this can be done using moving as well. For example, if I go to cd nf2, which is the inside folder, it has both the document files like e file and e file2. Let's say I want to move the e file completely from nf2 to nf1. Instead of writing cp, the command I'm going to use is mv. mv e file and again give the path of the folder into which I have to copy, which will be again home simply learn. desktop and nf as you can see the contents of the nf2 have appeared here and e file has been moved from nf2 to nf this is the nf2 and we don't find e file here anymore if we press cd dot dot and we go back to nf ls right now and we can find both the files e file that we moved and e file 2 that we copied from the nf2 folder so this is how copying and moving will work using the terminal. Now this is just a simple one line statement that might take a couple of clicks when using GUI. This is why the command line interface is considered to be much more streamlined for Linux operating systems. Another very important com command for Linux operating system is the sudo command. sudo is short for super user do. The command enables you to perform tasks that require administrative or root permissions. You can think of it as how we run programs as administrator on Windows systems. It is not advisable to use this command for daily use because it might be easy for an error to occur and the permissions of root are very intricate. So new beginners are advised to use the sudo command only when absolutely necessary. For example, sudo su. With this command, I am giving this terminal a root permission. This su stands for this user. At this point, it's going to ask for my admin password. Once I enter my password, and I now have root access. Note how the password that I entered did not show up here. This is a security measure to prevent people from snooping on your root password, which is the end game of all this operating system. As you also can see, the symbol changed. If the dollar symbol is showing, it's source as a standard user. When you switch to root, you can easily see a hash symbol. This opens up a separate shell inside this terminal command. For example, 
we can exit out of the root user to the standard user using the command exit. And once again, we have the dollar sign and the root has vanished over here. There are some commands that will only work with administrative access. For example, when updating the Kali Linux system, we have to use apt update. As you can see, it says problem unlinking the file because permission denied. Now let's try this using sudo, sudo apt update. As you can see, it is updating the package repositories, which work as the software installed on the system. This can be done using either writing the sudo command every time we want to perform a root access, or we can just write sudo su once and write apt update alone. The fetching is complete over here. For the second example, let's say I just write sudo su and this time it's not going to ask me the password because at this current terminal process, I've already provided the root password once and it is in memory right now. Now, when we used to update the system, we had to write sudo apt update. That was because we were running it as a standard user. Now we are running it as a root user. So all we have to write is apt update and it's going to continue its work. There you go. Another command that can be useful is the ping command. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's going to be checking the internet connectivity. It can be used to check internet connectivity or you can see if the, there is a local server on your system which needs to be pinged. Then you can check that. For example, if you have to write ping and we can use either IP address or domain. Let's say if you want to check that if we can access google.com using this Kali Linux installation or not. We can write ping google.com. And you can see it shows the bytes being sent and received and how much time it took to take up the request. This can be done for local systems as well. For example, this installation of Kali Linux is being run on a virtual machine. Once this machine is running, I still have my uh, host machine running over here. The IP address of which is 192.168.29.179. If I try to ping this from here, As you can see, the time to complete the request is drastically low compared to a website on the internet, considering this is on the local network. This is how the ping command is worked and it can show you what kind of packages are transmitted, how many are received, if there was any kind of packet loss between the connection window and other details. A very important command when working with the terminal for a long duration is the history command. Pretty self-explanatory, there are so many commands that are being run Sometimes people forget what was the change they did or what was the directory name they put. A history command helps to recover some of the commands that you have written. It doesn't go all the way back, but it takes up many commands that were inputted in the last few processes. This is how the history command works. These are some of the most commonly used terminal commands. If you want to learn more about this terminal and every other feature of this, please let us know in the comment section and we will try to make an in-depth tutorial, especially if you could repeat. If you want to learn more about the terminal, please let us know in the comment section and we will try to make an in-depth tutorial specifically for terminal commands on Linux. Moving on, we learn how to configure proxy chains on our system. Proxying refers to the technique of bouncing your internet traffic through multiple machines to hide the identity of the original machine. It is a good tool that hackers use to accomplish this goal is proxy chains. Essentially, you can use proxy chains to run any program to a proxy server. This will allow you to access internet from behind a restrictive firewall which hides your IP address. Proxy chains even allows you to use multiple proxies at once by chaining them together. One of the most important reasons that proxy chains is used in a security context is that it's easy to evade detection. Attackers often use proxies to hide their true identities while executing an attack. And when multiple proxies are chained together, it becomes harder and harder for a forensic professional to trace the traffic back to the original machine. When these proxies are located across countries, investigators would have to obtain warranties in the local jurisdictions where every proxy is located. To, to see how proxy chain works, 
Let's open Firefox first and check our current IP address. Right, Firefox and there we go. As we can see, Firefox is now open. Let's check our current IP address right now. If we go to an address called myip.com and you can see it easily detects our country is in India and this is a public IP address. Now, if we move to the terminal again, here we can now write proxy chains minus h. What this minus h does is it finds a help it uh, it stands for the help file this is for help file what we found out using this is proxy chains has a config file here etc proxy chains 4.conf this is the config file found using this config file we can customize how our proxy chain should work if we want to open that we have to use it in a text editor on windows we have notepad and other things like that, Microsoft Word to edit documents. On Linux, we have a tool called Nano. To access the Nano, we use the command Nano and give the path of the file that we want to check. As of right now, the proxy chains config file is located over here. So we're going to follow the path there. Chains 4.conf. And here we go. We see the config file. There are three basic types of proxy chaining here. We have a strict chain where all the proxy in the list will be used and they will be chained in order. We have a random chain where each connection made through proxy chains will be done by a random combo of proxies in the proxy list. And you have a dynamic chain. It's the same as strict chain but dead proxies are excluded from the chain. And here we can set up whichever type we want. To enable or disable a particular type, we use the hash symbol here. As you can see right now, all the lines have a hashtag symbol at the front, except this one, a dynamic chain. This is the current one being used. Let's say if I want to use a strict chain method, so I can add a hash value here and remove the hash here. At one point of time, any one of these three, four types should be enabled. Let's go for the dynam um, dynamic chain. We can disable this strict chain by putting the hashtag in front and removing the dynamic chain. As you can see below, we have few commands to how to handle the nano text editor. This symbol is known as the control button on your keyboard. Now if we want to write out, which is synonymous to saving the file, supposed to go with control O. So if I press control O on my keyboard, it says file name to write. And we have to press enter here since we want to overwrite the proxy chains 4.conf file. We don't want to create a new file over here. So just press enter and we get a permission denied. This permission denied we're getting is because we have opened this using a standard user. ETC is a system folder. To be able to use make some changes, we have to use it using a sudo command. To exit this nano, we have to use the control X command. We use control X, we're going to clear and this time we're going to use the sudo command sudo nano etc proxy chains 4.conf and we have the same file open up again. Now this time if we want to make a change, let's say we're going to add a strict chain instead of a dynamic chain, we remove the hashtag from strict. We're going to use control O for the save file option. We're going to press enter and it says wrote 160 lines. Again, if you want to reverse this change, we put the hashtag over here, enable dynamic chain. We press control O, press enter and it says wrote 160 lines. Now we can exit straight away using the control X format. Right now we have not provided any file or a proxy chain. We can have proxy IP addresses from the internet, but we have to make sure that they are safe and they don't snoop on our data. 
when there is no proxy chains being provided personally it going to, it's going to use the tor network but for that we have to start tor tor is a service in linux to know more about the store we can write sudo systemctl which is used to know the status of services on the linux operating system and status of tor uh systemctl sorry uh as instead of stl it should be systemctl status tor as you can see it is a tor service anonymizing overlay network for tcp connections and it's currently inactive now to start this up we have to write sudo systemctl start tor now if we repeat the same sudo systemctl status tor as you can see it's active now you can see the green logo over here okay to integrate the firefox and the browser we can use the proxy chains command directly over here we can write proxy chains we can use firefox to launch our web browser and let's say if we want to visit google.com we press enter and the firefox window is launched and it should open up google.com next and there we go if we go to myip.com once again as you can see we have a different ip address and the country is a known as well so this is how we can use proxy chains to anonymize uh, uh, internet usage when using kali linux next on our agenda is the ability to scan networks using nmap at its core nmap is a network scanning tool that uses ip packets to identify all the devices connected to a network you can learn more about nmap using the help file as you can see these are some of the parameters that can be used when scanning ports of a system you can see the version and the url of the web of the service over here the primary uses of nmap can be broken into three core processes first the program gives you detailed information on every ip active on your network and then each ip can then be scanned secondly it can also be used to providing a lot of live hosts and open ports as well as identifying the os of every connected device thirdly nmap has also become a valuable tool for users looking to protect personal and business websites using nmap to scan your own web server particularly if you are hosting your website from home is essentially simulating the process that a hacker would use to attack your site attacking your own site in this way is a powerful way of identifying security vulnerabilities as we already discussed the host windows 10 machine on the system has an ip address a 192.168.29.179 if you want to test the os scan of the system we're going to first get the root permission over here we use the sudo command and now we are a root user we're going to launch the command nmap minus o which is supposed to be an os detection scan the ip address we can use of the host system 192.168.29.179 in a legitimate penetration testing scenario we can use the ip address of the vulnerable device over here we are going to let it scan for a while and it's going to give us some guesses on what can the os be as you can see the scan is done and it has shown some of the ports that are open you can see the msrpc port open at the https443 port open which is used to connect to the internet and it has some aggressive os guesses as well for example it thinks there's a 90% 94% chance that it's going to be a microsoft windows xp service pack 3 that's partly because a lot of the windows xp update packages are still prevalent on windows now that the os detection is confirmed there are multiple more details that we can gather from nmap let's go with the nmap minus a command which is supposed to capture as much data as possible there is also a speed setting it can can call it a speed setting or a control setting of the minus t minus t ranges from t0 to t1 to t2 all the way up to t5 this basically determines how aggressively the victim is being scanned if you scan 
slowly it will take more time to provide the results but it will also give a less chance for the intrusion detection system on the vulnerable machine firewall to detect that someone is trying to penetrate the network for now if we want to go with somewhat of a high speed we can go with the t4 and provide the same ip address of the local machine i am trying to attack it's going to take a little bit of time since it's trying to capture a lot of information As you can see the results are now here. It, it launched a scan and took a few top ports that are most likely vulnerable from a Windows XP perspective and it showed a few ports over here. It has not shown 991 filtered ports which could not be attacked anyway since they were closed for outside access. It shows a few fingerprint settings like the connection policies and the mm, port details. It shows an HTTP options some other intricate details that can be used when you attacking its servers. It shows a VMware version that it's running and some few other ports over here. Apart from that, we also have the aggressive OS guesses over here, just like we did with the minus O. And you can see this time, it is showing Windows 7 as 98%. No exact OS matches since uh, if there was any exact OS matches, we could have seen a 100% chances over here. The, this is a trace route. A trace route will be the time and the path a connection request takes from the source to the destination. For example, this request went from 192.168.72.2 to a destination address. Since this is a local machine, it took only a single step. On multiple occasions, if you're trying to access a remote system, it's going to be a number of trace routes when it jumps from firewall to firewall and router to router. This is how we can use Nmap to find information about a system and find some vulnerable ports we can access. Moving on, we have a tutorial on how to use Wireshark to sniff network traffic. To start using Wireshark, we're going to have to we open the application first. Now during installation of Wireshark there is an option to enable if non-root users can be able to capture traffic or not. In my installation I have disabled that so I will be launching Wireshark when using the root user itself. Also to capture data we need an external Wi-Fi adapter. You can see it over here in the VM tab removable devices RELINK A02.1 and WLAN. This is an external Wi-Fi adapter which is inserted into my USB system. You can see it over here. If I write IWConfig, this is the one, WLAN 0. This is absolutely necessary because we need to have a monitor mode required. We won't need it for sniffing data on Wireshark right now, but it's going to be necessary later on in this tutorial as well, as we will see. For now, we can just start up Wireshark by writing its name on the command line and it should start the program. Here we go. Here, it's going to check which of the adapters we want to use. For example, right now the ETH0, which is supposed to stand for Ethernet 0 port, you can see data is being transmitted up and down. We're going to select ETH0. and we have started capturing data. You can see the uh, data request from the source to destination from the time and the which protocol it is following. Everything we can see and we can see the IPv4 flags here as well. As you can see over here. To capture internet traffic, we can try running Firefox. We just write wikipedia.com and you can see the number of requests increasing. Okay, this is spelling mistake. Wikipedia. Here, yeah. you can see the application data of all these requests going up. And they're connected to a destination server of 102.166.224. 
Now, if we, even if we check the transmission control protocol flags over here and so many more things, we cannot find anything beneficial. As you can see, the information over here is gibberish, which is supposed to be since it's supposed to be encrypted. Now, this is possible due to this being an HTTPS website. Hence, you can see the lock symbol over here and connection is supposed to be secure. Now, what about HTTP ports? We have seen a many people recommend to not visit HTTP ports. Repeat. We have seen many people recommend to not visit HTTP websites and even if we have to visit, to not provide any critical information. For example, let's go to a random HTTP page over here. As you can see, this is saying connection is not secure. And this is an HTTP, HTTP page and not HTTPS. Now, let's check for some of the information that is passing through this. This is a login form. Let's say I have a legitimate account over here. If I write my account name and my password is supposed to be password1234. I press login and uh, the password does not match because I do not have an account over here. But let's say I did and I was logged in as expected. We can go to Wireshark. We can use filters over here. Now all the requests that I'm sending, it's a TCP request. So I can write a filter containing TCP contains whatever string if it is being passed. Let's say for the end username, I write my account name. So I can just write my account name over here and press enter to find a request over here. Now, as you can see, there are many flags over here. If we go to the HTML form URL encoded and open up some of its flags, as you can see, I can see my account name and simply learn password over here. This is the same details that I input on the website. Let's say I did have a legitimate account on this website. I would have logged in with no problems, but anyone who would be using Wireshark to sniff on the data can easily get my credentials from here. This is why it's recommended to not provide any information on HTTP pages. The security is not up to the mark and always look for the lock symbol when visiting any website or making any internet transactions or providing any information. This is how we can use Wireshark to detect transmission and sniff packet data that is being transferred through the network adapter. Next, we have to learn about what is Metasploit. The Metasploit project is a computer security project that provides information about security vulnerabilities and aids in penetration testing and IDS development. We can open up the terminal here. We're going to allow root access. And to open up Metasploit, the keyword is MSF console. It's going to take a little bit of time to start it up. Now the Metasploit console has been loaded. From here, we can decide what type of attack we want to launch and what kind of exploits we can launch against vulnerable targets. For example, like we had already discussed, I'm running this virtual machine on a Windows 10 host machine. So if I open the command prompt for my Windows 10 over here, if I need to check the IP address once, I go with IP config. Here, you can see the IP address of this local machine. Moving on, if we have to attack that machine, let's say we want to see what kind of exploits are going to work over there. Now we already know that Windows has some common vulnerabilities. One of those vulnerabilities is the HTA server vulnerability. HTA is supposed to be a HTML application, but when passed the right payload, it can be used to open a backdoor into a system. To start off with the Metasploit and accessing such applications, we're going to use the command use exploit and the name of the reverse HTA server is this Windows MISC for miscellaneous HTA server. As you can see, it already found this one. All right. Now, there are some options that we need to set for this exploit to go through. 
For example, you can see some of the options over here. There is a payload. The payload is supposed to be the malicious file that we are going to send on the HTML application, which allows us to give the backdoor. For example, right now the payload, which is the malicious file, is a Windows Meterpreter reverse TCP. Completely understandable. Now, let's set the L host. L host and R host and SRV host should be the one where we are going to launch the attack from. For example, if we launched another tab of this console and we just press ifconfig. The IP address is 192.168.72.130. So we're going to set the L host as 192.168.72.130. And we're going to do the same thing with SRV host. We're going to set a port where we need to capture the backdoor access. Next, the payload has already been set. This payload will launch a backdoor and give us Meterpreter access to the system. Meterpreter is can be considered as an upgrade of a normal command prompt shell. We will look into it once we get the access in the first place. Now that we have set the commands, we can press on exploit and press enter. Now, you can see we have a URL over here. We're going to copy this URL. Once the URL is copied, we take it into the browser and paste it. This will ask us to download this file. Now, as per browser security settings, this file should be blocked by default. We can decide to keep it and with the correct formulation of this malicious package, even the website browser antivirus softwares will not be able to detect good payloads. We're going to save this file and we're going to open it. Publisher could not be verified if we press run and we go back to our meter peter access over here you can see it has already captured a url of an ht server and it is writing delivering payload just have to wait for a few seconds till the payload is delivered it has sent this much amount of data meter peter session one is opened and we should get the access soon there we go now to understand where is the session set we can write sessions minus i as you can see it has a meter pit over here we're going to write sessions minus i the session id is one so we're going to write one and we have the meter pit access now to get a fair idea of the system we're going to write this info and it's going to the computer name the os architecture all these things we can write the help command to see what are the things that we can get out of the system. We can take screenshots, we can control the webcam and start a video chat. We can take a lot of things over here. There are other commands as well where we can change the file directory like the cat command, cd command. There are so many things that work in the normal CMD which we can run on the meter peter as well. Now if you want to access this command prompt of the system directly, we can go with this. We have to write shell and there we go we are in the downloads folder right now to see if this is the same computer or not we're going to write ipconfig as you can see it is our victim machine with 192.168.29.171 we can just press exit and we're back with the meterpreter access this is how we can use meterpreter and metasploit to gain access to a windows 10 machine next Let's take a look at how we can get root access from a Windows 10 system. We just learned how we can get a meter peter access from a system. We can background this meter peter session by writing background and pressing enter. We can still we can still see the sessions sessions minus i. It's still present over here. Now these kind of access are not administrative access. These are the kind of backdoors that can be created for standard users. But to get a complete access of a system, including the program files, the Windows documents, we need to have root access or administrative access. 
do that we're going to use another exploit reminder that the meter meter session of the standard axis is already present and we're not messing with it right now we're going to set up another session albeit with the same machine that exploit name is use exploit windows local bypass uac event viewer and there we go now if we check the options that we can put in the system we have to choose an exploit target we need to put a session as well let's say we going to use the session 1 This is the session that has the meter meter access with the standard user. It doesn't have the system user. We're going to write set session one, and we're going to run exploit. Run a few commands, and it opened a second meter meter session. As you can see, it is the session two. If I write sys info, you can still see I'm not the system user right now. I'm still just a normal user how can we check that if you go to shell i can still see see user can be downloads all these things if i press exit go back to the meter meter there is a command on meter meter get system it attempts to elevate your privilege to that of the local system which basically means you get promoted into root access so if we write get system and due to pipe impersonation we now have the system root access as you can see now it has become x64 and we are the admin users now if i go to shell i can easily go back windows and i can easily access these ones this kind of control over the windows folders and the program files folders these kind of things are not possible if you are not an admin access or the command prompt has not been run with admin permissions this is how we can use privilege escalation to get into an admin access system we use the second exploit which was the bypass us event viewer exploit and essentially used it with the first session as you can read here windows escalation usc protection bypass it was first disclosed on 2016 but it still works on some systems so let's start out by learning what parrot security is parrot os is a debian based linux distribution with an emphasis on security privacy and development it is built on debian's testing branch and uses a custom hardened linux kernel while being founded in 2013 Parrot security contains several hundred tools targeted towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics and reverse engineering. It has become a multi-platform solution accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. It features a distinct forensics mode that does not mount any of the system hard disks or partitions and has no influence on the host system. making it more stealthy than regular mode this mode is used on the host system when there is a need for executing forensic procedures in software development a rolling release is a paradigm in which software upgrades are rolled out constantly rather than in batches of versions this ensures that the software is constantly up to date a rolling release distribution such as parrot security os follows the same concept providing the most recent linux kernel and software versions as they become available on the market with a basic introduction to the operating system out of the way let us have a look at the bare minimum system requirements necessary to be able to run this operating system first up we got a cpu requirement which states that a 1 gigahertz dual core cpu is the absolute minimum in order to use parrot os while multiple core systems will provide more optimum performance a small beginner has been included A very distinct thing to be noted is that the operating system can be installed on all variants of chipsets, be it 32-bit, 64-bit, and the newly popular ARM portfolio of devices. Unlike Kali Linux, which requires some amount of graphical acceleration needed to display the operating system correctly, Parrot OS has no such requirements and can be used with the leanest of machines. Taking into account the RAM issue, 
A minimum of 256 MB to 512 MB free RAM provides the optimum usage scenarios. Even when the OS is installed on a hard drive storage media, it should theoretically occupy around 8 GB of information which may extend up to 16 GB depending on the tools being installed out of the box. When it comes to booting options, we have the option of going with the legacy BIOS settings or with the more modern UEFI settings. These are just some of the requirements for the installation of Parrot Security OS. To understand this process more vividly and to learn how visualization can help install an OS in our existing computer, please follow the link to a Parrot Security installation video linked right above. Let's understand what some of the things that make Parrot Security unique among all the other penetration testing operating systems. Along with all the giant catalog of scripts, Parrot Security has its own custom hardened Linux kernel which has been modified explicitly to provide as much security and resistance to hackers as possible as a first line of defense. The configurations in the operating system act as a second gateway, taking care of malicious requests and dropping them off. This is particularly beneficial since should there be a scenario where the latest Linux kernel is causing some particular issue, the Parrot OS development team will most likely iron it out first before passing it on as an update. If the custom hardened kernel wasn't reasoning enough, Parrot security developers managed to install more hacking tools and scripts to ensure a smooth transition for the Gali Linux users. All the tools you found in Kali are present in Parrot OS and then a few extra ones for good measure. And this has been achieved while keeping roughly the same size of the installation file between both operating systems. However, it's not all productivity points for Parrot OS. They provide a choice between two different desktop environments, the made desktop which comes pre-installed by default and KDE. For those unfamiliar with Linux terminology, you can think of desktop environments as the main UI for a Linux system. Being highly modular in nature, one can use Kali Linux or Parrot OS while adding another desktop environment which they find appealing. While Kali has only a single option, Parrot OS has managed to provide two optimized builds with made desktop and KDE desktop ready-made on the website. One of the primary advantages of Parrot OS over Kali is that it's relatively lightweight. This implies that it takes significantly less disk space and computing power to function properly with as little as 320 MB of RAM required. In reality, Parrot OS is also designed to operate successfully off a USB stick, but Kali Linux does not work well from a USB stick and is generally installed in a virtual machine. Parrot OS can be seen as more of a niche distribution if you're searching for something lighter than Kali Linux. There are multiple ways to go about with this installation. Many people prefer to install it directly onto a hard disk where the Parrot Security OS will overwrite whichever data the hard disk already has. Now this is beneficial if you want to preserve your data for the long term, but this might pose some trouble to people who do not have a spare hard disk or do not want to lose their current installation of Windows operating system. Another way to use Parrot Security is by using the live boot but whatever changes you make to the live boot operating system, those changes are removed the moment we restart or shut down the system. A very good common ground between both these installations is virtualization. Using virtualization software like VMware or VirtualBox, we can install Parrot security on our systems while simultaneously saving our data and having the convenience of a host machine such as a Windows operating system in case things go wrong. To start the installation, we first need to get an ISO file for the Parrot Security Operating System. This can be found on the current website parrotsec.org. Once we enter the website, move into the download section and select the Get Security Edition over here. Parrot Security OS has multiple desktop environments to you to choose from. This desktop environment serves as a different user interface for the user. For example, right now we have the MADE desktop and the KDE desktop. As you can see from the screenshots, both of these look quite different while having a similar look and feel to them. For our example, let's go with the MADE desktop. We have two options, either we can go with the direct download or we can get the torrent file. For this example, if we press on the download button and our download will start. I have already downloaded this file, but the ISO file provided over here will serve as an installation. 
it will have around 4.5 GB of space. It will be used to install this operating system in VMware. Once the file is downloaded, we can close this and open VMware Workstation. VMware can also be used as a player version or the workstation version. If you have much more familiarity with using VirtualBox for virtualization application, we can use that as well. Once the VMware is open, we click on File and select a new virtual machine. For the first time installation, we're going to go with the typical and recommended installation procedure instead of an advanced one. If you have already installed multiple virtual machine OSs, going with the advanced option will give you much more control over the hardware customization. But for now, we're going to stick with the typical option. Moving on, it will ask us for a source to where to install the operating system from. Since we're going to use a live ISO first, we're going to select the third option, which will be I will install the operating system later and press next. As we already know, Parrot security is a Debian derivative. So when selecting the guest operating system type, we're going to go with Linux. And in the selection, we're going to choose whichever the highest version of Debian is along with a 64-bit OS. We're going to click on next. We're going to name our virtual machine, let's say, Parrot Security OS. We're going to select the location where we want to save the virtual machine. This will have all the hard disks of the operating system installation. We're going to click on next. For the disk size, we're going to specify how much of the current memory are we going to allocate. This is the hard disk memory of the operating system installation. Whatever changes we make in the operating system, whatever applications we install on the virtual instance will all be stored in this amount of memory. While it is recommended to go with at least 15 GB of storage, we can go as high as possible and we're going to select the recommended 20 GB as written. When given the choice of storing the virtual disk as a single or multiple files, many people want to keep their virtual instance in a way so that it helps them stay portable. People change systems and sometimes they want to swap their instances between the work and their personal computer. If there is no portability in mind, storing the virtual disk as a single file gives the best performance and should be the recommended go-to when installing for the first time. We click on next here and it's going to give us a summary of the settings we have already settled till now. We're going to press on finish and there we go. We have our installation first step completed. Here on out, we're going to click on edit virtual machine settings. Here we're going to have a look at some of the requirements that the Parrot Security OS will need. It is known to be a memory lightweight operating system, but just to have the most optimum performance, we're going to provide around 2 GB of RAM from our host system, which is a Windows 10 machine. When it comes to the processors, I'm going to increase it to 2 and the number of cores to 2 as well. So giving out a total 4 processor cores to the operating system. Now this depends on what are your computer rig and how much resources you can justify. So these need to be customized according to the system at hand. Hard disk size has already been set at 20 GB and the rest of them are pretty standard and we can go on. One thing that we need to make sure is selecting the CD DVD IDE. Here we have to use our ISO image file over here. Previously, it should be use physical drive and at auto detect. We're going to use a use ISO image file over here. We're going to click on browse. We're going to go to where we have downloaded the ISO file, which is over here and select it. Press OK here. And we can now power on this virtual machine. At this point of time, there are two options. We can go with the try install option using the graphical user interface or we can go using the terminal mode. To get a better user experience, we're going to go with the try install mode specifically. Press enter and it's going to start the live boot ISO. Meanwhile, VMware has a prompt over here where it will try to install some VMware tools on it. While this is not mandatory, it is much more recommended to install these tools so that you can get some additional features like drag and drop with the host system and many more things. For now, we are going to close this prompt.
as you can see this is the live boot iso of the parrot security operating system currently it's running the mate desktop as we have downloaded in the website the live boot iso is necessary to get a good feel of the operating system there are many good Linux distros that have this live boot option so that you can give a try of the operating system before installing it permanently. Once you are into the live boot, we can start up with the installation using the shortcut. As you can see, install Parrot. I'm going to double click it. And this is a Calamaris installer. Choose your language as American English and press next. You can select your time zone according to your location. And we can go next. At this point of time, you have to choose the correct keyboard. Now, what many people go get confused is choosing their own language keyboard. What people must keep in mind is what keyboard the laptop provides. Most of the systems that come pre-built provide the English US keyboard. So whatever keyboard you choose, make sure to type here and test that all the buttons, including the superscript and the subscript buttons are working correctly before moving forward with this step. Once you've settled on the keyboard that you need to install, you can go ahead. Here it will ask you to select storage device and the only option you're going to get is the amount of hard disk storage you have given in the virtual machine settings. We have already provided 20 GB of storage. We are going to choose that and we are going to erase this disk. Manual partitioning can be useful when you are going to install Parrot security on an operating system or on a hard disk where it is already including a Windows OS. For now, we are going to select erase disk and press next. We are going to give our full name. Let it be simply learn. You can give the name of the computer and this is the username which we will use to log in. This is your root password that we are going to give over here. The root password of this Kali Linux will act as the administrative access and it will be necessary for making changes to the system or installing and updating software. Enter the password and repeat it over here. You have the option to log in automatically without asking for the password, but for security purposes, it is recommended to keep this disabled. Click on next. This is another summary of the installation that we are going to move forward with. Have a look that whatever changes we have made is according to your requirements. And once everything is checked, we can press on install. Click on install now. And we're going to let it complete the work. As you can see, the installation of Parrot security is now completed. We're going to make sure that we have the restart now button over here disabled. I'm going to click on done. We're going to shut down this live boot ISO. We're going to click on menu. Turn off the device and shut down. We're not restarting straight away because if you remember correctly, in the virtual machine instance settings, we had given it an ISO file. Please remove the live medium and press enter to continue. We can just press enter to continue and it's going to shut down. Now, to move on, we're going to click on Edit Virtual Machine Settings. We're going to CD, DVD, and we're going to use Physical Drive now. We're going to remove it from the ISO image file because the installation has already been completed and we don't want to use the same ISO file again and again. By using Physical Drive over here, it's going to detect the 20 GB hard disk that we have already provided and installation is done on it. We're going to press OK. And we're going to power on this virtual machine for testing. Make sure this you click ES over here. This is the grub menu. 
At this, we get different choices, for example, which NVIDIA drivers off or with some other advanced options. More often than not, we're going to choose the first option and press enter. If you remember clearly, we did not get the option of try install or a terminal run just like we did in the live boot ISO. Since this is running straight from the 20 GB hard drive storage, it's going to start the OS directly. Now with the login screen, you can see our username over here as we provided in the installation. We're going to enter our root password. And press enter. And this is our currently working desktop of the Parrot Security Operating System. We can open the terminal over here. And we're going to try a root password and installation. To install any software, we're going to use the keyword sudo apt install and neofetch. We're going to use the root password that we used to log in. We're going to press Y for yes. This is just an additional step that we're doing to check that the installation is done correctly with the correct amount of hardware requirements that we had provided. Now that we have installed NeoFetch, we can write the command NeoFetch and this is going to give us some information about our installation. You can see the OS name as Parrot OS 4.11 is running on a VMware host, so the kernel versions and some of the other information like the number of packages installed, the current shell version, resolution of the VMware instance that we are running, the desktop environment which is made as we had downloaded once and some other things. You can see the memory is supposed to be 1951 megabytes which is supposed to equal around 2 GB of RAM usage that we had provided. Let us compare both these operating systems directly with respect to their hardware specifications and usability. In the end, we can decide on what distribution is fit for each type of user. For our first point of comparison, let's take a look at the RAM required. For optimum performance of the operating system, which is highly essential when trying to crack hashes or something of similar nature, RAM usage is a very important facet. While Kali Linux demands at least 1 GB of RAM, Parrot Security can operate optimally with a minimum of 320 MB of RAM. For correctly displaying graphical elements, Kali Linux requires GPU-based acceleration. While this is not the case with Parrot Security OS, which doesn't require any graphical acceleration needed from the user side. Once these operating systems are installed on VMware using their live boot ISOs, they take up a minimum amount of hard disk storage. Both of these operating systems have a recommended disk storage of minimum of 20 GB in Kali Linux and a minimum of 15 GB in Parrot Security so they can install all the tools necessary in the ISO file. When it comes to the category and the selection of tools, Kali Linux has always been the first in securing every single tool available for hackers in the penetration testing industry. Parrot Security, on the other hand, has managed to take it up a notch. While specializing in wireless pen testing, Parrot Security makes it a point that all the tools that Kali Linux provides has been included in the ISO, while simultaneously adding some extra tools that many users will have to install from third-party sources in Kali Linux. Being a decade-old penetration testing distribution, Kali Linux has formed up a very big community with strong support signature. Parrot Security, on the other hand, is still growing and it is garnering much more interest among veteran penetration testers and ethical hackers. A primary drawback of Kali Linux is the extensive hardware requirement. To perform optimally, it requires higher memory than Parrot Security. It also needs graphical acceleration while demanding more virtual hard disk storage. Parrot Security, on the other hand, 
was initially designed to run off a USB drive directly, thereby requiring very minimal requirements from a hardware perspective like just 320 MB of RAM and no graphical acceleration needed. This means parrot security is much more feasible for people who are not able to devote massive resources to either their virtual machine or on their laptop hard disk directly. With the comparison done between both of these operating systems, let's take a look at the type of users both of these are catered to. One can go with Kali Linux if they want the extensive community support offered by its users, if they want to go with a trusted development team that have been working on this distribution since many years, if they have a powerful system which can run Kali Linux optimally without having to bottleneck performance, and if they are comfortable with a semi-professional environment which may or may not be very useful for new beginners. One can decide to go with Parrot Security if they want to go with a very lightweight and lean distribution that can run pretty much on all systems. It also has a lot of tools pre-installed and some of them are not even present on Kali Linux. It is much more suitable for underpowered rigs where users do not have a lot of hardware resources to provide to the operating system and thereby it is much more feasible for people with underpowered laptops or no graphical acceleration. Compared to Kali Linux, Parrot Security's desktop environment is also relatively easier to use for new beginners. For people who are just getting into ethical hacking, Parrot Security does a relatively better job of introducing them to the operating system and to the various tools without having to dump them into the entire intricacies. In recent years, the cost of data breaches has steadily risen. The additional vulnerabilities that occur due to the move to a remote workforce dramatically enhance the chances for cyber attacks and introduce several weak points for hackers to exploit. Additionally, automated hacking assaults and the capacity to exchange bitcoins via ransomware have increased the cost of cybercrime in general. Companies' workforces have transitioned to full-time work-from-home models, which gives rise to new attack surfaces. Threat actors target the people who are most vulnerable by taking advantage of current events and shifting situations. To better understand this growth in digital crime, let us go through a few statistics. 2020 brought with it a slew of new problems for both businesses and consumers. In the midst of a worldwide epidemic, forest fires, and political instability, it's easy to overlook a serious, albeit less physical threat. It set a record for data loss due to cyber attacks as well as the sheer volume of attacks. 2020 is already outpacing its predecessor. The graph below denotes the percentage of companies that fell victim to at least one cyber attack in the respective year. With the numbers growing steadily, we are yet to see the true crux of this digital revolution. In situations like these, penetration testing has been a gift for organizations worldwide. While security testing cannot guarantee a 100% solution, it can go a long way in securing those critical data from falling into the wrong hands. Hey everyone, this is Bhavab from Simple Learn. Next, we know about the benefits of penetration testing and how they help organizations save money in the long run. Moving on, we familiarize ourselves with the different types of penetration testing or ethical hacking, with each serving a different category of personnel. In the next section, we read about the five distinct phases in every ethical hacking campaign and how they help clear up the extensive report at the end of every penetration testing session. Finally, we have a live demonstration on how we can check for vulnerabilities and the ways hackers can break into devices without adequate security measures in place. Let's start by learning about penetration testing in general. Organizations can define penetration testing based on the objectives of the test. All networks, applications, devices, and physical security components are included. It imitates the behavior of harmful individuals or the hackers. Experienced cybersecurity specialists use penetration testing to strengthen a company's security posture and eliminate any weaknesses that leave it vulnerable to attacks. Penetration testing, when done correctly, goes beyond simply preventing thieves from gaining unauthorized access to a company's systems. It generates realistic scenarios that demonstrate how well a company's present defenses might perform in the face of a full-scale cyber assault. The simulation aids in the discovery of the sites of exploitation and the testing of IT breach security. Businesses may acquire professional unbiased third-party input on the security procedures by conducting frequent penetration testing. 
pen testing while relatively time consuming and costly can aid in the prevention of highly destructive and expensive breaches. A white hat hacker employs hacking talents to find security flaws in hardware, software or networks. On the other hand, white hat hackers follow the rule of law when it comes to hacking instead of black hat hackers. They assist firms in conducting penetration tests to analyze their security index and make the necessary improvements. Ethical hacking provides a full audit of your security policies and in the case of bug bounties, can assist you in identifying holes in existing operational systems. It takes a far broader approach to cybersecurity than penetration testing. Whereas penetration testing focuses on system flaws, ethical hacking allows actors to utilize any attack tactics available to them. They can take advantage of system misconfigurations, send phishing emails, launch brute force password assaults, breach physical boundaries, or do whatever else they feel will get them access to critical information. Because thieves are progressively changing up the approaches and launching multi-layered complex attacks, this is incredibly useful for determining just how exposed the organization is to cyber threats. Considering the vast domain that is ethical hacking, we have multiple categories of penetration testing methodologies. Let's cover them in the next section. When configuring a security system, testing is critical to preventing hackers from penetrating the perimeter. There are three sort of tests, black box, gray box, and white box. In the black box testing, the tester receives no information during the penetration test. In this case, the pen tester takes the method of an unprivileged attacker from initial access and execution until exploitation. This scenario is the most realistic, showcasing how an attacker with no inside knowledge may target and compromise an organization. However, because of this, it is also the most expensive alternative. White box penetration testing, which is also known as crystal box testing, entails sharing all network and system information with the tester, which includes network maps and passwords. This saves time and lowers the overall cost of a project. A white box penetration test effectively simulates a focused assault on a given system using as many attack paths as feasible. In a gray box penetration test, also known as a transparent box test, very restricted information is present with the tester. Gray box testing is beneficial for understanding the extent of access a privileged person may get and the possible damage they could wreck. Gray box tests achieve a mix between depth and efficiency and may be used to mimic either an insider danger or an assault that has infiltrated the network perimeter. Now that we covered the basics of penetration testing and the relative categories, one must know how these testing campaigns benefit the organizations conducting them. Let us go through a few perks of penetration testing. Regular penetration testing helps your business assess the security of online applications, internal networks, and external networks. It also assists you in understanding what security measures are required to achieve the degree of protection your company needs to protect its people and assets. Prioritizing these risks offer firms an advantage in anticipating hazards and preventing harmful assaults. Penetration testing is similar to a real-life hacker rehearsing for a real-life hack. Regular penetration testing helps you be proactive in your real-world approach to reviewing the security of your IT infrastructure. The process identifies gaps in your security, allowing you to correct any flaws before an actual attack happens. It is undeniably expensive to recover from the effects of a data breach. Legal fees, IT cleanup, consumer protection programs, lost revenue, and dissatisfied customers may cost businesses millions. Penetration testing regularly is a proactive strategy to remain on top of your security and may assist in preventing financial damage from a breach while safeguarding your brand and image. Penetration testing aid in meeting the compliance and security duties imposed by industry standards and regulations such as PCI, HIPAA, FISMA, and ISO 27001. Having these tests done regularly help demonstrate due care and your commitment to information security, all while avoiding the significant fines associated with the non-compliance. With the entire process seeming to be a lengthy ordeal, what are the multiple phases in the process? Theoretically, we have to follow a five-stage process. Reconnaissance is the first phase of the penetration test. In this phase, the security researcher collects information about the target. It can be done actively, meaning you are collecting information by sending a request directly to the target and interpreting it. Passively, 
where you are collecting data without contacting the target or both. It helps security firms gather information about the target system, network components, active machines, etc. This activity can be performed by using information available in the public domain and using different tools. The scanning phase is more tool oriented rather than performed manually. The penetration tester runs one or more scanner tools to gather more information about the target by using scanners such as war dialers, port scanners, network mappers and vulnerability scanners. The penetration tester collects as many vulnerabilities which help in turning to attack a target in a more sophisticated way. The third phase is the gaining access of the system. In this phase, the penetration tester tries to connect with the target and exploit the vulnerabilities found in the previous stage. The exploitation may be buffer overflow attacks, denial of service DOS attacks, session hijacking and many more. Pen tester extracts information and sensitive data from the servers by gaining access using different tools. In the fourth stage, the hacker has to maintain access. The penetration tester tries to create a backdoor from himself. It helps the penetration tester to identify hidden vulnerabilities in the system and can later access the machine should the need arise. In the final phase of clearing and covering tracks, the penetration tester removes all logs and footprints which help the administrator identify his presence. This allows the penetration tester to think like a hacker and perform corrective actions to mitigate those activities. With the cost of cybersecurity platforms going up, trained penetration testers receive an excellent level of remuneration for their efforts. As per reports, the average yearly salary for a penetration tester is 6 lakh Indian rupees or $110,000 in the American counterpart. Finally, let's go over some of the ways hackers can identify vulnerable positions on a system to gather information in a live demonstration. In this demo, we will start by setting up a VPN connection that will allow us to access to a vulnerable network by creating a local virtual group over the internet. We then try to scan the victim machine for breachable entry points, find the username and password of the user in question and eventually grab the root password from the device. To start our demonstration, we are going to need a vulnerable machine to work on. Now this vulnerable machine can be found on the website known as Try Hack Me, which is a service catered towards penetration testers. Before we connect to the machine, we need to join the network where the machine is located. We can do that using an OVPN file, which is short for OpenVPN protocol. To connect to this OVPN file, we are going to go into a new workspace on Parrot Security. We are going to activate the root access and we are going to connect to it. Hacktest.ovpn. Once we see the message initialization sequence completed, we can be sure that we have connected to the network which has the vulnerable machine. Now to start the vulnerable machine, we are going to click this button and wait for a few seconds. As you can see, it gives a 1 minute countdown before it shows you the IP address. Now remember, whatever the IP address we receive here, it is a machine being launched on the TriHackMe servers, but we can access that machine because of the OVPN connection that we have just set up using this file. This OVPN file can be found on the Try Hack Me servers profile section which I downloaded beforehand. As you can see, we now have the IP address of our victim machine. Let's try if we can reach this machine or not. We're going to copy the IP address and we're going to try and ping to the machine. If the connection is successful and we have joined the network, we should be able to see some response over here. As you can see, we are receiving uh, request pings from the victim machine, which means that we have already joined the victim network. Now that we are confirmed, we are able to access the vulnerable machine. Let's run the first step in a penetration test, which is reconnaissance. 
let's run up and map scan. We're going to use the flag of SV so that we can know which version of the service it is running. We're going to take up the IP address and paste it here. This scan will only be possible if the OpenVPN connection is up and running. As you can see, it is still running. And we have our results over here. We're running this scan so that we can find the services running on the host machine that we will run and map against. We conclude that a web service is running actually on port 80, as we can see over here, which is using the Apache server system. In addition to this, there is a SMB Samba service as well running on ports 139.445. Now that we know that we have an Apache server, we can use this IP address to open it on the browser. Okay. Since the current homepage is not accessible, we can use some other URLs as well. As far as Apache servers are concerned, there are a certain set of URLs that can be used to open. However, if we go to the URL, which is IP address slash development, this opens up a new folder. If we try to check the contents of these files, this is for the dev.txt. You can see the version of the Apache HTTP server that is being run. This is the dev.txt. If we go back and we check the second file as well, it says the content C shadow has the credentials. Okay, if we go back again, SMB has been configured which we have already found out and map that it is running a Samba server. Now, with this version of the Apache server, we can find version specific exploits that can be run on Metasploit, but there is sometimes no, no need of that. We can use another technique as we now know that there are multiple users that is being run over here. We can use a tool known as enum for Linux. What it does this is acts it enumerates the windows and Asamba systems. To run that command, we're going to use enum for Linux minus A and we're going to take IP address of the machine. I'm going to paste it here. What this will essentially do is provide us usernames that are being stored in the victim machine. It's going to take some time to find out the usernames. Once we find those out, we can run the necessary attacks. As we have already seen on the NWAP, it is also happening in SSH port. So if we find the username and we find a single hash that can be cracked, we can use the SSH to get inside the machine. Right now, we have to wait for the results of the enum for Linux command. As you can see, we have found two users of the machine known as K and Jan. I think we can stop the enumeration right now since we have the two users of this machine. Next step what we can do is we can try to SSH into the machine. Now to run the SSH command, we're going to need the password of one of the users. For this example, let's say we go with the user of Jan. To brute force, we're going to use the Hydra tool. This is like an example command. This is how we can use. Let me just copy this and paste it over here. All right. 
Hydra minus cell user as we have already decided we're going to use the user Jan and we're going to use SSH for the IP address we're going to copy it from here and paste it here now for the password list we're going to use a word list which has a few passwords already present in it for this example I am going to use the rockyou.txt file which has like millions of passwords already stored in it what the Hydra will do is it will try to bypass the SSH console on the machine using the passwords present in the rockyou.txt file we will give the path rockyou over here like this And we're going to run it. As you can see, it's mentioned that it's attacking SSH at this IP address. Now this attack is going to take a while and after this attack is done, we are going to get the SSH password, which is basically the credentials of the Jan user in the victim machine. For now, I'm going to stop this attack. What I would recommend is for you to run this attack and write down the password that you received in the comment section below. The password that we receive from here can be used to log in into the machine. Let's try that once. To SSH into the machine, we're going to write SSH user at the rate IP address. We're going to write yes and press enter. Now we're going to enter the password that we have found after running the Hydra command. I'm going to type the password and press enter and we have logged in as you can see. Now if we try to look around there are no directories over here okay so let's go one step back give a space over here okay let's go to the second users folder Okay. These are the contents of the K folder and you can see there's a dot SSH folder over here. So we're going to enter that. Let's have a look the files in this folder and we can file an RSA ID over here which if I'm not wrong should be an RSA private key which can be used to SSH into the machine here we go you can see it's a big an RSA private key and it should end here as well now what this private key does this hash will be used to log SSH into the machine when using the user K once this hash is cracked using Hydra or any other cracking software like John the Ripper we can easily use the passphrase to log in into the machine with the user of K. What I am going to do is copy this private key I'm going to launch a new terminal To create a new file known as nano id paste the private key over here and save it as you can see we have saved the file over here now this hash can later be used to crack into the machine using the user of k this hash can be cracked using either john the ripper hydra or there are other cloud mechanisms that can be used to crack this machine after it is cracked we can use the passphrase derived from it to SSH into the machine. To perform the SSH entry, we're going to use this command SSH minus I. We're going to use the same file which we received. We're going to write the username which is K 10.10. .10. We can just copy it from the here. Right. Minimize this and paste the IP address over here. 
Or, or we can do one more thing. We're going to use a sudo command together as well. It's better. sudo ssh. Enter the system password. This passphrase is the one that we received after cracking the hash in this ID file. Whichever password you received after cracking this using Hydra or John the Ripper, please write the password in the comment section so that we can know that we have successfully cracked the password. We're going to write the passphrase over here. Press enter. And as you can see, we have entered the system of K. Here we're going to press LS and we find the backup file of the password. We're going to write cat password back and here is the final root password. So as you can see we have now able we have now received the final root password of the primary user and we have already cracked the password of the other user that is Jan. So this is the entire process of how you can use Nmap to find out the vulnerable points. You can see which are the softwares that are running, which versions they are running and which of those versions have a legitimate claim as an insecure exploit. Malware is a malicious software that is programmed to cause damage to a computer system, network and hardware devices. Many malicious programs like Trojan, viruses, worms and bots which cause damage to the system are known as malware. Most of the malware programs are designed to steal information from the targeted user or to steal money from the target by stealing sensitive data. Let's take a look at the introduction for two different types of malware, virus and trojan. Firstly, let's take a look what exactly is a virus program. A computer virus is a type of malicious program that on execution replicates itself. They get attached to different files and programs which are termed as host programs by inserting their code. If the attachment succeeds, the targeted program is termed as infected with a computer virus. Now let's take a look at the Trojan horse. Trojan horse program is a program that disguises itself as a legitimate program but harms the system on installation. They hide within the attachments and emails then transfer from one system to another. They create bad doors into a system to allow the cyber criminal to steal our information. Let's take a look how they function after getting installed into our system. Firstly, we have virus programs. The computer virus must contain two parts to infect the system. First is a search routine, which locates new files and data that is to be infected by the virus program. And the second part is known as the copy routine, which is necessary for the program to copy itself into the targeted file, which is located by the search routine. Now let's take a look at the Trojan horse functioning. For Trojan horses, entry way into our system is through emails that may look legitimate but may have unknown attachments. And when such files are downloaded into the device, the Trojan program gets installed and infects the system. They also infect the system on the execution of infected application or the executable file and attacks the system. Now that we understand what virus and Trojans are, Let's understand different types of virus and trojans. Let's take a look at different types of viruses. The first one is known as the boot sector virus. This type of virus damages the booting section of the system by infecting the master bot record, which is also known as MBR. This damages the boot sector section by targeting the hard disk of the system. Then we have the macro virus. Macrovirus is a type of virus that gets embedded into the document related data and is executed when the file is open. They also are designed to replicate themselves and infect the system on a larger scale. And lastly, we have the direct action virus. This type of virus gets attached to executable files, which on execution activates the virus program and infects the system. Once the infection of the file is completed, they exit the system, which is also the reason it is known as a non-resident virus. Let's take a look at different types of Trojans. The first type of Trojan is the backdoor Trojan. They are designed to create a backdoor in the system on execution of an infected program. 
they provide remote access of our system to the hacker. This way, the cyber criminal can steal our system data and may use it for illegal activities. Next, we have Crixos Trojan. They enter the system by clicking the random pop ups which we come across on the internet. They tempt the user to give their personal details for different transactions or schemes, which may provide remote access of our system to the cyber criminal. And the last Trojan type is Ransom Trojan. This type of Trojan program, after entering the system, blocks the user from accessing its own system and also affects the system functioning. The cyber criminal demands a ransom from the targeted user for the removal of the Trojan program from the device. Now that we understand some details regarding viruses and Trojan, let's solve a question. The question is, Jake was denied access to his system and he wasn't able to control the data and information in his system. Now, the actual question is, what could be the reason behind his system's problem? Option A, Macrovirus. Option B, Ransom Trojan. Option C, Backdoor Trojan. Give your answers in the comment section. Now let's understand how to detect the activity of viruses and Trojan in our system. To detect virus or Trojan activity in our system, we can refer to the following points. For viruses, we have slowing down of the system and frequent application freeze shows that the infection of the virus is present in the system. Then we have the viruses can also steal sensitive data, including passwords, account details, which may lead to unexpected logout from the accounts or corruption of the sensitive data. And lastly, we have frequent system crashes due to virus infection, which damages the operating system. For Trojan, we have frequent system crashes and system also faces slow reaction time. Then we have there are more random pop-ups from the system which may indicate Trojan activity. And lastly we have modification in the system application and change of the desktop appearance can be also due to the infection of a Trojan program. Next, let's take a look at a famous cyber attack for virus and a Trojan horse. For virus we have the MyDoom virus which was identified in the year 2004, which affected over 50 million systems by creating a network of sending spam emails, which was to gain backdoor access into our systems. Next, for the Trojan horse, we have the Emotet Trojan program, which is specifically designed for financial theft and for stealing bank-related information. Next, we have few points for how to prevent virus entry or Trojan attack for a system. The most basic way of virus protection is to using antivirus and do regular virus scan. This will prevent virus entry in the system and also having more than one antivirus provides much better protection. Then avoid visiting uncertified websites can also prevent virus entry into a system. Then we have using regular driver updates and system updates to prevent virus entry. For Trojan, we have using certified softwares from legal sites to prevent any Trojan activity in our system. And also avoid clicking random pop-ups that we often see on the internet. And lastly, using antivirus and firewalls for protection against Trojan horses is a good habit. Now that we have reached the end of the video, let's take a look what we learned. For the first part, we saw the main objective of the virus is to harm the data and information in a system. Whereas for the Trojan, we have stealing of the data files and information. Effect of viruses is more drastic in comparison to the Trojan horses. Then we have viruses which are non-remote programs, whereas Trojan horses are remote accessed. And lastly, viruses have the ability to replicate itself to harm multiple files, whereas Trojan does not have the replication ability. Let's take a look at some of the famous botnet attacks. The first one is Mirai Botnet, which is a malicious program designed to attack vulnerable IoT devices and infect them to form a network of bots. That on command perform basic and medium level denial of service attacks. Then we have the Zeus bot 
specifically designed for attacking the system for bank related information and data. Now let's take a look at the agenda for today's video. Firstly we'll understand what is a botnet. Then we'll see how exactly a botnet works. After that we'll learn some of the architectures how a botnet works on. In the end we learn how to protect ourselves from botnet attacks. Now let's see what exactly a botnet is. Botnet refers to a network of hijacked interconnected devices that are installed with malicious codes known as malware. Each of these infected devices are known as bots and a hijacked criminal known as bot hoarder remotely controls them. The bots are used to automate large scale attacks including data theft, server failure, malware propagation and denial of service attacks. Now that we know what exactly a botnet is, let's dive deeper into learning how a botnet works. During the preparation of a botnet network, the first step involves preparing the botnet army. After that, the connection between the botnet army and the control server is established. And the end, the launching of the attack is done by the bot herder. Let's understand through an illustration. Firstly, we have a bot herder that initiates the attack. According to the control server commands, the devices that are infected with the malware programs and begins to attack the infected system. Let's see some details regarding the preparation of the botnet army. The first step is known as the prepping the botnet army. The first step is creating a botnet is to infect as many as connected devices as possible. This ensures that there are enough bots to carry out the attack. This way, it creates bots either by exploiting the security gaps in the software or websites or using phishing attacks. They are often deployed through Trojan horses. For the next step we have, establishing the connection. Once it hacks the device, as per previous step, it infects it with the specific malware that connects the device back to the control bot server. A bot herder uses command programming to drive the bot's actions. And the last step is known as launching the attack. Once infected, a bot allows access to admin level operation like gathering and stealing of data, reading and rewriting the system data, monitoring user activities, performing denial of service attacks, including other cyber crimes. Now let's take a look at the botnet architecture. The first type is known as client server model. The client server model is a traditional model that operates with the help of a command and control center server and communication protocols like IRC. When the bot order issues a command to the server, it is then relayed to the clients to perform malicious actions. Then we have peer-to-peer -peer model. Peer controlling the infected bots involves a peer-to-peer -peer network that relies on a decentralized approach. That is, the bots are topological interconnected and acts as both CNC servers, that is the server and the client. Today hackers adopt this approach to avoid detection and single point failure. In the end, we will see some points on some countermeasure against botnet attacks. The first step is to have updated drivers and system updates. After that, we should avoid clicking random pop-ups or links that we often see on the internet. And lastly, Having certified antivirus, anti-spyware softwares and firewall installed into a system will protect against malware attack. Jane is relaxing at home when she receives an email from a bank that asks her to update her credit card PIN in the next 24 hours as a security measure. Judging the severity of the message, Jane follows the link provided in the email. On delivering her current credit card PIN and the supposedly updated one, the website became unresponsive which prompted her to try sometime later. However, after a couple of hours, she noticed a significant purchase from a random website on that same credit card, which she never authorized. Frantically contacting the bank, Jane realized the original email was a counterfeit or a fake message with a malicious link that entailed credit card fraud. This is a classic example of a phishing attack. Phishing attacks are a type of social engineering where a fraudulent message is sent to a target on the premise of arriving from a trusted source. Its basic purpose is to trick the victim into revealing sensitive information like passwords and payment information. It's based on the word phishing, 
which works on the concept of baits. If a supposed victim catches the bait, the attack can go ahead, which in our case makes Jane the fish and the phishing emails the bait. If Jane never opened the malicious link or was cautious about the email authenticity, an attack of this nature would have been relatively ineffective. But how does the hacker gain access to these credentials? A phishing attack starts with a fraudulent message, which can be transmitted via email or chat applications. Even using SMS conversations to impersonate legitimate sources is known as smishing, which is a specific category of phishing attacks. Irrespective of the manner of transmission, the message targets the victim in a way that coaxes them to open a malicious link and provide critical information on the requisite website. More often than not, the websites are designed to look as authentic as possible. Once the victims submit information using the link, be it a password or credit card details, the data is sent to the hacker who designed the email and the fake website, giving him complete control over the account whose password was just provided. Often carried out in campaigns where an identical phishing mail is sent to thousands of users, the rate of success is relatively low, but never zero. Between 2013 and 2015, corporate giants like Facebook and Google were tricked off of $100 million due to an extensive phishing campaign where a known common associate was impersonated by the hackers. Apart from credit access, some of these campaigns target the victim device and install malware when clicked on the malicious links, which can later function as a botnet or a target for ransomware attacks. There is no single formula, for there are multiple categories of phishing attacks. The issue with Jane, where the hacker stole her bank credentials, falls under the umbrella of deceptive phishing. A general email is sent out to thousands of users in this category, hoping some of them fall prey to this scam. Spear phishing, on the other hand, is a bit customized version. The targets are researched before being sent an email. For example, if you never had a Netflix subscription, sending you an email that seems like the Netflix team sends it becomes pointless. This is a potential drawback of deceptive phishing techniques. On the other hand, a simple screenshot of a Spotify playlist being shared on social media indicates a probable point of entry. The hacker can send counterfeit messages to the target user while implying the source of such messages being Spotify, tricking them into sharing private information. Since the hacker already knows the target uses Spotify, the chances of victims taking the bait increase substantially. For more important targets like CEOs and people with a fortune on their back, the research done is tenfold, which can be called a case of whaling. The hackers prepare and wait for the right moment to launch their phishing attack, often to steal industry secrets for rival companies or sell them off at a higher price. Apart from just emails, farming focuses on fake websites that resemble their original counterparts as much as possible. A prevalent method is to use domain names like Facebook with a single O or YouTube with no E. These are mistakes that people make when typing the full URL in the browser, leading them straight to a counterfeit web page which can fool them into submitting private data. A few more complex methods exist to drive people onto fake websites, like ARP spoofing and DNS cache poisoning, but they are rarely carried out due to time and resource constraints. Now that we know how phishing attacks work, let's look at ways to prevent ourselves from becoming victims. While the implications of a phishing attack can be extreme, protecting yourself against these is relatively straightforward. Jane could have saved herself from credit card fraud had she checked the link in the email for authenticity and that it redirected to a secure website that runs on the HTTPS protocol. Even suspicious messages shouldn't be entertained. One must also refrain from entering private information on random websites or pop-up windows, irrespective of how legitimate they seem. It is also recommended to use secure anti-phishing browser extensions like Cloudfish to sniff out malicious emails from legitimate ones. The best way to prevent phishing is browsing the internet with care and being on alert for malicious attempts at all times. So here is a question for you. If both me and my friends receive the same email that instructs us to change our Spotify password before the end of the day, even though one of us never used Spotify, what bracket does this phishing attack fall under? One, whaling, two, spear phishing, three, deceptive phishing, four, farming, Think about it and leave your answers below in the comments section, and three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. 
cyber attacks are becoming more prevalent due to the pandemic, where work from home is the norm and people spend possibly more than half their day with a laptop. But we cannot stop every attack at the root. We must be informed and vigilant to phishing attacks, among others, to safeguard our data. It's the year 2015, and Richard has just finished playing games on his computer. After a long gaming session, Richard tries to shut it down, but finds some random text file on the desktop that says, Ransom Note. The text file mentioned how a hacking group had encrypted Richard's game files and private documents, and he had to pay a ransom of $500 worth of Bitcoin in a specified Bitcoin address. Richard quickly checked his files, only to see them being encrypted and unreadable. This is the story of how the Tesla Crypt ransomware spread in 2015, which affected thousands of gamers before releasing the master key used for encrypting the files. So, what is ransomware? For Richard to be targeted by such an attack, he must have installed applications from untrusted sources or clicked an unverified link. Both of them can function as gateways for a ransomware breach. Ransomware is a type of malware that encrypts personal information and documents while demanding a ransom amount to decrypt them. This ransom payment is mainly done using cryptocurrency to ensure anonymity, but can also employ other routes. Once the files are encrypted or locked behind a password, a text files available to the victim, explaining how to make the ransom payment and unlock the files for it. Just like Richard found the ransom note text file on his desktop. Even after the money has been paid, there is no guarantee that the hackers will send the decryption key or unlock the files. But in certain sensitive situations, victims make the payment hoping for the best. Having never been introduced to ransomware attacks before, this gave Richard an opportunity to learn more about this and he began his research on the topic. The spread of ransomware mostly starts with phishing attacks. To know more about phishing attacks, click the link in the button above. Users tend to click on unknown links received via emails and chat applications, promising rewards of some nature. Once clicked, a ransomware file is installed on the system that encrypts all the files or blocks access to computer functions. They can also be spread via malware, transmitted via untrusted application installation, or even a compromised wireless network. Another way to breach a system with ransomware is by using the Remote Desktop Protocol, or RDP access. A computer can be accessed remotely using this protocol, allowing a hacker to install malicious software on the system with the owner unaware of these developments. Coming to the different types of ransomware, first, we have Locker Ransomware which is a type of malware that blocks standard computer functions from being accessed until the payment to the hackers is complete. It shows a lock screen that doesn't allow the victim to use the computer for even basic purposes. Another type is crypto ransomware, which encrypts the local files and documents in the computers. Once the files are encrypted, finding the decryption key is impossible unless the ransomware variant is old and the keys are already available on the internet. Scareware is fake software that claims to have detected a virus or other issue on your computer and directs you to pay to resolve the problem. Some types of scareware lock the computer, while others simply flood the screen with pop-up alerts without actually damaging files. To prevent getting affected by ransomware, Richard could have followed a few steps to further enhance his security. One must always have backups of their data. Cloud storage for backup is easy but a physical backup in a hard drive is always recommended. Keeping the system updated with the latest security patches is always a good idea. Apart from system updates, one must always have reputed antivirus software installed. Many antivirus software like Kaspersky and Bitdefender have anti-ransomware features that periodically check for encryption of private documents. When browsing the internet, a user must always check for the lock symbol on the address bar which signifies the presence of HTTPS protocol for additional security. If a system is infected with ransomware already, there is a website, nomoreransom.org. It has a collection of decryption tools for most well-known ransomware packages. It can also help decrypt specific encrypted files if the list of anti-ransomware tools didn't help the victim. So, here's a question for you. What should be the first course of action after a ransomware attack? 1. Contact the criminal authorities. 2. Run antivirus scan for the entire system. 3. Recover from local or cloud backups. 4. 
isolate device from the parent network? Think about it and leave your answers in the comments section, and three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. Ransomware attacks have become increasingly common due to the shift in corporate work culture from in-office to work from home. In March 2021, a Chicago-based company called CNA Financial was attacked by ransomware that affected nearly 75,000 users. The company was later forced to pay out $40 million to get their system access back. Ransomware costs businesses more than $75 billion per year, and we must take the necessary steps to incur as minor damage as possible. So that was ransomware in a nutshell, a growing concern among security professionals worldwide. To understand the key logging problem better, let's take a look at an example. This is June. She works in a business firm where she manages the company's data regularly. This is Jacob from the information department who is here to inform her about some of the security protocols. During the briefing, she informed him about some of the problems her system was facing with, which included slow reaction speed and unusual internet activity. As Jacob heard about the problems with the system, he thinks of the possibility what could be the reason behind these problems her system was facing with. The conclusion that he came across was the key logging issue. Unknown to the problem her system was facing with, she asked him about some of the details regarding it. For today's topic, we learn what exactly key loggers are and how they affect our system, what are the harmful effects that key logging can bring into the system. For today's agenda, we learn what exactly the key logging program is. Then we'll see how the system gets infected, what are different methods of the key logging issue enter into the system. Then we'll take a look at different types of methods how to detect the key logging issue into the system. Then we'll take a look at different types of key loggers that are present and how they affect differently into the system. Then we'll take a look how the hackers use the recorded data that has been sent by the key logging program. And then we'll take a look at a case where the mobile devices get affected with the key logging issue. And lastly, we'll take a look what are different prevention methods available to prevent the system from getting infected by the key logging issue. To begin with, we learn what exactly the key logging program is. As the name suggests, Keylogger is a malicious program or a tool that is designed to record keystrokes that are typed during data input and record them into a log file. Then the same program secretly sends these log files to its origin, where they can be used for malicious acts by the hacker. Now that we know what the keylogging program is, let's take a look how they enter into the system. Searching for a suitable driver for a system can often lead to the installation of the key logging program into the system. If we often visit suspicious sites and uncertified software are installed into our system, then if we use unknown links or visiting unknown websites which come through unknown addresses can also be a reason behind the key logging issue entering into the system. And lastly, there are often cases where Different pop-ups that we often see on social sites or different media sites can lead to the installation of key logging program into our system. Now that we know how the problem gets into the system, let's take a look how to identify whether the system is infected by the key logging issue. The key logging issue can be identified if there are often cases when a keyboard lags behind the system. The data that we enter Sometimes it's stuck in between when we type through the input. Then there are cases when the system freeze occurs unknowingly to what exactly could be the reason behind them. And also there are delayed reaction time for different applications that run on the system. And lastly, there are different cases when we often see suspicious internet activity on the system that we don't know about. This could lead to the identification of a problem into the system. Now, we'll take a look at different types of key loggers that are present on the net which can harm our system differently. The first problem 
that key loggers arouse is API based. The most common key logging case, which uses APIs to keep a log of the type data and share it to its origin for malicious purposes. Each time we press a key, the key logger intercepts the signal and logs it. Then we have form grabbing based key loggers, as the name suggests. They are a based key loggers that store the form data. That is, if we often use web forms or different kinds of forms to enter different data, they can be recorded into the system by the program and send it to its origin. Then we have kernel based key loggers. These key loggers are installed deeply into the operating system where they can hide from different antivirus if not checked properly and they record the data that we type on the keyboard and send it to its origin. And lastly, we have hardware key loggers. These key loggers are present directly into the hardware. That is, they are embedded into system where they record the data that we type on the keyboard. Now, let's take a look how hackers differentiate different type of recorded data and exploit them. When hackers receive information about the target, they might use it to blackmail the target, which may affect the personal life of the target and also blackmail them for different money related issues. Then, in case of company data that is recorded by the key logging program can also affect the economic value of the company in the market, which may lead to the downfall of the company. Also, in some cases, the key logging program can also log data about military secrets, which may include nuclear codes or security protocols which are necessary to maintain the security of a country. Now, let's take a look whether mobile devices get infected with the key logging issue or not. In the case of hand devices, infection of key loggers are low in comparison to the computer systems as they use on screen keyboard or virtual keyboard. But in some cases, we often see different kinds of malicious programs getting installed into the hand device if we often visit different uncertified websites or illegal websites or torrent sites. And also, the device that is infected with the key logging issue or different kind of malicious program can often lead to the exploitation of data that includes photos, emails, or important files by the hacker or the cyber criminal that installed the particular malicious program into the system. Now, to prevent a system from getting infected by the key logging program, let's take a look at different points. The first point includes using of different antivirus softwares or tools which can prevent the entering of malicious program into the system. Then, keeping system security protocols regularly updated is also a good habit. And lastly, using virtual keyboard to input our sensitive data which may include bank details, login details, or different passwords related to different websites. Now that we have some understanding about the topic of key loggers, Let's take a look at the demo to further increase the knowledge about the topic. For the first step, we have to download some of the important libraries that are required into the system, which is this library. Now we'll run it. The system says the library is already installed into the system. Now, let's take a look what exactly modules are required from the particular library. From this library, we'll import the keyboard module, which will help us to record the data that we type on the keyboard. Now, from the same, we'll also import key module and the listener module. And also the logging module, which will help us to record the data into a log file. For the next part, we'll write a piece of code that will allow us to save the data that is recorded by the program into a text file that will be named as key underscore log text file along with the date and time stamp. Let's take a look.
now we'll provide it with the file name that will be given as keylog.txt file and also so the part where the format of the data is recorded put the brackets over here to contain the file name now we'll write the format in which the data will be recorded into the log file which will be given as the format would be the message and the timestamp which would be given as along with the timestamp given as percentage and ending it with the bracket now for the next step we'll design two of the functions that will be used into the program that will be termed as while press function and while release function let's take a look while press function would be a function that will come into play when the keyboard key has been pressed is pressed and this would go for the format that we designed in the above line and logging the pressed key info a string file to be recorded into the log file now now we will design a function that is while release that will come into play when the escape key has been pressed that is the program will terminate itself and the program will stop from running and in the end we require for the functioning of the program to loop these functions that is while press and while release to continue its cycle that will be going for while press and on release will contain while release function as listener and now this part would join the different threads and store them into the log file. Now that we have completed the code for the program, let's run it. We have to wait for a moment so the program runs it. Now, to verify the program, let's open Notepad. And on the notepad, we'll write hello world, which will be the basic whether the program is working or not. Let's take a look. And we'll go for the main page on Jupyter Notebook and refresh the page. Go to the bottom. Over here, we see the key lock text. That is a text file that we created. Let's open it. And over here, we have the data that is created. 
as we started with note then this is a hello world part that we created just now which shows that the program we created is working properly let's take a look at some of the detection methods for keylogger in a system first one is the keystrokes that we make become sluggish that is the reaction speed from the hardware keyboard which is slower than usual then we have instances where our system gets hanged or freezes in between the work there are also cases when there is suspicious unusual activity in the internet and lastly there are some unknown programs that are running in the background of the system these four are general cases where we can observe whether the system is infected with a keylogger program or not to better understand keylogging activity in a system let's take a look at the demo for the same for the first step let's execute the keylogging program in a system over here i am using a python keylogging program and if you want to know more about the keylogging program in python you can watch our previous video on what are keyloggers let's begin now let's execute the program and wait for a second or two for the program to continue execution okay let's take a look whether the program is working properly we can see that the key logging program would create a text file named key underscore log let's take a look key underscore log seems like the program is working fine let's try typing something on the notepad hello world now let's see whether the recorded data comes seems like the program is working fine the data is recorded hello world with exclamation marks along with the time now let's try detecting the keylogger program using different detection methods for the first step you can access your settings where you should go for windows update over here you would often see some of the updates regarding security measures that is the very basic step if you want to detect keylogging activity in your system let's take a look at the second detection method for this you can use a start option and type task manager using the task manager app you can see some of the programs that are displayed these programs are the ones that are currently working or executed in my system right now if you see any unusual program that is been executed without your knowledge may refer to a keylogger program and if you find any unusual program that has been executed on your system right now you should right click on the program and choose the option end task this will immediately end the task that has been executed which might protect your data from being recorded Let's take a look at the third option how we can detect the keyloggers. In the task manager, use the option startup. In the startup option, represents the softwares or programs that get executed when the system is turned on. If you see any unusual program or software mentioned in any of these in your system, you might have to disable that. This represents there's an unusual program or a malicious tool that has been executed when you start up your system which may relate to a keylogger problem and the last method to detect keylogger activity is to type something if you feel there is some restrictions or there is a gap between when you type the key on your keyboard and the reaction speed becomes slow even by a millisecond this might represent there is a program that is interfering with the keyboard if you use the following detection methods you might save yourself from being spied on or getting your data recorded that you type on your system jude is waiting at the airport to hop on her flight back home when she realizes that she missed making an important bank payment 
She connects her laptop to the public Wi-Fi at the airport and goes ahead to carry out the bank transaction. Everything goes well, and Jude completes her transaction. After a couple of days, she was wiped off her feet when she learned that her bank account was subjected to a cyber attack and a hefty amount was wiped from her account. After getting in touch with the bank authority, she learned that her account was hacked at the airport. She then realized that the public Wi-Fi she used might have caused her this trouble. Jude wishes that had her bank transfer escaped the hacker's eyes, she would not have been a victim of a cyber attack. Bank officials advise her to use a VPN for future transactions, especially when connecting to an open or public network. Like most of us, Jude had come across the term VPN several times, but didn't know much about it, and little did she think that the repercussions of not using a VPN would be this bad. Let's understand how the hacker would have exploited Jude's transaction in the absence of a VPN. In this process, Jude's computer first connects to the internet service provider, ISP, which provides access to the internet. She sends her details to the bank's server using her IP address. Internet protocol address or IP address is a unique address that recognizes a particular device, be it a laptop or a smartphone on the internet. When these details pass through the public network, the hacker, who passively watches the network traffic, intercepts it. This is a passive cyber attack, where the hacker collects Jude's bank details without being detected. More often or not, in such an attack, payment information is likely to be stolen. The targeted data here are the victim's username, passwords, and other personal information. Such an unsecured connection exposed Jude's IP address and bank details to the hacker when it passed through the public network. So would Jude have been able to secure her transaction with the help of a VPN? Well, yes. Picture Jude's bank transaction to be happening in a tunnel that is invisible to the hacker. In such a case, the hacker will not be able to spot her transaction, and that is precisely what a VPN does. A virtual private network, more often known as VPN, creates a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. For using a VPN, Jude's first step would be to install a software-based technology known as the VPN client on her laptop or smartphone that would let her establish a secure connection. The VPN client connects to the Wi-Fi and then to the ISP. Here, the VPN client encrypts Jude's information using VPN protocols. Data is encrypted to make sure it is secure. Next, the VPN client establishes a VPN tunnel within the public network that connects to the VPN server. The VPN tunnel protects Jude's information from being intercepted by the hacker. Jude's IP address and actual location are changed at the VPN server to enable a private and secure connection. Finally, the VPN server connects to Jude's bank server in the last step, where the encrypted message is decrypted. This way, Jude's original IP address is hidden by the VPN, and the VPN tunnel protects her data from being hacked. This explains how VPN makes your data anonymous and secure when it passes through the public network, and the difference between a normal connection and a VPN connection. After learning about this, Jude was certain that she should start using a VPN to carry out her online transactions in the future. This is also applicable to each one of us. Even if you work remotely or connect to public Wi-Fi, using a VPN is the safest option. In addition to providing a secure encrypted data transfer, VPNs are also used to disguise your whereabouts and give you access to regional web content. VPN servers act as proxies on the internet. This way, your actual location cannot be established. VPN enables you to spoof your location and switch to a server to another country and thereby change your location. For example, by doing so, you can watch any content on Netflix that might be unavailable for your region. Given the current scenario, cyber attacks are on the rise now more than ever. So we have to stay alert and protect our digital information. If you are interested in protecting networks and computers from cyber criminals, a cybersecurity career is what you should venture into. So what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and become a cybersecurity expert. Let's move on to learning about the Tor network. Tor short for the onion router it's an open source privacy network that permits users to browse the web anonymously 
The tower was initially developed and solely used by the US Navy to protect sensitive government communications before the network was made publicly available. The digital era has disrupted the traditional way of doing things in every sector of the economy. The rapid rise in development and innovation of digital products has given way to frequent data breaches and cyber thefts. In response, consumers are increasingly opting for products that offer data privacy and cyber security. Tor is one such underground network that was implemented for the purpose of protecting users' identities. The Tor network is one example of the many emerging technologies that attempt to fill a data privacy void in a digital space plagued by cyber security concerns. The Tor network intercepts the traffic from your browser and bounces a user's request of a random number of other user IP addresses. Then the data is passed to the user requester's final destination. These random users are volunteer devices which are called as nodes or relays. The Tor network disguises your identity by encrypting the traffic and moving it across different Tor relays within the network. The Tor network uses an onion routing technique for transmitting data, hence the original name of onion router. To operate within the Tor network, a user has to install the Tor browser. Any address or information requested using the browser is transmitted through the Tor network. It has its own feature set which we will be covering over later in this video. As we discussed already, the data passing through the Tor network must follow a unique protocol known as the Onion Routing Protocol. Let us learn more about its unique characteristics. In our normal network usage, the data is transmitted directly. The sender has data packets to transmit which is done directly over a line of communication with either a receiving party or a server of some kind. However, since the data can easily be captured while being transmitted, the security of this exchange is not very reliable. Moreover, it becomes very easy to trace the origin of such requests. On many occasions, websites with questionable and controversial content are blocked from the ISP. This is possible since the ISP is able to detect and spy on user information passing through the network. Apart from ISPs, there is a steady chance of your private information being intercepted by hackers. Unfortunately, easy detection of the source and contents of a web request make entire network extremely vulnerable for people who seek anonymity over the internet. However, in the Onion Routing Protocol, things take a longer route. We have a sender with the Tor browser installed on the client system. The network sends the information to Node 1's IP address, which encrypts the information and passes it on to Node 2's address, which performs another encryption and passes it on to Node 3 address. This is the last address which is also known as the exit node. This last node decrypts the encrypted data and finally relays the request to the final destination, which can be another device or a server end. This final address thinks the request came from the exit node and grants access to it. The encryption process across multiple computers repeats itself from the exit node to the original user. The Tor network obfuscates user IP addresses from unwanted surveillance by keeping the user's request untraceable. With multiple servers touching the data, it makes the tracking very difficult for both ISPs and malicious attackers. Now that we understand the way Tor works, let us learn more about the Tor browser. The Tor browser was developed by a non-profit organization as a part of the Tor project in 2008 and its first public release was announced. The Tor browser is a browser forked from the popular Firefox that anonymizes your web traffic using the Tor network. If you are investigating a competitor, researching an opposing litigant in a legal dispute or just think it's creepy for your ISP or the government to know what websites you visit, the Tor browser might be the right solution. Before the Tor browser were developed, using that network to maintain anonymity was a huge task for everyday consumers. Starting from the setup to the usage, the entire process demanded a lot of knowledge and practice. The Tor browser managed to make it easy for users to traverse the relay servers in Tor and guarantee the privacy of the data exchange. A major feature of the Tor browser is the ability to delete all browser history, cookies and tracking data the moment it is closed. Every new launch of the browser opens an empty slate, having your usage habits from being tracked and singled out. A major feature that is the highlight of the Tor network is the availability of onion links. Only a small portion of the World Wide Web is available to the general public. We have the deep web that contains links that are not allowed to be indexed by standard search engines like Google and Bing. The dark web is a further subset of the deep web which contains onion links. 
Tor Browser gives you access to these .onion websites which are only available within the Tor network. Onion is a special use top level domain which designates an anonymous Onion service which is also known as a hidden service. Similar to the links of the deep web, these Onion links provide services like online shopping, cryptocurrency and many other products not available in the consumer internet space. Often being considered as a haven for illegal activities and sales, Onion links provide both information and assets in a private manner without the risk of spying by authorities. Browsing the web over Tor is slower than the clear net due to the multiple layers of encryption. Some web services also block Tor users. Tor browser is also illegal in authoritarian regimes that want to prevent citizens from reading, publishing and communicating anonymously. Journalists and dissidents around the world have embraced Tor as a cornerstone of democracy and researchers are hard at work at improving Tor's anonymity properties. Let us take a look at some of the advantages of using the Tor browser over standard web browsers. The highlight of using the Tor browser is to maintain anonymity over the internet. The cause for such requests can differ from person to person but all of these concerns are answered by the Tor network. Routing the information via multiple nodes and relay servers make it entirely difficult for the ISP to keep a track of usage data. The entire Tor project is designed to be completely free and open source. Allowing the code for the browser to be inspected and audited by third parties helps in the early detection of faulty configurations and critical bugs. It is present for multiple operating systems starting from laptops to mobile devices. A number of websites are blocked by governments for a variety of reasons. Journalists under authoritarian regimes have difficulty in getting the word out regarding the situation. Since the Onion routing protocol transfers data between multiple servers of random countries, the domains being blocked become available when used via Tor. Usage of these encryption messaging platforms is easily enforced using the Tor browser, which otherwise would have been a difficult task under oppressive circumstances. Many people believe that a VPN offers the same benefits as the Tor browser. Let's put both of them to the test and see the differences between them. Coming to the first point of difference, Tor is completely free and open source. All of the code for the browser and the network can be audited and has been cleared for security concerns. When it comes to VPN, there are many different brands which have open source clients but the same cannot be said for their counterparts. Some have partly open source while some have completely locked up their code so that they cannot be stolen further. Moving on, Tor has multiple relay points in its data transfer protocol. Between the server and the receiver, there are three different IP nodes. That number can increase but it will always be more than two. Once the data is passed from the sender, it goes through all of those relay points. While in the case of a VPN, the connection is made from the client device to the VPN server and then to the requested destination. There is no other IP node that comes into work here, thereby making the connection a one-to-one -one between the client and a VPN. As a next point, since Tor handles multiple layers of encryption and the data passes through multiple systems along the way, the performance is slow compared to a VPN where the performance is relatively fast due to the less number of nodes the data passes through. Similarly, the multi-layer encryption of Tor is consistent. If you use Tor browser, every single request passes through the same layer of encryption and follows the same routing protocol. In the case of a VPN, Different companies offer different levels of encryption. Some have multi-hop, some prefer a single one-to-one -one connection and these kind of differences make the choice much more variable. Finally, the nodes and relays being used in the Tor network are volunteer. There is no company holding over them, so jurisdiction becomes relatively straightforward. Whereas in the case of VPNs, many such VPNs are hosted by adware companies or are being monitored by central governments to note the usage information. Now that we have a better understanding of the Tor browser and its routing, let us take a look at how the Tor browser can anonymize and protect our internet usage. On opening up the Tor browser for the first time, this is the page that you are going to be welcomed with. You have the option of connecting to the Tor network before we start our browsing. So let's press connect and we can see that it is connected. Coming to the anonymization, let's check my current location on Google Chrome. Currently is showing as Navi Mumbai in Maharashtra. 
If we check the same link on the Tor browser, we should get a different address. Now every link that we open in the Tor browser will be little delayed and the speed will be hampered because of the multiple layers of encryption like we discussed. Now as you can see, it's showing a German IP and the state of Bavaria. This is how the anonymization works. There is no VPN configured, there is no proxy attached. It's straight up the out of the box settings that come inbuilt with the Tor browser. Similarly, we have an option of cleaning up the data. Let's say if you want to refresh your location and you want to use a different ID for the next browsing session. If you just restart it once and you can have to check it again. We should be seeing a different country this time. As you can see, we have Netherlands right now. So this is how you can keep refreshing your address. You can keep refreshing your host location so that you cannot be tracked when in browsing the internet. Like we discussed, we have some onion links that can only be used on the Tor network. As you can see, these kind of links do not open in the Google Chrome browser. But once we copy these over to the Tor browser, as you can see, we have opened the hidden wiki, which is available only on the Tor network. This is kind of an alternative Wikipedia website where we can find articles to read and more information to learn. Similarly, we have another onion link over here, which is once again available only for the Tor browser. Now these kind of delays are expected, but they are a valid compromise because they maintain the anonymity that many people desire. Similarly, we have found a hidden wallet, which is a cryptocurrency wallet, which is specifically for dark web members. This operates over the Tor network and this is used by mostly journalists and people who want to anonymize their internet transactions when it comes to dealing money. All of the transactions that occur over the Tor network are almost impossible to track. Therefore, these kind of cryptocurrency wallets are very big on the deep web. This is just one example while having multiple different wallets for every single cryptocurrency available. With every aspect of corporate culture going online and embracing cloud computing, there is a plethora of critical data circulating through the internet, all worth billions of dollars to the right person. Increasing benefits require more complex attacks and one of these attacks is a brute force attack. A brute force or known as brute force cracking is the cyber attack equivalent of trying every key on your keyring and eventually finding the right one. Brute force attacks are simple and reliable. There is no prior knowledge needed about the victim to start an attack. Most of the systems falling prey to brute force attacks are actually well secured. Attackers let a computer do the work, that is trying different combinations of usernames and passwords until they find the one that works. Due to this repeated trial and error format, the strength of password matters a great deal. Although with enough time and resources, Brute force will break a system since they run multiple combinations until they find the right passcode. Hey everyone, this is Bhavab from Simply Learn and welcome to this video on what is a brute force attack. Let's take a look at the topics we need to cover today. We start by learning about what a brute force attack is and its reliability as a hacking technique. Next, we take a look at a step-by-step -step approach to how the hackers can take control of a system using brute force techniques. Moving on, we learn about the harmful effects of getting our personal devices brute forced or compromised and how it can affect not only our devices but our friends and family as well. We also understand a few steps that we can enforce to make a better security system against brute force attacks specifically. And finally, we have a demonstration that explains how the brute force mechanism works in a real world situation. But before we begin, Make sure you're subscribed to our Simply Learn channel and click the bell icon to never miss an update from us. Let's begin with learning about brute force attacks in detail. A brute force attack, also known as an exhaustive search, is a cryptographic hack that relies on guessing possible combinations of targeted password until the current password is discovered. It can be used to break into online accounts, encrypted documents, or even network peripheral devices. The longer the password, the more combinations that will need to be tested. A brute force attack can be time consuming 
and difficult to perform if methods such as data obfuscation are used and at times downright impossible. However, if the password is weak, it could merely take seconds with hardly any effort. Dictionary attacks are an alternative to brute force attacks where the attacker already has a list of usernames and passwords that need to be tested against the target. It doesn't need to create any other combinations on its own. Dictionary attacks are much more reliable than brute force in a real world context, but the usefulness depends entirely on the strength of passwords being used by the general population. There is a three step process when it comes to brute forcing a system. Let's learn about each of them in detail. In step one, we have to settle on a tool that we are going to use for brute forcing. There are some popular names on the market like Hashcat, Hydra, and John the Ripper. While each of them has its own strength and weaknesses, each of them perform well with the right configuration. All of these tools come pre-installed with certain Linux distributions that cater to penetration testers and cybersecurity analysts like Kali Linux and Parrot Security. After deciding what tool to use, we can start generating combinations of alphanumeric variables whose only limitation is the number of characters. For example, while using Hydra, a single six-digit password will create 900,000 passwords with only digits involved. Add alphabets and symbols to that sample space and that number grows exponentially. The popular tools allow customizing this process. Let's say the hacker is aware of the password being a specific eight-digit word containing only letters and symbols. This will substantially increase the chances of being able to guess the right password since we remove the time taken to generate the longer ones. We omit the need for including digits in such combinations. These small tweaks go a long way in organizing an efficient brute force attack since running all the combinations with no filters will dramatically reduce the odds of finding the right credentials in time. In the final step, we run these combinations against the file or service that is being broken. We can try and break into a specific encrypted document, a social media account, or even devices at home that connect to the internet Let's say there is a Wi-Fi router. The generated passwords are then fed into the connection one after the other. It is a long and arduous process, but the work is left to the computer rather than someone manually clicking and checking each of these passcodes. Any password that doesn't unlock the router is discarded and the brute force tool simply moves on to the next one. This keeps going on until we find the right combination which unlocks the router. Sometimes reaching the success stage takes days and weeks, which makes it cumbersome for people with low computing power at their disposal. However, the ability to crack any system in the world purely due to bad password habits is very appealing and the general public tends to stick with simple and easy to use passwords. Now that we have a fair idea about how brute force works, let's see if we can answer this question. We learned about how complex passwords are tougher to crack by brute force. Among the ones listed on the screens, which one do you believe will take the longest to be broken when using brute force tools? Leave your answers in the comment section and we will get back to you with the correct option next week. Let's move on to the harmful effects of getting a system compromised due to brute force attacks. A hacked laptop or mobile can have social media accounts logged in, giving the hackers free access to the victim's connections. It has been reported on multiple occasions where compromised Facebook accounts are sending malicious links and attachments to people on their friends list. One of the significant reasons for hacking, malware infusion is best done when spread from multiple devices, similar to distributing spam. This reduces the chance of circling back the source to a single device which belongs to the hacker. Once brute forced, a system can spread malware via email attachments, sharing links, file upload via FTP, etc. Personal information such as credit card data, usage habits, private images and videos are all stored in our systems, be it in plain format or root folders. A compromised laptop means easy access to these information that can be further used to impersonate the victim regarding bank verification, among other things. Once a system is hacked, it can also be used as a mail server that distributes spam across lists of victims. Since the hacked machines all have different IP addresses and MAC addresses, it becomes challenging to trace the spam back to the original hacker. 
with so many harmful implications arising from a brute force attack, it's imperative that the general public must be protected against such. Let's learn about some of the ways we can prevent ourselves from becoming a victim of brute force attacks. Using passwords consisting of alphabets, letters and numbers have a much higher chance of withstanding brute force attacks thanks to the sheer number of combinations they can produce. The longer the password, the less likely it is that a hacker will devote the time and resources to brute force them. Having alphanumeric passwords also allows the user to keep different passwords for different websites. This is to ensure that if a single account or a password is compromised due to a breach or a hack, the rest of the accounts are isolated from the incident. Two-factor authentication involves receiving a one-time password on a trusted device before a new login is allowed. This OTB can be obtained either via email, SMS or specific 2FA applications like Authy and Aegis. Email and SMS based OTPs are considered relatively less secure nowadays due to the ease with which SIM cards can be duplicated and mailboxes can be hacked. Applications that are specifically made for 2FA cores are much more reliable and secure. CAPTCHAs are used to stop bots from running through web pages precisely to prevent brute forcing through their website. Since brute force tools are automated, forcing the hacker to solve CAPTCHA for every iteration of a password manually is very challenging. The CAPTCHA system can filter out these automated bots that keep refreshing the page with different credentials, thereby reducing the chances of brute force considerably. A definite rule that locks the account being hacked for 30 minutes after a specific number of attempts is a good way to prevent brute force attempts. Many websites lock account for 30 minutes after 3 failed password attempts to secure the account against any such attack. On an additional note, some websites also send an email instructing the user that there have been 3 insecure attempts to log into the website. Let's look at a demonstration of how brute force attacks work in a real world situation. The world has gone wireless. With Wi-Fi taking the reins in every household, it's natural that their security will always be up for debate. To further test the security index and understand brute force attacks, we will attempt to break into the password of a Wi-Fi router. For that to happen, we first need to capture a handshake file, which is a connection file from the Wi-Fi router to a connecting device like a mobile or a laptop. The operating system used for this process is Parrot Security, a Linux distribution that is catered to penetration testers. All the tools being used in this demo can easily be found pre-installed in this operating system. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit ScaleUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. To start our demo, we're going to use a tool called AirGeddon which is made to hack into wireless network specifically. At this point, it's going to check for all the necessary scripts that are installed in the system. To crack into a Wi-Fi and to capture the handshake file, we're going to need an external network card. The significance of the external network card is a managed mode and a monitor mode. For now, the WLX1 named card is my external network adapter, which I'm going to select. To be able to capture data over the air, we're going to need to put it in monitor mode. As you can see above, it's written it is in managed mode right now. So we're going to select option 2, which is to put the interface in monitor mode. And its name is now WLAN0 monitor. The monitor mode is necessary to capture data over the air. That is the necessary reason why we need an external card since a lot of inbuilt cards that come with the laptops and the systems, they cannot have a monitor mode installed. Once we select the mode, we can go into the fifth, which is the handshake tools menu. In the first step, we have to explore for targets and it is written that monitor mode is necessary to select a target. So let's explore for targets and press enter. We have to let this run for about 60 seconds to get a fair idea about the networks that are currently working in this locality. For example, this ESS ID is supposed to be the Wi-Fi name that we see when connecting to a network. 
Geo24, Recover Me. These are all the names that we see on our mobile when trying to search for the Wi Fi. This BSS ID is supposed to be an identifier, somewhat like a MAC address, that identifies this network from other devices. The channels features on one or two, or uh, there are some many channels that the networks can focus on. This here is supposed to be a client that is connected to one such network. For example, the station that you can see 5626 this is supposed to be the MAC address of the device that is connected to a router. This BSS ID is supposed to be which Wi-Fi it is connected to. For example 5895D8 is this one which is the Geo24 router. So we already know which router has a device connected to it and we can use our attack to capture this handshake. Now that we, it has already run for one minute, now that we press Ctrl C, we will be asked to select a target. See it has already selected the number 5 which is the Geo24 router as the one with clients. So it is easy to run an attack on and it is easy to capture a handshake for. We select network 5 and we run a capture handshake. It says we have a valid WPA WPA2 network target selected and that the script can continue. Now, to capture the handshake, we have a couple of attacks, a DAuth or a DAuth air replay attack. What this attack does is kick the clients out of the network. In return, when they try to reconnect to the Wi-Fi, as they are configured that way, that when a client is disconnected, it tries to reconnect it immediately, it tries to capture a handshake file, which in turn contains the security key, which is necessary to initiate the handshake. For our demo, let's go with the second option, that is the DAuth air replay attack. Select a timeout value, let's say we give it 60 seconds and we start the script. We can see it capturing data from the Geo24 network and here we go. We have the WPA handshake file. Once the handshake file is captured, we can actually close this and here we go, congratulations. In order to capturing a handshake, it has verified that a PMK ID from the target network has successfully been captured. This is the file that is already stored, the .cap file. For the path, we can, let's say we can keep it in a desktop. Okay, we give the path and the handshake file is generated. We can already see a target over here, same Geo24 router with the BSS ID. Now if we return to its main menu, we already have the handshake file captured with us. Now our job is to brute force into that handshake capture file. The capture file is often encrypted with the security key of the Wi-Fi network. If we know how to decrypt it, we will automatically get the security key. So let's go to the offline WPA WPA2 decrypt menu. Since we'll be cracking personal networks, we can go with option 1. Now to run the brute force tool, we have two options. Either we can go with the air crack or we can go with the hash cat. Let's go with air crack plus crunch, which is a brute force attack against a handshake file. We can go with option 2. It can already detect the capture file that we have generated. So we select yes. The BSS ID is the one which denotes the Geo24 router. So we're going to select yes as well. The minimum length of the key, for example, it has already checked that the minimum length of a Wi-Fi security key, which is a WPA to PSK key, will always be more than eight digits and below 64 digits. So we have to select something in between this range. So if we already know, let's say that the password is at least 10 digits, we can go with the minimum length as 10. and as a rough guess, let's say we put the maximum length as 20. The character set that we're going to use for checking the password will affect the time taken to brute force. For example, if we already know that or we have seen a user use the password while connecting to the router as something that has only numbers and symbols, then we can choose accordingly. Let's say if we go with only uppercase characters and numeric characters. Go with option 7 and it's going to start decrypting. So how aircrack is working right here, you can see this passphrase over here. 
the first five or six digits are a it starts working its way from the end from the last character it keeps trying every single combination you can see the last the fourth character from the right side the d it will eventually turn to e because it keeps checking up every single character from the end this will keep going on until all the single characters are tested and every single combination is tried out since the handshake file is encrypted using the security key that is the wpa2 key of the router whichever passphrase is able to decrypt the handshake key completely will be the key of the wi-fi router this is the way we can brute force into wi-fi routers anywhere in the world apart from individuals Organizations worldwide that host data and conduct business over the internet are always at the risk of a DDoS attack. These DDoS attacks are getting more extreme, with hackers getting easy access to botnet farms and compromised devices. As can be seen in the graph, three of the six strongest DDoS attacks were launched in 2021, with the most extreme attack occurring just last year in 2020. Lately, Cyber criminals have been actively seeking out new services and protocols for amplifying these DDoS attacks. Active involvement with hacked machines and botnets allow further penetration into the consumer space, allowing much more elaborate attack campaigns. Apart from general users, multinational corporations have also had their fair share of problems. GitHub, a platform for software developers, was the target of a DDoS attack in 2018. Widely suspected to be conducted by Chinese authorities, this attack went on for about 20 minutes after which the systems were brought into a stable condition. It was the strongest DDoS attack to date at the time and made a lot of companies reconsider the security practices to combat such attacks. Even after years of experimentation, DDoS attacks are still at large and can affect anyone in the consumer and corporate space. Hey everyone, this is Bebop from Simply Learn. And welcome to this video on what is a DDoS attack. Let's take a look at the topics we will be covering today. We start by learning what is a DDoS attack and how it works on a phase-by-phase -phase level. We learn about the distinct categories in DDoS attacks and the potential aim of hackers when they launch a DDoS attack campaign. We also look at some preventive measures that can be taken to protect oneself from these DDoS attacks. Finally, we have a demonstration of how such attacks can hamper the working of a server system using VMware and Parrot Security Operating System. But before moving forward, make sure you are subscribed to the Simply Learn YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to receive updates about more informative videos from our channel. So let's learn more about what is a DDoS attack. A Distributed Denial of Service Attack or DDoS is when an attacker or attackers attempt to make it impossible for a service to be delivered. This can be achieved by thwarting access to virtually anything – servers, devices, services, networks, applications, and even specific transactions within applications. In a DOS attack, it's one system that is sending the malicious data or requests. A DDoS attack comes from multiple systems. Generally, these attacks work by drowning a system with requests for data. This could be sending a web server so many requests to serve a page that it crashes under the demand or it could be a database being hit with a high volume of queries. The result is available internet bandwidth, CPU and RAM capacity become overwhelmed. The impact could range from a minor annoyance from disrupted services to experiencing entire websites, applications or even entire businesses taking offline. More often than not, these attacks are launched using machines in a botnet. A botnet is a network of devices that can be triggered to send requests from a remote source, often known as the command and control center. The bots in the network attack a particular target, thereby hiding the original perpetrator of the DDoS campaign. But how do these devices come under a botnet? And what are the requests being made to the web servers? Let's learn more about these and how DDoS attack work. A DDoS attack is a two-phase process. In the first phase, a hacker creates a botnet of devices. Simply put, a vast network of computers are hacked via malware, ransomware or just simple social engineering. These devices become a part of the botnet which can be triggered anytime to start bombarding a system or a server on the instruction of the hacker that created the botnet. The devices in these networks are called bots or zombies. In the second phase, 
A particular target is selected for the attack. When the hacker finds the right time to attack, all the zombies in the botnet network send these requests to the target, thereby taking up all the server's available bandwidth. These can be simple ping requests or complex attacks like SYN flooding and UDP flooding. The aim is to overwhelm them with more traffic than the server or the network can accommodate. The goal is to render the website or service inoperable. There is a lot of wiggle room when it comes to the type of DDoS attack a hacker can go with. Depending on the target's vulnerability, we can choose one of the three broad categories of DDoS attacks. Volume-based attacks use massive amounts of bogus traffic to overwhelm a resource. It can be a website or a server. They include ICMP, UDAP, and spoofed packet flood attacks. The size of volume-based attack is measured in bits per second. These attacks focus on clogging all the available bandwidth for the server, thereby cutting the supply short. Several requests are sent to the server, all of which warrant a reply, thereby not allowing the target to cater to the general legitimate users. Next, we have the protocol level attacks. These attacks are meant to consume essential resources of the target server. They exhaust the load balancers and firewalls which are meant to protect the system against the DDoS attacks. These protocol attacks include SYN floods and Smurf DDoS, among others, and the size is measured in packets per second. For example, in an SSL handshake, server replies to the hello message sent by the hacker, which will be the client in this case, but since the IP is spoofed and leads nowhere, the server gets stuck in an endless loop of sending the acknowledgement without any end in sight. Finally, we have the application level attacks. Application layer attacks are conducted by flooding applications with maliciously crafted requests. The size of application layer attacks is measured in requests per second. These are relatively sophisticated attacks that target the application and operating system level vulnerabilities. They prevent the specific applications from delivering necessary information to users and hog the network bandwidth up to the point of a system crash. Examples of such an attack are HTTP flooding and BGP hijacking. A single device can request data from a server using HTTP POST or GET without any issues. However, when the requisite botnet is instructed to bombard the server with thousands of requests, the database bandwidth gets jammed and it eventually becomes unresponsive and unusable. But what about the reasons for such an attack? There are multiple lines of thought as to why a hacker decides to launch a DDoS attack on unsuspecting targets. Let's take a look at a few of them. The first option is to gain a competitive advantage. Many DDoS attacks are conducted by hacking communities against rival groups. Some organizations hire such communities to stagger their rivals' resources at a network level to gain an advantage in the playing field. Since being a victim of a DDoS attack indicates a lack of security, the reputation of such a company takes a significant hit, allowing the rivals to cover up some ground. Secondly, some hackers launch these DDoS attacks to hold multinational corporations at ransom. The resources are jammed and the only way to clear the way is if the target company agrees to pay a designated amount of money to the hackers. Even a few minutes of inactivity is detrimental to a company's reputation in the global market and it can cause a spiral effect both in terms of market value and product security index. Most of the time, a compromise is reached and the resources are freed after a while. DDoS attacks have also found use in the political segment. Certain activists tend to use DDoS attacks to voice their opinion. Spreading the word online is much faster than any local rally or forum. Primarily political, these attacks also focus on online communities, ethical dilemmas, or even protests against corporations. Let's take a look at a few ways that companies and individuals can protect themselves against DDoS attacks. The company can employ load balancers and firewalls to help protect the data from such attacks. Load balancers reroute the traffic from one server to another in a DDoS attack. This reduces the single point of failure and adds resiliency to the server data. A firewall blocks unwanted traffic into a system and manages the number of requests made at a definite rate. It checks for multiple attacks from a single IP and occasional slowdowns to detect a DDoS attack in action. Early detection of a DDoS attack goes a long way in recovering the data lost in such an event. 
Once you've detected the attack, you will have to find a way to respond. For example, you will have to work on dropping the malicious DDoS traffic before it reaches your server so that it doesn't throttle and exhaust your bandwidth. Here's where you will filter the traffic so that only legitimate traffic reaches the server. By intelligent routing, you can break the remaining traffic into manageable chunks that can be handled by your cluster resources. The most important stage in DDoS mitigation is where you will look for patterns of DDoS attacks and use those to analyze and strengthen your mitigation techniques. For example, blocking an IP that's repeatedly found to be offending is a first step. Cloud providers like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure who offer high levels of cybersecurity, including firewalls and threat monitoring software can help protect your assets and network from DDoS criminals. The cloud also has greater bandwidth than most private networks, so it is likely to fail if under the pressure of increased DDoS attacks. Additionally, reputable cloud providers offer network redundancy, duplicating copies of your data, systems and equipment so that if your service becomes corrupted or unavailable due to a DDoS attack, you can switch to a secure access on backed up versions without missing a beat. One can also increase the amount of bandwidth available to a host server being targeted. Since DDoS attacks fundamentally operate on the principle of overwhelming systems with heavy traffic, simply provisioning extra bandwidth to handle unexpected traffic spikes can provide a measure of protection. This solution can prove expensive as a lot of that bandwidth is going to go unused most of the time. A content delivery network or a CDN distributes your content and boost performance by minimizing the distance between your resources and end users. It stores the cached version of your content in multiple locations and this eventually mitigates DDoS attacks by avoiding a single point of failure when the attacker is trying to focus on a single target. Popular CDNs include Akamai CDN, Cloudflare, AWS CloudFront, etc. Let's start with our demo regarding the effects of DDoS attacks on a system. For our demo, we have a single device that will attack a target, making it a DOS attack of sorts. Once a botnet is ready, multiple devices can do the same and eventually emulate a DDoS attack. To do so, we will use the virtualization software called VMware with an instance of Parrot Security Operating System running. For a target machine, we will be running another VMware instance of a standard Linux distribution known as Linux Lite. In a target device, we can use Wireshark to determine when the attack begins and see the effects of the attack accordingly. This is Linux Lite, which is our target machine and this is Parrot Security which is used by the hacker when trying to launch a DDoS attack. This is just one of the distros that can be used. To launch the attack we must first find the IP address of our target. So to find the IP address we open the terminal we use the command ifconfig and here we can find the IP address. Now remember, we're launching this attack in VMware. Now the, both the instances of Parrot Security and Linux Lite are being run on my local network. So the address that you can see here is 192.168.72.129 which is a private address. This IP cannot be accessed from outside the network. Basically anyone who is not connected to my Wi-Fi. When launching attacks with public servers or public addresses, it will have a public IP address that does not belong to the 192.168 subnet. Once we have the IP address, we can use a tool called HPing3. HPing3 is an open source packet generator and analyzer for the TCP IP protocol. To check what are the effects of an attack, we will be using Wireshark. Wireshark is a network traffic analyzer. We can see whatever traffic that is passing through the Linux Lite distro is being displayed over here with the IP address, the source IP and the destination IP as to where the request is being transferred to. Once we have the DOS attack launched, you can see the results coming over here from the source IP which will be Parrot Security. Now, to launch the HPing3 command, we need to give sudo access to the console which is the root access.
Now we have the root access for the console. The hping3 command will have a few arguments to go with it which are as you can see on the screen minus s and a flood a hyphen v hyphen p18 and the IP address of the target which is 192.168.72.129 in this command we have a few arguments this, such as the minus s which specifies syn packets like in an SSL handshake we have the syn request that the client sends to the server to initiate a connection the hyphen flood aims to ignore the replies that the server will send back to the client in response to the SYN packets. Here the Parrot Security OS is the client and Linux Lite being the server. Minus V stands for verbosity as in where we will see some output when the requests are being sent. The hyphen P80 stands for port 80 which we can replace the port number if we want to attack a different port. And finally we have the IP address of our target. As of right now if we check Wireshark it is relatively clear and there is no indication of a DDoS attack incoming. Now once we launch the attack over here we can see the uh, request coming in from this IP which is 192.168.72.128 till now even if the network is responsive and so is Linux Lite. The requests keep on coming and we can see the HTTP flooding has started in flood mode. After a few seconds of this attack continuing, the server will start shutting down. Now remember Linux Lite is a distro that can focus on and that serves as a backend. Now remember Linux Lite is a distro and such Linux distros are served as backend to many servers across the world. For example, a few seconds have passed from the attack. Now the system has become completely irresponsive. This has happened due to the huge number of requests that came from Parrot Security. You can see whatever I press, nothing is responded. Even the Wireshark has stopped capturing new requests because the CPU usage right now is completely 100% and at this point of time, anyone who is trying to request some information from this Linux distro or where this Linux distro is being used as a backend for a server or a database cannot access anything else. The system has completely stopped responding and any request, any legitimate request from legitimate users will be dropped. Once we stop the attack over here, it takes a bit of time to settle down. Now remember, it's still out of control, but eventually the traffic dies down and the system regains its strength. It is relatively easy to gauge right now the effect of a DOS attack. Now remember, this Linux Lite is just a VM instance. Actual website servers and web databases, they have much more bandwidth and are very secure and it is tough to break into. That is why we cannot use a single machine to break into them. That is where a DDoS attack comes into play. What we did right now is a DOS attack as in a single system is being used to penetrate a sub target server using a single request. Now, when a DDoS attack, multiple systems such as multiple parrot security instances or multiple zombies or bots in a botnet network can attack a target server to completely shut down the machine and drop any legitimate request thereby rendering the service and the target completely unusable and inoperable. As a final note, we would like to remind that this is for educational purposes only and we do not endorse any attacks on any domains. Only test this on servers and networks that you have permission to test on. The important question is how to become a certified ethical hacker. In order to become a certified ethical hacker, you need to pass the certified ethical hacker or the CEH exam from EC Council, which tests the broad knowledge of subject matter that is required for someone to be an effective ethical hacker. Well, since its inception in 2003, the certified ethical hacker has been the absolute choice of the industry globally. It is recognized worldwide and has been endorsed by governmental agencies like the NSA, 
the ch exam is also is accredited by nc which adds credibility and value to the credential members the ch exam is computerized proctored exam you'll have four hours to complete 125 questions there are some sources of information that mentions that in order to pass you need to score about 60 to 80 percent the actual percentage of questions that you must answer correctly varies from exam to exam and depends on the difficulty of the exams delivered when you take the exam the harder the questions that are asked the fewer questions you need to get right to pass the exam if you get easier questions then you will need to get more of the questions right to pass the exam however keep in mind that when you take the actual exam at the testing center the passing grade may vary the ceh certification exam cost five hundred dollars plus an additional eligibility fee of hundred dollars the exam duration is for four hours the questions are all multiple choice the exam is only available in english as of today candidates can take the ceh exam online using a remotely proctored service from anywhere in the world 24 7 as long as they have a computer equipped with a webcam and a microphone let's discuss the exam outline the exam is broken into seven domains networking and information background covers about 22 percent analysis assessment covers 12 percent security covers 23 percent tools system programs 29 percent procedures methodology 9 percent regulation policy 2 percent and ethics 3 percent let's discuss these domains a little more in detail networking and information background this first domain of the ceh exam is designed to test your knowledge of everything that you need to know to practice ethical hacking which isn't specific to any information security domain the objectives of this domain include network and communication technologies next is information security threats and attack vector such as malwares OWASP top 10 etc the final objective covers information security technologies such as mobile technologies telecommunication technologies backups archiving etc analysis assessment this domain of the certified ethical hacker exam is designed to test your knowledge of what goes into performing a penetration test or ethical hacking the objectives of this domain are information security assessment and analysis and information security assessment process combination of ethics and regulation policy domains covers five percent of the total exam weightage the objectives of these domains are ethics of information security which covers what is considered ethical and unethical from the perspective of the ceh certification not only you will be expected to behave ethically you will be expected to adhere to a code of ethics next objective is information security policies laws acts which covers some of the major information security regulations and the evaluation of organizational security policies this is an important procedures methodology this is an important domain and carries a weightage of nine percent there are two objectives the first objective covers information security procedures which is the step-by-step -step methods that is used to identify prevent and enforce security controls against unwanted behavior the next objective is information security assessment methodologies which covers security assessments to determine security gaps that may pose a risk to the organization tools systems programs this domain carries the maximum weightage of 29 percent and so you should expect the maximum number of questions from here this domain is heavily focused on knowledge of the specific systems programs and tools used in ethical hacking there are three objectives first objective covers information security systems such as firewalls intrusion detection and prevention systems siem solutions etc next objective covers information security programs that are used to secure a host system against malicious attackers these programs include antivirus anti-spyware 
anti-risk wear, ad blockers, anti-root kit, etc. The final objective covers information security tools used for performing footprinting and reconnaissance, performing enumeration, conducting network scanning, performing web application hacking, etc. The security domain is the second largest domain on the exam with 23% weightage. This domain is divided into three objectives. The first objective covers information security controls such as administrative controls, technical controls and physical controls. The second objective, information security attack detection, covers various methods to detect attacks against an organization's information security. The final objective, information security attack prevention, covers proactive methods that organizations can use to protect themselves from malicious attackers. From malicious attacks. Let us understand the importance of the CA certification before getting to know about its content. So why should you take up the CH version 11? The Certified Ethical Hacker is the most trusted ethical hacking certification and a recommended one by employers around the globe. Since the introduction of the CH certification in 2003, it is globally recognized as a standard within the information security field. The CH version 11 by EC Council continues to keep up to the standard and it familiarizes the latest hacking techniques and teaches you advanced hacking tools and exploits used. The CH version 11 aligns with the current cybersecurity market requirements and adds the latest advancements in the cybersecurity field. The CH certification helps and trains you to think like a hacker and this in turn helps you beat a hacker and defend your network. After obtaining the CH certification, you'll be a certified ethical hacker. A certified ethical hacker is a skilled professional working in a red team environment who safeguards networks and understands attack strategies and mimics the skills of malicious hackers. Certified ethical hackers discover vulnerabilities in a system and operate with permission from the system owners only. So who can become a certified ethical hacker and who can take up the CH certification? Let us have a look at that now. In the first case, to be eligible for the CH certification exam, you need to attend the official training from authorized EC Council training partners. It can be an online training or tutor-led training from EC Council learning partners. Only then are you eligible to take up the CH certification exam. So a candidate who has completed an official EC Council training is eligible to take up the exam without going through the application process. Or in the second case, in order to be considered for this credential, you need to have at least two years of work experience in the information security domain and you must pay a non-refundable application fee and submit an eligibility application form. Once it is approved, you can take up the CH exam. After the application is approved, you can purchase the test voucher. In the latest version of the CH, we will see the addition of various core concepts. Moving on to our next topic, let us see how different the CH version 11 is and few of its objectives. Firstly, it outlines ethical hacking concepts, cyber kill chain concepts, an overview of information security and various laws and regulations related to information security. This certification briefs you about the phases of system hacking, attacking techniques and how you can maintain access. It also briefs you about footprinting concepts and ways of utilizing footprinting tools along with necessary countermeasures. The next objective is to familiarize with vulnerability assessment along with the hands-on experience of various scanning tools. Next, we have cybersecurity threats like malware threats, analysis of various worms, viruses and trojans. Various malware concepts, packet sniffing concepts and techniques have been introduced into this domain. It also highlights the concepts related to social engineering, denial of service attacks, SQL injection, and evasion techniques. It also speaks about wireless hacking concepts and mobile device management. The concept of operational technology is a new addition this time. Next is getting acquainted with security solutions like firewalls, honeypots, IPS, their evasion, and protection. Our fifth point is knowing various topics in cryptography like encryption algorithms, public key infrastructure, and cryptanalysis. Moving on, the next objective is to incorporate Parrot Security OS as it offers better performance on lower-powered laptops and machines when compared to Kali Linux. 
Next is to learn to recognize and deal with IoT-based vulnerabilities and attacks with the CH version 11 course that covers the latest IoT hacking tools. You would be required to ensure the safety of IoT devices. Our next point is with respect to the evolving cloud industry. You would need to learn how to identify and defend cloud-based threats and attacks. The latest version of CH includes new operating systems and Windows 10 configured with domain controller and vulnerable web applications for improving hacking skills. Finally, what is different is that more than 50% of the CH version 11 course is dedicated to practical skills in live ranges via EC Council Labs. EC Council leads in this aspect of the industry. Now that we saw the CH exam objectives, let us look into the CH exam topics weightage. As you see on your screens, this is a pie chart with 9 domains in CH along with their weightages. You can prepare for your exam accordingly. Let us move on and take a closer look at each of these domains, their respective subdomains and their descriptions. Our first domain is Information Security and Ethical Hacking Overview. This domain consists of questions from Information Security, Cyber Kill Chain Concepts, Ethical Hacking Concepts, Various Hacking Concepts, and Information Security Laws and Standards. You can expect a total number of 8 questions from this domain. The weightage of this section is 6%. The second domain is Reconnaissance Techniques. Under the subdomains, we have footprinting and reconnaissance at first. This covers various topics like footprinting concepts, footprinting methodology, email footprinting, footprinting through web services, DNS footprinting, footprinting through social engineering, etc. The next subdomain in this section is scanning networks. Scanning networks covers various concepts like scanning tools, host discovery, port and service discovery, OS discovery, draw network diagrams, scanning beyond IDS, firewall, etc. And our third subdomain under reconnaissance techniques is enumeration. Various topics like SNMP enumeration, NTP and NFS enumeration, SMTP and DNS enumeration, and enumeration countermeasures are covered under this subdomain. A total of 26 questions will be asked from this domain. Under footprinting and reconnaissance, you will have 10 questions and under scanning networks another 10, and finally under enumeration you'll have 6 questions. A total weightage of 21% is given to this particular topic. Our third domain is System Hacking Faces and Attack Techniques. Under our third domain, our first subdomain is about Vulnerability Analysis. This subdomain covers topics on Vulnerability Assessment, Vulnerability Classification, Vulnerability Assessment Solutions and Tools, and various Vulnerability Assessment Reports. Our next subdomain is about system hacking. You have concepts like gaining access, cracking passwords, vulnerability exploitation, escalating privileges, maintaining access covered under this subdomain. And finally, we have malware threats under this domain. Malware threats incorporate concepts like APT concepts, Trojan concepts, virus and worm concepts, malware analysis, and so on. A total of 21 questions will be asked from this domain. Under Vulnerability Analysis, there will be 9 questions asked, System Hacking another 6 questions and finally under Malware Threats, you will have 6 other questions asked. That sums up to a total 21 with a weightage of 17% for this domain. Our fourth domain is about Network and Perimeter Hacking. Here, you have various subdomains and one of it is Social Engineering. Under social engineering, you will be asked questions based on social engineering techniques, insider threats, impersonation on social, networking sites, identity theft, and so on. You will also have various questions on the sniffing concepts as it is another subdomain. You can also expect questions from the denial of service subdomain. Here, questions related to botnets and DDoS attacks will be asked. Various session hijacking concepts are another crucial part of this domain. The final subdomain is about evading IDS firewalls and honeypots. Here, various concepts on IDS, IPS, firewall and honeypots are covered. You will need to understand how to evade IDS and firewalls and how to detect honeypots. A total number of 18 questions will be asked from the fourth domain that was network and perimeter hacking and the weightage for this domain is 14%. Our fifth domain is about web application hacking and our first subdomain in it is hacking web servers. 
This incorporates concepts related to web server attacks, web server attack tools, patch management, and so on. The next subdomain is about hacking web applications. Here, you have various concepts related to bypass client-side controls, analyze web applications, footprint web infrastructure, attack access controls, and how to perform injection attacks, and so on. Finally, under the SQL injection subdomain, you will have questions based on SQL injection, the types of SQL injection, the SQL injection methodology, SQL injection tools, evasion techniques, and SQL injection countermeasures. Here, a total of 20 questions will be asked from this domain. And that is, a weightage of 16% will be given to the web application hacking domain. Our sixth domain is solely devoted to wireless network hacking. This domain focuses on hacking wireless networks, various wireless concepts, wireless encryption, wireless threats, wireless hacking tools, various hacking methodologies, Bluetooth hacking, and wireless countermeasures are covered. A total of 8 questions will be asked from this domain with a weightage of 6%. Our seventh domain is all about mobile platform IoT and OT hacking. Our first subdomain here is hacking mobile platforms. Here, the concepts that are touched upon are mobile platform attack vectors, hacking Android OS, hacking iOS, mobile device management, and mobile security guidelines and tools. Our next subdomain here is about IoT and OT hacking, which covers concepts on IoT hacking tools, its methodologies, countermeasures, and it also speaks about OT concepts, OT attacks, OT hacking tools, and OT countermeasures. You have a total of 10 questions asked from this domain with a weightage of 8%. The next domain is very interesting and it is all related to cloud. The cloud computing domain covers concepts based on cloud computing, serverless computing, cloud computing threats, cloud hacking, and cloud security. The weightage given to this domain is 6% with a total number of questions of 7. And finally, we have cryptography as our ninth domain. As the name suggests, this domain covers topics based on cryptography concepts, encryption algorithms, cryptography tools, public key infrastructure, email encryption, disk encryption, crypt analysis, and countermeasures. And seven questions will be asked from this domain with a weightage of 6%. Now that you saw the CH exam topics weightage, let us have a closer look at the CH exam details. Let us first have a look at the CH exam based on MCQs. The exam title is Certified Ethical Hacker with the exam code of 312-50. This exam will have 125 questions with a time limit of 4 hours. The test format is multiple choice questions. The pass percentage varies ideally between 60% to 85%. Now let's have a look at the CH practical exam details. In order to gain the CH master recognition, it is mandatory that you take up the CH practical exam as well. The exam title is Certified Ethical Hacker Practical and this practical exam will have 20 questions with a duration of 6 hours. The exam format will be iLab Cyber Range and finally the passing score for the CH practical exam is at 70%. After clearing both the MCQ based exam and the practical exam, you can get the CH master recognition. Now that we had a look at the CH exam details, let us have a look at the career prospects for a professional with this certification. Let's look at the critical skills you need to become a certified ethical hacker. First is coding. Ethical hackers should have an excellent grasp of the various programming languages and understand the coding techniques to gain access to any software. It will help you understand the tools hackers develop to infiltrate a security system. Some of the popular coding languages ethical hackers need to know are Python, JavaScript, PHP and SQL. Coming to the second skill, so ethical hackers should know the basics of different operating systems, specifically Linux as it is more secure than any other operating system. Most web servers run on Linux operating system. Gaining access to this server to check for faults is another must-have skill for ethical hackers. Now they also need to understand how firewalls work as well. Coming to the third skill. So to become an ethical hacker, you must understand both wired and wireless networks. They must know networks like DHCP, NAT and subnetting to investigate the different interconnected machines in a network and the possible security threats that this may create. Now moving on to the fourth skill, having good knowledge of wireless technologies like Wired Equivalent Privacy or WEP, Wi-Fi Protected Access or WPA and Wi-Fi Protected Setup or WPS 
will help ethical hackers guard systems against sending information via hidden streams. Ethical hackers need to grasp how to write SQL statements for in-band, out-of-band and blind SQL attacks which can swiftly compromise a database operation and the data it holds. Cryptography deals with transforming a normal text message to a non-readable form during the transmission to make it incomprehensible for hackers. An ethical hacker ensures that conversation between different people within the organization does not leak. Now coming to the final skill, ethical hackers additionally require analytical thinking and problem solving skills to succeed at this job. They should be able to reverse engineer security frameworks, come up with uncommon ways to break into a network. This also requires thinking outside the box. Now companies across various industries hire ethical hackers for several job roles. So once you become a certified ethical hacker, you can get into multiple job roles. Let's look at a few of them. First we have security analyst. The security analysts execute security systems to safeguard the organization's networks, data and also help to maintain security standards. They document the security breaches and measure the damage caused. Security analysts also analyze the security issues thoroughly to identify the root cause. The second job role we have is penetration tester. So penetration testers conduct tests and purposefully try to exploit existing computer systems and software to identify and correct system weaknesses. They implement solutions to enhance data security and provide recommendations based on an assessment of hardware and software systems. The third job role we have for a certified ethical hacker is security engineer. So security engineers understand complicated technical issues and manage them with a fast paced business environment. They also conduct proactive research to investigate security vulnerabilities and recommend suitable strategies. And finally, we have the job role of a security consultant. Cybersecurity consultants are highly in demand today and are amongst the heavily paid professionals. A cybersecurity consultant is responsible for protecting sensitive data that come from various aspects of the digital world. They evade security risks and prevent cyber attacks. Security consultants study security criteria or cybersecurity criteria, security systems and validation procedures. Now before we go further, I have another question for you people. So which role do you think is the most exciting? Do let us know your responses in the comment section of the video. We would be glad to hear from you. Now moving ahead. With the increasing number of cyber attacks across the globe, ethical hackers are in demand like never before. Very recently, a United Nations official warned that cybercrime went up by 600% during the COVID-19 pandemic. As per the government data presented in parliament, India alone reported 1.16 million cyber attacks in 2020. That's almost 3x times more than 2019. Now, according to Cybersecurity Ventures, cyber threats will cost nearly 6 trillion US dollars in 2021. Cybersecurity Ventures also expects global cybercrime costs will grow up by 15% per year over the next 5 years and reach 10.5 trillion US dollars annually by 2025. Now there is a huge shortage of ethical hacking professionals globally. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the information security industry is expected to grow 32% in the next decade. Another report by Cybersecurity Ventures tells that the world will have 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs by the end of 2021. According to a report by the Data Security Council of India, the Indian cybersecurity services industry is expected to grow to about $7.6 billion in 2022 and would be worth $13.6 billion by 2025. So companies are looking for trained ethical hackers who can protect their networks and safeguard them from potential threats. A few of the industries that heavily rely on ethical hackers are healthcare companies, financial institutions, energy companies and government agencies. With ample opportunities lying ahead, what's stopping you from starting a career in cybersecurity? And before we begin with the course, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity by graduating from the best universities, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity. 
with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. And the course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. So we'll start with the first question that is what is CRF or you can say the interviewer asks can you explain what CSRF in the context of cybersecurity? and we can answer that certainly CSRF stands for cross site request forgery. It is a type victim is authenticated. The attack takes advantage of the trust a website has in the authenticated user's browser. Now we'll see how it works. So security vulnerability that occurs when an attacker tricks a victim into performing an unwanted action on a website or web application in which the attacker creates a malicious website or injects malicious code into a legitimate website that the victim visits. And when the victim visits the attacker's website or the compromised legitimate website, the malicious code can execute without the victim's knowledge. The malicious code sends a request to the targeted website or application on behalf of the victim. This request may include sensitive actions like changing the victim's password, making financial transactions or modifying personal information. Since the request originates from the victim's browser, the targeted website or application considers it legitimate and processes the request. The victim's account is compromised and the attacker gains unauthorized access or performs unwanted actions. To protect against CSRF attacks, web developers can implement several countermeasures, including using anti-CSRF tokens. Using anti-CSRF tokens, web applications can generate and include unique tokens in each form or request. These tokens are verified by the server before processing the action, ensuring that the request originated from the same website. The next is same site cookies attribute. Web developers can set the same site attribute on cookies, which prevents them from being sent with cross site request, thus reducing the risk of CSRF attacks. Verifying the origin header. Servers can check the origin header to ensure the request originates from the same domain. The next is implementing strict access control. Web applications should enforce strict access controls and authorization mechanisms to ensure that only authorized actions can be performed. And the next measure can be by implementing these countermeasures, organizations can significantly reduce the risk of CSRF attacks and protect their users' sensitive information and accounts. And the next question is, that is the most important question which interviewer asks, that is difference between XSS and CSRF. So XS, that is XSS cross-site scripting and CSRF cross-site request forgery are both common web application vulnerabilities but they differ in their nature and the risk they pose. So access is a vulnerability that occurs when an attacker injects malicious scripts into a trusted website which is then executed by the user's browser. This can happen when the website does not properly validate or sanitize user input. The injected scripts can be used to steal sensitive information such as login credentials or session cookies and can also be used to modify the content of the website or redirect users to malicious websites. CSRF on the other hand is a type of attack where an attacker tricks a user's browser into making unintended or unauthorized requests to a website. This attack relies on the fact that many websites use cookies or other mechanisms for session management and these cookies are automatically sent with every request made to the website. By tricking a user into visiting a specially crafted website or clicking on a malicious link, the attacker can perform actions on behalf of the user without their knowledge or consent, potentially leading to unauthorized actions, data manipulation, or account compromise. In summary, XSS is concerned with injecting and executing malicious scripts within a website, while CSRF involves tricking users into performing unintended actions on a trusted website. Both vulnerabilities can have serious consequences and it is important for web developers to understand and mitigate these risks through proper input validation, output encoding and security mechanisms such as CSRF tokens and secure session management. Now moving to next question, is XSS client-side attack or server-side attack? So XSS, that is cross-site scripting, attack can occur on the client-side, which means it targets vulnerabilities in the user's web browser or the client application. This type of attack takes advantage of security weaknesses in the client-side code, allowing an attacker to inject malicious scripts into a trusted website or web application. Once the script is executed by the user's browser, it can lead to unauthorized actions, data theft or other malicious activities. And it's important to note that while XSS attacks primarily target the client-side, they can have significant consequences on the server-side as well. 
the injected script may interact with the server or exploit vulnerabilities in the server side code to perform actions on behalf of the attacker. Therefore, XSS attacks can have an impact on both the client and server components of a web application security. And the next question is what is IOC? In cybersecurity, IOC stands for indicators of compromise. These are pieces of evidence or artifacts that suggest the presence of malicious activity or a security breach within a system or network. IOCs are used to identify, detect, and respond to potential security incidents. There are several types of IOCs that security professionals look for. The most common types include file based IOCs, these include malicious files such as malware, executables, scripts, or documents that have been identified as part of a cyber attack. File based IOCs can be identified through file hashes, file names, or specific file content. The next is network based IOCs. These indicators relate to network traffic associated with malicious activities. They can include suspicious IP addresses, domain names, URLs, or patterns of network communications that indicate a potential security threat. The next we have is behavioral IOCs. These indicators are based on abnormal behavior exhibited by users, systems, or applications. For example, a sudden increase in failed login attempts, unusual file access patterns, or unauthorized system modifications can serve as behavioral IOCs. The next is registry or system configuration IOCs. These indicators involve changes or additions to the Windows registry, system configuration files, or other system settings. Attackers may alter these configurations to gain persistence on a compromised system. The next is Threat Intelligence IOCs. These IOCs are derived from external sources, such as cybersecurity vendors, government agencies, or threat intelligence platforms. They provide information about known malicious actors, their tactics, techniques, and procedures, and specific indicators associated with their activities. When organizations collect and analyze IOCs, they can proactively detect and respond to security incidents. By monitoring for these indicators, security teams can identify potential threats, investigate the scope of an attack, and take appropriate measures to mitigate the risk. It's worth noting that IOCs are not static and continuously evolve as attackers develop new techniques. Therefore, staying up to date with the latest threat intelligence and sharing information within the cybersecurity community is crucial for effective defense against cyber threats. And now moving to another question that is fifth question. And it is that can you explain the difference between antivirus and EDR in cybersecurity? So antivirus and endpoint detection and response that is EDR are both important components in cybersecurity but they serve different purposes. We'll see them that is first antivirus that is also known as anti-malware software. It is designed to detect, prevent, and remove known types of malicious software such as viruses, worms, trojans, and ransomware. It relies on signature-based detection where it compares the code patterns or files or programs against a database of known malware signatures. When a match is found, the antivirus software takes appropriate action to quarantine or delete the infected file. On the other hand, the EDR goes beyond traditional antivirus solutions by providing real-time monitoring detection and response capabilities at the endpoint level. EDR solutions are designed to detect and respond to sophisticated and advanced threats that may evade traditional antivirus software. They use a combination of techniques including behavioral analysis, machine learning, and threat intelligence to identify malicious activities and potential threats. EDR solutions continuously monitor endpoints such as workstations, servers, and mobile devices for any suspicious activities or anomalous behavior. They collect and analyze vast amounts of endpoint data including process executions, network connections, file changes, and system configurations to identify potential security incidents. If a threat is detected, EDR solutions provide detailed visibility into the incident allowing security teams to investigate, contain, and respond to the threat in real time. While antivirus focuses on known threats and relies on signature-based detection, EDR solutions are more proactive and capable of identifying previously unseen or zero-day threats. They offer enhanced threat hunting capabilities, allowing security analysts to search for indicators of compromise that is, IOCs, and identify potential vulnerabilities or security gaps in the environment. In summary, antivirus is an essential component in protecting against known malware. While EDR provides advanced threat detection, real-time monitoring, and incident response capabilities,
to defend against sophisticated and emerging threats. Combining both antivirus and EDS solutions can significantly enhance an organization's overall cybersecurity posture. Now, moving to another question that is IPS versus firewall. That is, can you explain the difference between IPS and a firewall in cybersecurity? So, an IPS, that is, intrusion prevention system, and a firewall are two distinct but complementary security mechanisms. Let's see the differences between them. So, a firewall acts as a barrier between an internal network and external network, typically the internet. It examines incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predefined rules or policies. Its primary function is to enforce access controls and permit or deny network traffic based on factors such as IP addresses, ports, protocols, and application types. Firewalls work at the network layer, layer 3, or the transport layer, layer 4, of the network stack. On the other hand, an IPS is designed to detect and prevent network-based attacks. It goes beyond the basic access control functions of a firewall. An IPS monitors network traffic in real-time, searching for signs of known attack patterns or suspicious behavior. It can detect and block unauthorized access attempts, malware, network intrusions, and other malicious activities. IPS systems are typically placed in line with network traffic and can operate at the network layer, that is layer 3, transport layer, layer 4, or even the application layer, that is layer 7. To summarize, a firewall acts as a gatekeeper, controlling the flow of traffic into and out of a network based on predefined rules. It focuses on access control. On the other hand, an IPS is a more advanced security mechanism that actively inspects network traffic, identifies potential threats or attacks and takes action to prevent them. It focuses on detecting and preventing intrusions. In practice, organizations often use both firewalls and IPS systems together to provide layered security. Firewalls protect against unauthorized access and filter out unwanted traffic while IPS systems add an additional layer of protection by actively monitoring and blocking malicious activities. So this was all for firewall and IPS. Now moving to what is security misconfiguration. So, security misconfiguration refers to the improper or insecure configuration of systems, software, applications, or network components that can lead to potential security vulnerabilities. It occurs when security settings, permissions, or configurations are not appropriately defined or implemented, leaving systems and data exposed to potential attacks or unauthorized access. Security misconfiguration can take various forms, such as using default or weak passwords, leaving unnecessary services or ports open not applying necessary security patches or updates, misconfiguring access controls or failing to implement secure communication protocols. These misconfigurations can provide attackers with entry points into a system, allowing them to exploit vulnerabilities, gain unauthorized access or carry out malicious activities. Organizations often face security misconfigurations due to human error, lack of awareness or inadequate security practices. It's crucial to regularly review and audit system configurations, employ secure defaults, disable unnecessary features, follow security best practices, and stay updated with the latest patches and updates. By addressing security misconfigurations, organizations can significantly reduce their attack surface and enhance the overall security posture of their systems and networks. So moving on to next question, that is what is WAF and its types. So, WAF stands for Web Application Firewall. It is a security measure used to protect web applications from various types of cyber attacks. A WAF acts as a filter between the web application and the external network, monitoring and analyzing incoming and outgoing web traffic. There are primarily two types of WAFs commonly used in cybersecurity that are network based WAF. This type of WAF is implemented at the network parameter, typically as a dedicated hardware appliance or a virtual appliance. It intercepts web traffic before it reaches the web application server. And network-based WFs examine packets at the network layer, inspecting IP addresses, ports, and protocols to detect and prevent malicious activities. They are effective in protecting multiple web applications hosted on the same network infrastructure. And the next is host-based WF. This type of WF is installed directly on the web application server or within the application itself. It operates at the application layer and has a deep understanding of the application structure and logic. Host-based WFs monitor and analyze HTTP, HTTPS traffic inspecting the content of requests and responses. They are often integrated as a module or a plugin within the web server or the application framework. 
host based WAFs provide granular control and can protect specific applications or modules within a server. Both network based and host based WAFs have their strength and can complement each other for enhanced security. Network based WAFs are suitable for large scale protection across multiple applications and servers, while host based WAFs offer more precise control and visibility into application specific vulnerabilities and attacks. It's important to note that while WFs are valuable in safeguarding web applications, they should be used in conjunction with other security measures like regular application patching, secure coding practices, and vulnerability assessments to ensure comprehensive protection against evolving cyber threats. Now we'll see another question. That is, could you please explain the difference between blue teaming and red teaming? So blue teaming and red teaming are two distinct approaches used in cybersecurity to enhance the overall security posture of an organization. And blue teaming primarily focuses on defense and proactive measures. Blue teams are responsible for protecting the organization's assets, systems, and data from potential threats and attacks. They typically include cybersecurity professionals within the organizations who work to identify vulnerabilities, monitor networks, and implement security controls. Blue teams conduct risk assessments, perform security audits, and develop incident response plans. They also monitor security systems, analyze logs, and use various tools to detect and mitigate threats. Essentially, blue teams act as a defenders, ensuring that the organization's defenses are strong and resilient. On the other hand, red teaming takes an offensive approach. Red teams are independent groups or individuals who stimulate real-world cyber attacks to evaluate the effectiveness of the organization's security controls and practices. Their goal is to identify weaknesses, gaps, and vulnerabilities in the system. Red teams use tactics similar to those of real attackers, such as social engineering, penetration testing, and vulnerability assessments to uncover potential security flaws. By adopting the perspective of an attacker, red teams provide valuable insights into the organization's security vulnerabilities, allowing the blue team to improve their defenses. In summary, blue teaming is focused on defense, while red teaming is focused on offense. Blue teams work to prevent and mitigate cyber threats, while red teams act as adversaries to identify weaknesses and improve the organization's security. The collaboration between blue and red team is crucial in maintaining a strong security posture and effectively protecting sensitive information. So this was all. That is the difference between blue teaming and red teaming. Now moving on to the 10th question that is what is false positive and false negative in case of IDS. So in the context of intrusion detection system that is IDS, false positive and false negative are two important terms used to describe the accuracy of the system in identifying and classifying security events. A false positive occurs when an IDS incorrectly identifies a banning activity or event as malicious. On the other hand, a false negative happens when an IDS fails to detect an actual malicious activity or event. It occurs when an intrusion or attack goes unnoticed and is not flagged by the system. This can be quite dangerous as it allows malicious activities to go undetected, potentially causing harm to the system or network. Ideally, an IDS should strive to minimize both false positives and false negatives. However, there is often a trade-off between the two. Increasing the sensitivity of an IDS to reduce false negatives may result in more false positives, and vice versa. Balancing the detection accuracy is crucial to ensure that genuine threats are identified while minimizing the number of false alarms. So to improve the effectiveness of an IDS, continuously monitoring, fine-tuning of detection rules, and incorporating machine learning algorithms can be employed. Additionally, it's important for security teams to carefully analyze and validate alerts to distinguish between false positive and true threats ensuring efficient incident response and mitigation. Now moving to another question that is what is TLD? So TLD stands for top level domain in the field of cybersecurity. In the context of the internet, a top level domain refers to the last segment of a domain name located after the final load. It is also commonly known as domain extension. Example of TLDs include .com, .org, .net, .gov, .edu and country specific TLDs like .uk, .fr, or .au. TLDs play a significant role in cybersecurity as they help identify the purpose or category of a website. Cybersecurity professionals often analyze TLDs to assess potential security risk or determine the legitimacy of a domain. Malicious actors may exploit certain TLDs such as those associated with phishing, 
malware distribution or fraudulent activities. Security measures like blacklisting or filtering can be implemented based on TLDs to protect users from accessing potentially harmful websites. Overall, understanding TLDs is essential in the cybersecurity field as it aids in identifying and evaluating potential threats, enhancing website security and safeguarding users' online experiences. So this was all about TLD. So the next question is, can you explain what name servers are in the context of cybersecurity? So in the realm of cybersecurity, name servers play a crucial role in functioning of the internet. A name server, also known as a DNS server, domain name system, is responsible for translating human-readable domain names such as www.example.com into IP addresses such as numerical representations that computers use to communicate with each other. In simple terms, when a user types a domain name into a web browser, the name server is responsible for resolving that domain name to the corresponding IP address of the server hosting the website. This process is essential for establishing connections and enabling communication between devices on the internet. From a cybersecurity perspective, name servers are vital because they act as authoritative sources for domain name resolution. However, they can also be targeted by malicious actors in various attacks such as DNS spoofing or DNS hijacking which aims to manipulate the translation process. So to mitigate this risk, organizations employ various security measures such as implementing DNSSEC, domain name system security extensions to secure ensure the integrity and authenticity of DNS data. DNS firewalls and intrusion detection systems can also be utilized to detect and prevent malicious activities targeting name servers. Overall, name servers serve as critical infrastructure component for the internet and safeguarding their integrity is essential in maintaining a secure online environment. So the next question is, what is canonical name in the context of cybersecurity? So canonical name refers to a standardized and authoritative name assigned to a network resource, such as a domain, host, or IP address. It is used to establish a consistent and unambiguous naming convention across different systems and networks. The canonical name serves as a unique identifier for the resource, ensuring that it can be accurately located and accessed within a network or across the internet. The canonical name is commonly represented as a fully qualified domain name, FQDN, for a website which includes the domain name and all its subdomains. For example, www.example.com is the canonical name for the website example.com. By using the canonical name, organizations can maintain a centralized and reliable reference point for accessing resources, making it easier to manage and secure their network infrastructure. In cybersecurity, the concept of canonical name is particularly relevant when dealing with activities such as network monitoring, access control, and threat detection. It allows security administrators to establish policies and rules based on the canonical names of resources, ensuring consistent enforcement and effective security measures. By leveraging canonical names, organizations can enhance their cybersecurity posture by effectively managing and protecting their network resources, facilitating accurate identification and control of assets, and enabling efficient incident response and mitigation strategies. So, this was all about canonical name in cybersecurity. Now moving on to another popular question that is what details you find when you search IP or domain for DNS lookup. So when performing a DNS lookup for an IP domain in the field of cybersecurity, there are several key details that can be obtained. These details provide valuable information for assessing the cybersecurity posture and potential risk associated with the IP or domain in question. Here are some important details that can be found that is IP or domain ownership. So the DNS lookup reveals the registered owner of the IP address or domain name. This information helps identify the entity responsible for the IP or domain and can be useful in determining its legitimacy. The next is IP or domain reputation. The DNS lookup may provide information about the reputation of the IP or domain. This reputation score indicates whether the IP or domain has been involved in malicious activities in the past. High reputation scores indicate a secure or lower risk level, while low scores may suggest a higher risk of involvement in cyber threats. The next we have is IP or domain geolocation. The geolocation information obtained from the DNS lookup reveals the physical location associated with the IP or domain. This can be useful in identifying potential jurisdictional issues and determining the origin of suspicious activities. The next we have is IP or domain history. 
The DNS lookup can uncover historical data related to the IP or domain. This includes information such as previous ownership, changes in IP addresses, or change in domain registration details. Examining the history can help identify any patterns or suspicious behavior for previous involvement in cyber incidents. The next is DNS records. The DNS lookup provides information about the DNS records associated with the IP or domain. This includes details such as the IP addresses associated with the domain, mail server information, subdomains, and other records like TXT records used for various purposes such as SPF, Sender Policy Framework, or DMARC, Domain Based Message Authentication, Reporting, and Conformance configurations. The next is IP or domain blacklisting. The DNS lookup can reveal whether the IP or domain is listed on any known blacklist. Blacklisting occurs when an IP or domain is identified as being associated with malicious activities, spamming, or other undesirable behavior. Such listing can indicate a higher risk level. So, by analyzing these details obtained from a DNS lookup, cybersecurity professionals can assess the potential security risk associated with an IP or domain and take appropriate measures to protect the systems and networks. And now moving to next question, that is, what is DHCP? That is, can you explain what DHCP is and its role in cybersecurity? So, DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. It is a network protocol commonly used in computer networks to automatically assign IP addresses and network configuration settings to devices within a network. DHCP plays a crucial role in cybersecurity as it helps in managing and securing network resources effectively. One of the primary functions of DHCP is to introduce or provide IP addresses dynamically to devices when they join the network. By assigning IP addresses dynamically, DHCP prevents the need for manual configuration, making it easier to manage a large number of devices in a network. This automated process helps ensure that devices are correctly connected and can communicate with other devices and network services. In the context of cybersecurity, DHCP helps in enhancing network security by enabling features such as IP addresses management and network access control. Here's how that is, IP address management. DHCP allows network administrators to centrally manage IP addresses. By controlling IP address assignments, administrators can prevent unauthorized devices from connecting to the network. This helps in mitigating the risk of unauthorized access and potential security breaches. The second is network access control. DHCP can be used to enforce network access control policies. For example, an organization can configure DHCP to assign different IP addresses that ranges or provide specific network settings based on user roles or device types. This allows for granular control or network access, ensuring that only authorized devices can connect to specific network segments or services. Additionally, DHCP servers can be configured to provide additional information to connected devices such as DNS server addresses, default gateway settings, and other configuration options. By centrally managing these settings, DHCP reduces the likelihood of misconfigurations that could introduce security vulnerabilities. Moving to next question, that is, what is CV? Which authority generate CV? And will answer, CV stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. It is a system used in the field of cybersecurity to identify and track known vulnerabilities in software and hardware. The purpose of CV is to provide a standardized way of referencing and discussing security vulnerabilities across different organizations, vendors, and researchers. The authority responsible for generating CVEs is the MITRE Corporation. That is, MITRE is a non-profit organization that operates the CVE program under contract with the National Cybersecurity FFRDC, that is, Federally Funded Research and Development Center. They maintain the official CVE list, assign unique identifiers to vulnerabilities, and facilitate the sharing of vulnerability information among cybersecurity professionals and organizations. By assigning a CVE identifier to a specifically vulnerability, MITRE enables cybersecurity researchers, vendors, and organizations to refer to vulnerabilities consistently, allowing for effective communication and collaboration in addressing and mitigating the identified security issues. So, this was the explanation. So, we can also think of providing an example of a CV identifier. So, let's take an example of CV 2021 34567. In this case, 
CV 2021 represents the year the vulnerability was assigned or discovered and 34567 is a unique numerical identifier. By referring to this CV identifier, security professionals can easily search for information related to the specific vulnerability and access details such as its description, severity, affected software versions and recommended remediation steps. Now moving to another question that is what is a loopback address. So a loopback address refers to a specific network address that allows a device to send and receive data to itself. It is commonly represented by the IP address that is 127.0.0.1 in IPv4 or colon colon 1 in IPv6. The loopback address is often used for testing and troubleshooting purposes as it enables a device to simulate network communication without actually sending data or a physical network. When a device communicates with the loopback addresses, the data packets and routed internally within the device's network stack by passing the physical network interface. This allows the device to test its own network services or applications without relying on external network connectivity. By sending data to the loopback address, a device can verify the functionality and integrity of its networking protocol, software or security configurations. From a cybersecurity perspective, the loopback address can be valuable during the development and testing of security measures such as firewalls, intrusion detection system or antivirus software. It allows security professionals to assess the effectiveness of these measures by emulating attacks or monitoring the device's response or stimulate malicious activities, all within the controlled environment of the loopback interface. Additionally, the loopback address is sometimes used by software developers to create a local development environment. By running services on the loopback address, developers can test and debug their applications without exposing them to potential external threats or interfering with other network resources. In summary, the loopback addresses provide some means for a device to communicate with itself internally, offering a convenient and secure method for testing, troubleshooting and software development in the field of cybersecurity. And moving to the next question, that is 18th question. Here we will explain the concepts of threats and processes. So in the context of cybersecurity, threats and processes are important concepts that relate to the execution and management of software and how they can impact the security of a system. So a process can be understood as an instance of a computer program that is being executed. It represents a set of resources such as memory, files and system state allocated by the operating system to execute the program. Each process runs independently with its own memory space and resources and can perform various tasks. Processes can communicate with each other through their inter-process communication mechanism provided by the operating system. On the other hand, a thread is a unit of execution within a process. A process can have multiple threads and each thread represents an independent flow of control within the process. Threads within a process share the same memory space allowing for efficient communication and data sharing. By utilizing threads, a program can execute multiple tasks concurrently, improving performance and responsiveness. From a cybersecurity perspective, Understanding threats and processes is crucial. Malicious actors can exploit vulnerabilities in processes or threats to compromise security system. For example, a vulnerability in a process might allow an attacker to execute arbitrary code, gain unauthorized access to sensitive data or manipulate system resources. Similarly, if a threat is compromised, it could be used to execute malicious code, bypass security mechanisms or launch attacks on other threats or processes. To enhance cybersecurity, it is important to secure processes and threats by implementing various protective measures. This includes regularly updating software to patch known vulnerabilities, employing secure coding practices to prevent common programming errors, implementing access controls and permissions to limit process privileges, and utilizing robust monitoring and intrusion detection system to detect and respond to potential threats. In summary, processes and threats are fundamental concepts in cybersecurity as they determine how software is executed and how resources are allocated. Understanding their implications and securing them effectively is essential in maintaining a secure computing environment. So moving to next question, that is 19th question and it is what is Kerberos. So Kerberos is a widely used network authentication protocol that plays a crucial role in ensuring secure communication in computer network. It was developed by Mesochats Institute of Technology that is MIT and has become a fundamental component of many security infrastructures. As its core, Kerberos provides a framework for mutual authentication between a client and a server. 
allowing them to establish trust and securely communicate over an untrusted network. It relies on a centralized authentication server known as the Key Distribution Center, which acts as a trusted third party. When a client requests access to a network's resource, the Kerberos protocol enables the client to authenticate itself to the KDC using its credentials, typically a username and password. The KDC then verifies the client's identity and issues a time-limited ticket, also known as Ticket Granting Ticket, which serves as proof of authentication. Once the client possesses a valid TGT, it can present it to the desired server to request a service ticket for a specific resource. The server in turn contacts the KDC to verify the TGT's authenticity and grants the client access to the requested resource if the validation succeeds. One of the significant advantages of Kerberos is that it uses symmetric key cryptography, which ensures confidentiality and integrity of the communication between the client and the server. The KDC shares a secret key with each client and this key is used to encrypt the communication tickets, making it difficult for adversaries to forge and tamper with them. Moreover, Kerberos incorporates the concept of single sign-on, allowing users to authenticate once and obtain multiple tickets for different services without needing to re-enter their credentials. This enhances usability and reduces the burden of remembering and managing numerous passwords. Overall, Kerberos is a robust authentication protocol that addresses many security challenges in network environments. Its widespread adoption in various systems and its proven track record make it a valuable asset in safeguarding sensitive information and preventing unauthorized access. Now moving to the next question, that is, can you explain the significance of 018 and 012 in Kerberos authentication? So in Kerberos authentication, the value 0x18 and 0x12 represent specific message types within the Kerberos protocol. The Kerberos protocol is a widely used authentication protocol designed to provide secure authentication for network services. In Kerberos, each message exchanged between the client and the key distribution center has a special message or a specific message type associated with it. These message types are represented by hexadecimal values. So 0x18 corresponds to the message type KRB underscore AS underscore REQ, which stands for Kerberos Authentication Service Request. This message is sent by the client to request a ticket granting ticket from the KDC. The TGT is then used to request service tickets for specific services. 0x12 represents the message type that is KRB TGS REQ, which stands for Kerberos Ticket Granting Service Request. This message is sent by the client to the KDC to request a service ticket for a particular service. The client includes the TGT obtained from the KRB underscore AS underscore REQ message and specifies the desired service. These message types are essential in the Kerberos authentication process as they allow the client and the KDC to exchange the necessary information for authentication and authorization. The Kerberos protocol uses the message types to ensure secure communication and prevent unauthorized access to network services. Overall, the values 0x18 and 0x12 in Kerberos authentication represent specific message types within the Kerberos protocol, enabling the secure exchange of authentication and authorization information between the client and the KDC. And the next question we have is, define unicasting, multicasting and broadcasting. So unicast, multicast and broadcast are the three methods by which we transmit data over a network. So unicast, it sends the information from a single user to a single receiver. We use this for point-to-point -point communications. And multicast, here data is sent from one or more sources to multiple destinations. Then we have broadcast, that is known as one-to-all, that is the communication is between a single user and several receivers. And the next question is explain SSL encryption. Secure Sockets Layer SSL is the standard followed in the security knowledge industry to develop encrypted connections between the browser as well as the web server. This standard ensures that data privacy is maintained and that online transactions are protected from external attacks. The following steps have to be followed to establish an SSL connection. The browser will connect to the web server which is secured by SSL. The browser will send a copy of the SSL certificate. The browser verifies if the SSL certificate is trustworthy. If trustworthy, the browser will send a message to the server requesting to establish an encrypted connection. The web server acknowledges and starts to build an SSL encrypted connection. The encrypted SSL communication begins between the browser and the web server. And now we have the 23rd question that is what steps will you take to secure a server? So the secure socket layer SSL is a protocol where data encrypting and decrypting will protect it from being intercepted by authorized users. The simple ways to secure the server are as follows. 
ensure that the password for root and administrative users is secured. New users can be included in the system now. They will manage the system as per the policies established. Remote access is removed from default administrator accounts. The following steps have to be followed to configure firewall rules for remote access. Now we have the 24th question that is what is data protection in transit versus data protection at rest. So when data is protected in transit, the data goes only from the server to the client. The effectiveness of data protection, repeat, the effectiveness of data protection is critical for ensuring that there is no loss of data. Data protection at test. It is when the database is on the hard drive. The data at rest is sometimes less vulnerable than the data in transit. So this was all about it. And the next question is, what is the difference between VPN and VLAN? So VPN, the group workstations are within the same locations and in the same broadcast. The main logically segregated networks and have no physical connection. Whereas VLAN, this is related to remote access to the company network. The connection of two points within a secured and encrypted tunnel. There is no encryption technique involved and it slices the logical network into different sections to manage and secure different aspects. And this was all for this tutorial or the interview questions. Hope you guys found it informative and helpful. And this was all for this advanced ethical hacking course. Hope you guys found it informative and helpful. Let's take a minute to hear from our learners who have experienced massive success in their careers. You're never too old to learn anything new. Whether it's an art, a new language, a new sport, or learning new skills to advance your career. Hi, I'm Philip. I'm 61 years old, and last year I upskilled with Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity after working 30 years in the IT sector in various different profiles. I'm happy to tell you that I was able to clear and pass my CISSP and CCSP certification exams on the first attempt after taking the course. Huh, funny story I want to share with you. I started off aspiring to be a DJ, where I became interested in electronic stereo systems and how they connected and how they operate and what made them function. And four years ago, I began a journey to understand and learn more about the cloud. On the way, I developed a natural understanding for the security needs and began to focus my studies to understand more about the cybersecurity aspect of the cloud landscape. I worked with many companies before as a security analyst an architect on a contract basis, but I needed some stability, which I got with the job I just started with Infosys as a cybersecurity consultant. Happened after I took the course. I've been an adjunct faculty member at Prince George's Community College and been in many different learning and training experiences, but the experience as a student at Simply Learn is something I will always cherish. The course, I must say, was packed with practical examples. It was led by highly skilled certified instructors. I believe in living a fulfilling life. At 61, I am still training students in martial arts. I've been practicing martial arts for the past 40 years, and my efforts were acknowledged by the Eastern United States International Martial Arts Association, where I was inducted into the Hall of Fame for a lifetime achievement of dedication and service to the martial arts. I've been many things in my life, but first and foremost, I've been a learner. Be a learner first. And if you like this session, then like, share and subscribe. If you have any questions, then you can drop them in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more from Simply Learn. Staying ahead in your career requires continuous learning and upskilling. Whether you're a student aiming to learn today's top skills or a working professional looking to advance your career, we've got you covered. Explore our impressive catalog of certification programs in cutting edge domains, including data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, or digital marketing. Designed in collaboration with leading universities and top corporations, and delivered by industry experts, choose any of our programs and set yourself on the path to career success. Click the link in the description to know more. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.